Good morning and welcome. Thank you for coming. This is our 18th annual symposium. And we've been blessed year after year in uh, February and March with amazing weather, and today makes no uh, exception to that. It's a beautiful day outside. Okay, wow, that's great. Good morning and welcome. My name is George Jarrah. I'm the conference director. If there's one thing I could say today is we have a very packed, packed agenda. Um, so when the time is to come back from lunch or come back from break, it's best to come back and do it as fast as possible. I'll also usually encourage people to come back. And the reason I say that is because it cuts into the time of each presenter. And we have five distinct parts of today's program, a uh, special surprise in the afternoon. So um, that timeliness of gathering back together is going to be uh, uh, quite important um, for the flow of the day. Uh, housekeeping details. On your tables, there's pens and a couple of pads. We're going as green as possible. Uh, the pads, you know, share the paper for notes, but by and large, I think paying attention to the presentations is going to be key today. Um, also on your tables are question forms. Uh, there's 450 question forms out there. There's 450 of you here today, so thanks for coming again. So throughout the day, when you have a question for an individual speaker or for the panel discussion, you can write those questions and put them either in the basket there. There are two baskets in front of the stage, and there's a basket on the bar on the way when you came in. That's um, how we figure out the questions for the last section of the day, which starts at 3 o'clock. Um, it's a good opportunity to turn off your personal devices or at least silence them um, for the day. There's a typo on the uh, program instructions, which is on the back of the first sheet, uh, which says so a psychologist no longer need to sign out. Indeed, you do need to sign out. So psychologists on the way out will make sure that you know, you know where to sign out. Um, it's uh, an early lunch. We're starting at 11.30, and it's going to be served in the Bay Room, um, buffet style. Uh, the presenter slides will not be available. That's something we did in the past. They uh, may be in, uh, available in the future uh, on our website. At the end of the day, you will not come in the way you, uh, we will not go out the way you came in. So the exit is going to be behind the screen. It's a grand stairway that goes down, and that's where you'll drop off your course evaluations. Are there any questions? <laughs> uh, the second page of your program is your course evaluation. Uh, it's important you put your name on the bottom of the second side and when you turn it in, because uh, without that we can't grant continuing education credits. So just to talk a little bit about continuing education credits, I'm going to introduce Alicia and Ha. Good morning, everyone. So um, just to reiterate, because there's always a question from somebody about, I didn't get my units. You must sign in. If you didn't do that when you came in, please make sure you sign in. And at the end of the day, um, most of you will only need to do the evaluation and Print your name so we can so it's legible um, on the evaluation to get units. That includes for Santa Cruz County staff cultural competence units. So um, at the end of the day, not before, you will turn in your evaluation. I'll be out there with my little box. Um, do not leave your evaluation form on the table. We are not going to collect them. They need to be turned in. Um, it may sound petty, but inevitably there's been a handful of people that takes a lot of staff time from various uh, 
persons to get CEUs. So we want to, you know, we want to be able to um, to give you the units for attending this wonderful conference. The only people that need to sign out are the psychologists. The rest of you just need to sign out by putting your name here. So psychologists, you do this and sign out. I will have the sign out form and I'll direct you to that. So um, any questions, see me at the breaks. Um, but welcome, I'm so happy to see such a huge crowd and I'm, I'm really proud of this, um, this symposium in general and today's topic in particular and I'm, I think it's just awesome that we sold out. Good job. So as I said, we're at capacity, so one of the requests is that if there is an open seat at one of your tables, raise your hand right now. And so those folks walking around looking for a place to sit, look for those hands up there. Again, there are other seats up along the balcony in the top here. Um, parking validation, those people who did not get their parking ticket validated uh, during lunch perhaps or a break, get your parking ticket validated and you won't have to pay for parking. Right now, I'd like to introduce Joshua Nanherney Calciano. Good morning, everyone. I want it's my honor to welcome you to our 18th annual Johnny Nanherney Calciano Memorial Youth Symposium. I'd like to recognize the various organizations that are here today. We've been doing this for many years. And I do encourage you to take the time during the lunches and the breaks to network with them um, and to, uh, to speak with them. I'd also like to recognize our high school students. Um, for many years, we've been doing a scholarship program for our students. And this allows uh, various high schools to bring in uh, students that they feel would uh, benefit the most. And then I, want one, I just request that when you do go back, you, you take this information and, and you apply it and you, and you talk to your, your, your fellow students as well. <clears throat> you know, my brother John would be 44 years old this year. And as I've grown from an adolescence to a husband and now a father, there's not a day that goes by when I don't think what his life would have been like today. And though this symposium bears his name, I feel it has come to represent all families dealing with suicide, violence, and um, people that, uh, with drugs. My family is incredibly gratified to have seen the symposium in memory of John develop over the years into the widely attended event of today. And as difficult as our loss continues to be, the community coming together is a very healing force for us. We continue to be impressed by the diversity of the attendees, clinicians, counselors, educators, and public safety officials that have attended our symposium over the years. The post-symposium comments and the number of attendees that return year after year clearly show that we are making a real difference in our community. Our deepest thanks and appreciation goes out to those that planned the details of each annual symposium, and we are particularly gratified to George Jaro and all members of the advisory committee. It is their hard work that, that allows all of this to happen. I have never more, met a more passionate, devoted group of people, and I am honored to be associated with them. The tire, I'd also like to recognize the tireless volunteers to help the logistics of the event, and also the Dominican Foundation, who is the, which is the philanthropic arm of the symposium, and is with their support that we have established the John E. Natterney Endowment Fund. We could not have continued to have such wonderful events without their support. But most importantly, I want to recognize all of you and your devotion to your work. For nearly two decades, this symposium has expanded on topics ranging from suicide to autism. And it is your continued quest for knowledge that allows us to bring you such wonderful speakers to you year after year. In summary, I want to thank all of you for coming today and hope you find this information pr presented to be beneficial in your work and hope you will continue to join us year after year. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Joel Baum. Joel Baum is the Senior Director of Professional Development and Family Services. 
He is responsible for all programmatic aspects of gender spectrum. He facilitates trainings and conducts workshops, develops curriculum, consults with parents, professionals, and providers, provides resources and services of a more uh, compassionate understanding of gender. He is a founding member and director of education and advocacy with the Child and Adolescence Gender at UCSF. Working throughout the United States and beyond, he is frequently called upon to help institutions think more expansively about the gender diversity of all children and teens and ways to create more exclusive conditions accordingly. For nearly 30 years, Joel's work as an educator has focused on issues of social justice and equity. First as an award-winning middle school science teacher and school administrator, he has also served as a district administrator in Oakland, California, as well as a school reform coach with the National Equity Project. Joel is also a professor at the California University East State, East Bay, excuse me, in the Department of Educational Leadership. Gender Spectrum provides education, resources, and support to help create a gender sensitive and inclusive environment for all children and teens. We accomplish this mission through school trainings, parent support groups and consultations, policy development, and our annual family conference, and work with medical and mental health care providers, social services, and others working with the families and kids. So it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Joel Baum. Wow, good morning, everyone. All right, we can do a little better. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, so again, uh, let me make sure my doohickey's working here. Uh, I'm Joel, and as uh, uh, Josh said, I work for this organization called Gender Spectrum. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about my background and my experience in education um, after lunch when we're focused on schools. Uh, but today, for the, the kickoff, I've been asked to really focus on the notion of the dimensions of gender, understanding the complexity of gender. Uh, before I do that, I, I also want to offer my thanks to the uh, symposium organizing committee, the sponsors of the event, and again, as Josh said, to all of you um, for the work you do helping young people and their caregivers. Uh, they need all that we can give them, and I know all of us work very hard to provide the support for them, so again, I, um, as a parent myself, I thank you uh, for that. So, gender. What I'm going to provide here for the next 30 or so, 30, 40 minutes, is a model of gender. It's not the model or the only model. I wouldn't even argue about whether it's the right model. It's the model we're going to use right now. Um, what we have found is that this is a model that allows for discourse. I don't want to argue about certain words and are we using them correctly. I want to communicate and get business done in support of young people. And so I want to be really clear, what I'm going to present is just one way to think about gender, but in the various organizations and institutions we've worked with, it's proven to be um, a pretty powerful one to allow for conversation and discourse about gender and young people. The work around this topic truly begins inside. We all come to our roles as educators, as counselors, therapists, pastoral care providers, and everything else, um, with our own experiences, our own worldviews, if you will, related to gender. We all are impacted by gender. And we know that without reflecting on that, without reflecting on our own experiences of gender, we can tend to look at the young people and their gender as sort of an other, as if their gender needs to be dealt with, not our gender. And so I'm going to ask you to do a little reflecting on your own experiences of gender, um, and I'm going to foreshadow the framework that Gender Spectrum uses primarily with schools, but really any organization, about change. But it always begins at the personal level, the personal entry point where we really focus on our own understandings of gender and the ways in which they impact the, the work we do with young people and their families. So I'm gonna do a brief thought experiment here with all of you um, to kind of key in to that, if you will. I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures 
and I'm going to read several scenarios. And for each one, I simply want you to turn in, turn inward, and focus on your response, your reaction to each of them. Okay? Claro? Okay. Here's the first picture. What's wrong with a girl who wears a ball cap? A new approach to parenting gender fluid children by Ruth Padour. Here's the second. What's wrong with a boy who wears a dress? A new approach to parenting gender fluid children by Ruth Padour. How might you answer that question? How might you talk about <clears throat> those two pictures with a family member, a colleague, an older relative, a younger relative, someone in your social circle? Jennifer's parents are surprised to hear their five-year-old exclaim, I'm a boy. They say fine and let their child pick a new name and be begin using he and his for pronouns. Seven-year-old Chantel goes to the bathroom to pee, but while she's there, other students constantly ask her why her feet face the wrong direction when she's going. Ten-year-old Devin approaches you and complains that everyone keeps asking, are you a boy or a girl? At 14, Jamie has decided that they want to be known as agender, but need you to help explain what that means to their parents. Tanya is 16 and explains to you that attending school as a girl has become impossible. Instead, Tanya changes clothes every day on the way to and from campus and is now known at school as Tomas. The school has been supportive, but Tomas does not want his parents to be informed. A neighbor approaches you at Safeway and says, I hear they're letting boys use the girls' restrooms now at the middle school. What the heck is going on there anyway? Regardless of what you're thinking, or imagining, or how you're responding, that's data for you about where you are um, when it comes to your notions and understandings and beliefs about gender. And as we work throughout the day, I want to encourage you to both stay connected with those, but at the same time be willing to interrogate them. Be, uh, be willing to interrogate them in, the, in light of the incredible shifting terrain of gender, particularly among young people, that we are literally experiencing beneath our feet. This model is based on three essential ideas. The first is that gender is about more than our bodies. That we have to look at biology, expression, and identity to really understand the authentic experience of gender. Secondly, that it's better represented as a spectrum rather than a simple binary. And lastly, that gender and sexual orientation are different. And when we conflate them and confuse them, it really creates challenges for young people. Now those three ideas, pretty simple in, in concept, we've found to be significant in creating a perspective around gender that is honoring of all people's experiences. It's not about dismissing gender as a concept. It's not about saying gender doesn't matter. It's expanding our notions of gender in order to be responsive to the needs of, of everyone. Now, interestingly, um, that definition is completely consistent with our ed code, which includes gender as a protected class and names and defines gender to mean a person's sex and includes their gender identity and their gender expression. Those are the three aspects that we need to focus on in protecting uh, the gender diversity of all young people. So, when someone has a baby, what's the first question we almost always ask? What'd you have, boy or girl? I always love, though, one of the first few times I was doing this training, I was at a middle school, and at about this juncture, I asked that question, and from the back of the room in a sixth grade class, I hear, who's the dad? <laughs> it's like, okay, I am gonna love this job. I know this is gonna be a great job. No, but of course the question that is asked most often is, is it a boy or a girl, right? Um, and of course the answer to that is based in biology. When that baby's born, we take a look at their body and we make a determination and slap this label of girl or boy on them. 
Okay? Now, right there, we have the heart and soul of the binary gender system, the gender binary. Okay? And that binary essentially has two main uh, concepts it's built upon. One, that uh, there are only two kinds of bodies. And two, that whatever body you have will equal your gender. See, what we do is we assign sex, but we presume gender. And in fact, we're often right. That model works pretty darn well for a lot of us. You know, I bet many people in this room go, yeah, right, of course. And that's right, it does work for a lot of us, just not all of us, okay? Because what we know is that at multiple levels, gender is a spectrum, a continuum. Now, I happen to be, a, a, as uh, Josh mentioned, a former science teacher, um, and I was a bit of a math nerd, and I want to point out that th those lines, that line and all the lines you'll see have arrows on each end, okay? Now, my daughter's taking geometry, and we're learning about lines versus line segments. Lines are infinite. Line segments have endpoints. These are infinite with these stops along the way of girl or boy, okay? And in each of the dimensions, we need to think about the dimension as a spectrum. Even biologically, we know that bodies do not just come in two forms. First of all, what we call boy bodies and girl bodies, if you're looking at me, I'm doing air quotes. I'm not going to keep doing air quotes because I'm already you know, kind of warm and doing air quotes all afternoon is going to be boring. But no, really, when we talk about bodies, you know, a boy body is really a penis-bearing human. It's not a boy body because people of all kinds of genders have penises. A girl body is really, you know, a, an ovary-bearing human, a vulva-bearing human. Um, and while I don't expect you to say, good evening, vulva-bearing humans and penis-bearing humans, you know, I do want to encourage you to disconnect this notion of what's in your pants with who you are, because it just doesn't always work. But more than that, there are bodies that don't fit either one. Now, the uh, nomenclature uh, a long time ago was hermaphrodites. Um, currently, we often refer to individuals as being uh, intersex or, or an intersex condition. The unfortunate medical nomenclature is DSDs, Disorders of Sex Development. Um, that's a whole different lecture about why that's problematic. Um, but suffice it to say, many of the more gender-affirming specialists that, that I work with refer to differences of sex development. But what we're talking about is a whole range of naturally occurring conditions that belie the physical binary of bodies. Ambiguous genitalia, variations in chromosomes, variations in the way hormones are in, uh, interface with the body, various ways at even a cellular level that we're beginning to see that gender is not at all this one or the other thing. There are many conditions, physical differences connected to these uh, conditions that are invisible. So we never know, you won't know if a person has an intersex condition, is intersex, unless they tell you, and even in some cases, those individuals don't even know themselves. Um, it just is something that's part of the natural interplay of humans. And here's a short clip uh, that helps really bring this home. Oh, we'll try that again. Here's a short clip that'll bring these things home. If you have testes. All right, let's try it one more time. Raise your hands. If you have testes. I'm Pigeon. I'm Alex. I'm Emily. I'm Cypher. And we are Intersexy. Intersex describes a person who doesn't fit the typical definition of male or female. I have XY chromosomes, but typical female genitalia. I'm a girl who has testes and XY chromosomes. I identify as a queer, gender non-conforming intersex person. I identify as a black intersex man. Intersex is not new. It's been around since the beginning of human existence. I mean, there's probably even intersex dinosaurs, if you think about it. And that's probably not that far from the truth because as I've said, these are naturally occurring variations of living things, right? It's the stuff of evolution, that variation. Um, there's a great quote that Milton Diamond said, which is something along the lines of, nature loves diversity, but society hates it. And I think that's very uh, much what we're talking about here because this notion of the binary, 
which for many people is assumed to be one and, and only uh, based on biology, you know, part and parcel, it breaks down even at this level. It just simply doesn't work to capture the, the greatest number of humans' experiences. And when we're having models to describe humans, particularly on something so uh, essential as gender, we should try to be as inclusive as possible. But biology and sex aren't the same as gender anyway. They're not the same thing. They're different. There's a relationship, but it's only one dimension of an individual's notions of gender. The second dimension is expression. Now expression you'll often hear described as gender expression. I'd like to add two letters, ED, it's gendered expression. It's really human expression that we have assigned all sorts of attributes to um, that, that don't always add up. Um, this is often what I, I refer to and what you'll hear talked about as the social constructs that are attached to gender. And there's evidence of the binary everywhere. And for our young people, they are like fish in water swimming in the binary. They don't even know it's there half the time. These messages come in so many different forms about how you're supposed to perform girl and how you're supposed to perform boy, let alone someone who might not feel like either one. That's not even on the table. One way to do it or another way to do it. And these things inform so many aspects of our culture, our traditions, such as Halloween, now imagine if you are, uh, you know, say, wearing that fairy tale costume, or you're that person, and you want to wear one of the, uh, I don't know, Star Wars costumes. You need to cross this not-so-invisible line into that space simply to wear a different costume. Last time I checked, costumes were costumes. And yet we put up this barrier that kids are forced to cross in order to simply pursue something or wear something that feels right for them. And sometimes these have real, real impacts. Insidious and less insidious, obvious and less obvious. But here we have three telescopes. Three telescopes. And what you'll notice, for those of you who maybe can't see in the back, is one of them has 525 times magnification, is big in the picture, it costs 90 bucks, it's clearly well constructed and happens to have someone that most people would read as a boy looking through it. And then almost as an afterthought, in the bottom left-hand corner, we have this pink telescope that gets 90, that's good, right? 90 for $15. Again, we can look at that and laugh, but there are messages implicit in these uh, visions and notions of how we are gendering toys, objects, clothing, experiences. And make no mistake, this stuff starts early. A diamond ring for a sweet baby girl and a saw for a busy baby boy. Now these notions, of course, are in fact quite artificial. Gender expression, the expression of gender, that gendered expression is shifting all the time. Think about it for a second. I want you to imagine being 10 years old again. Raise your hand if when you were 10, you knew men or boys with earrings. Okay, take a look around, you'll see some hands up. You, you might notice a pattern to whose hands are up, just saying. Um, how about now? Raise your hand if you know men or boys with earrings today. Okay, how about this one? Raise your hand if when you were 10, you knew girls with tattoos, girls or women with tattoos. Again, some hands. How about today? These are just two examples of how the notions related to gender are shifting all the time. I mean, heck, when I was growing up, the only people wearing earrings were women and girls. The only people with tattoos were boys uh, and men. And pirates got to do both, I guess, because they have apparently a lot of freedom out there on the ocean. You know, they're, they're transgressing all sorts of other stuff, so why not gender as well? Um, but the fact is, this stuff changes, and we need to help young people understand that this stuff is shifting all the time. Another great example of that is this phenomenon called the bronies. Now, I happen to have uh, two girls, both of whom spent, quite honestly, more time with my little pony than I wish they had. I know way more about Fluttershy than anyone should know about Fluttershy, who is one of the characters. Um, bronies 
are men, young men, uh, young adults, uh, you know, high school, college age men who like the franchise My Little Pony. They're bros who like the ponies. They're bronies. Um, and I want to be really clear, this is in a non-ironic, creepy way, okay? Not a creepy way. It's about, you know, they love the artwork. They love the storylines. They love the collectability of the objects, right? They love the notion of a community that is, like, connected to this really sort of offbeat thing. Um, and and uh, it's something, in fact, it's sort of part of the Comic-Con generation, right? If you go to a comic book store, a game store, you will more than likely begin to find My Little Pony sections. Um, in, in, in a toy that once was really the domain of girls. And if, in case you don't believe how mainstream bronies are, that picture in the bottom right-hand corner, that's from the JCPenney website, <laughs> right? I don't think you get more mainstream middle America than JCPenney. But perhaps my favorite example of all of this are the colors pink and blue, the old standbys, the sort of holy of holies of gender expression norms. The generally accepted rule is pink for the boys and blue for the girls. The reason is that pink, being a more decided and stronger color, is more suitable for the boy, while blue, which is more delicate and dainty, is prettier for the girl. Trade publication. Earnshaw's Infant Department, 1918. So I guess your fa boys' colors in t depend entirely on when you like them. Um, when, of course, you know, there's no such thing as boy and girl colors. Colors are just colors. This is, is, is as the uh, narrator named, was a trade publication designed to, for marketing in department stores. If you're going to be working with families, push the pink stuff on the boys and the blue stuff on the girls. Now interestingly, a hundred years later, here we have Target last year announcing that they were no longer going to separate bedding and clothes based on gender. It used to be you could go in Target and you'd go to the toy aisle and you would see building sets and girls building sets. Really? Now it's building sets. You know, if you're a girl and you want Spider-Man bed sheets, Again, why do you have to go into this, late, this aisle with the label boys on it? That automatically means that, well, if you want it, you got to cross this line and make some sort of declaration when, in fact, you don't. They're just sheets. Throughout time and from one culture to another, these things are shifting all the time. And what we have to help young people recognize is that they will shift. And while there may be patterns to gender expression, they are not rules. When I was a teacher, I had something I called the smell test. And the smell test was, can I stand in front of my eighth graders and make the following statement and have them say, yeah, that smells right? Or do they go, oh, no, no, that's funky. That don't smell right. And if I were to stand up here and say to my eighth graders, oh, yeah, of course, boys, girls, they both wear dresses all the time, wouldn't pass the smell test. It would, right? Does that mean all boys don't wear dresses? No. Does that mean all girls don't wear them? Does it mean all boys do and all girls do? No. Do some boys and some girls? Yeah. What's the pattern? Well, the pattern is that girls wear dresses more commonly than boys do. It's a simple pattern. It's not a rule. Patterns versus rules is an important concept as we talk about gender expression if we want to do it in a way that recognizes and honors the experience of everyone. But when we have someone who doesn't fit the pattern, we can't blame the data. We're making the mistake. We've got the wrong pattern. We need to adjust, right? Versus someone breaking a rule is doing something wrong. We have to adjust our ability to look at new data and say, oh, let me reframe my framework. And so expression represents that second dimension. The third dimension we want to talk about is gender identity. And gender identity refers to our internal sense of self, the core notion of who we are deep inside. Again, the binary assumes that there are two ways to feel. I can feel like a boy, and I can feel like a girl, and by the way, it's inextricably linked to my genitals. Whereas we know, again, Identity also is a spectrum. 
an infinite spectrum in which individuals can feel like girls and boys, both, neither, all sorts of combinations, and as we're going to see in a few minutes, an incredible diversity of possibilities in which young people are asserting, hey, this is what gender means to me. This is my gender, okay? Now, I want you to think for a second about your own experience again. When did you know? How did you know? How old were you? What messages did you get about your gender? What did you encounter in the world around you that reflected or did not reflect your gender? And as you think about that, take a look at this next slide. This slide shares data from uh, transgender adults um, who were asked, when did you realize that your gender varied from the sex you'd been assigned at birth? Okay. Did you realize when you were 18 or 16 or 14? So along the bottom or the x-axis we have age and up the top along the y-axis we have the percentage of respondents. So let's take a look at when these adults realize this about themselves. Here's the first group who realized basically in high school or older. Okay. Here's the next group who realized this about themselves in middle school or in adolescence. Here's our pre-adolescence in the upper reaches of elementary school. And finally, here's our youngest people who realized their gender identity was different than the sex assigned at birth. Now, I want to be very clear. This is not the only narrative for a transgender person. This is a study. But what it does demonstrate is that for certainly the vast majority of people in that study, they knew quite early. And returning to what I asked you, I'm imagining most of you knew quite early as well. And that's because gender identity is a core aspect. It's about congruence. It's about alignment. It's about this notion of I just feel right or I don't based on the messages I'm getting from others, based on my own body, based on the ways that I'm forced to or allowed to express my gender. Now, interestingly, in a different study that showed very similar results, the average age of realization was just under eight years old. The average age of disclosure was not until 15 and a half. Now I want you to think about being seven, eight years old, having this profound sense that who you are is not what everyone else thinks, but not disclosing that for another seven plus years. I either can't because I don't have the language, I can't because I know the reaction of the people around me, I can't because no one's created the space for me to understand my own experience. And that, my friends, is a huge burden to ask a little kid to walk around with. And we have to work on creating those spaces where everyone's experiences of gender are on the table to be considered and celebrated. These are just a few quotes from another study, retrospective study of adults reflecting on their experiences. And as you read those, you'll see three ideas. One, there's a ton of pain in not being seen. Two, these are young folks. These are kids, again, thinking about their experiences. And interestingly, three, the th three at the top, you'll notice they all refer to going to bed, falling asleep at night. And I want you to think about your own experiences. When are we more alone? When are we more just with ourselves than when we're sleeping? That is such a time of privacy and personal reflection, and yet for many of, those young, many of these folks, that was a time that was really difficult. And interestingly, many of the families we work with, um, many of the families of the mental health providers that, that we collaborate with, talk about their gender expansive kids having trouble sleeping, having issues with sleeping. I got to wonder, they're busy all day long, and now it's just me, and now I just got to face the fact that a lot of people don't really see me for who I am. What she ended up getting was a shot uh, that's called Lupron. It tells her brain to stop producing the male hormones. And then was taking an estrogen patch. Now that I've been on hormones for six months and more changes are happening, I'm completely comfortable in my identity. So I don't really even consider myself a trans girl anymore. It's more just like I'm a girl who just happens to be transgender. I feel like I'm just myself. So many clothes now. We're all products of our society, right? Um, the third dimension, then, is gender identity. Now, you notice in talking about these three dimensions, I don't believe I've said the word lesbian, gay, bisexual, asexual, uh, pansexual, omnisexual, or any other kind of sexual. 
Um, and that's because those are all terms related to sexual orientation. And sexual orientation and gender, again, are not the same thing. Is there a relationship? Sure. But they're not one and the same. I mean, think about it for a second. Sexual orientation, in many ways, is understood in terms of my experience in relationship to others. Gender, on the other hand, is very much my own experience of self, my experience of who I am. And it's problematic to confuse them for a couple reasons. One is we frequently read a young person's expression and assume it tells us lots of stuff about their identity. And in fact, you know, I was a couple weeks ago doing a presentation for some early childhood educators, and one of them raised their hand and said, well, what am I supposed to do when the parent, usually a dad, who comes in and says, I do not want my son playing in the dress-up corner, I do not want a little gay boy on my hands, I'm just not going to have it, not going to have it. What am I supposed to say? And I'm like, well, you know, it's your, first of all, it's your uh, preschool, by the way, and you probably have enough on your hands worrying about keeping the kids safe than what they're playing with. But also, you know, that kid's three, I think. Could we just give him a minute to figure out the attraction stuff and just let him play, right? But more importantly, when we confuse sexual orientation and gender, we put a very adult lens of sexuality on top of the process of identity development that just is not on the table. So when we think about supporting transgender young people in our schools, in restrooms, in locker rooms, on overnight field trips and housing accommodations, many people's minds go straight to sex and, sex, uh, and a sexually loaded situation. When in fact, it's not about that. It's about identity. And the issue is not who's going to have sex with who, but who is going to be honored for who they are. Now, these three dimensions work together. One, in a way, is like this, where they essentially line up, um, where biology and identity are aligned and expression frequently follows. And there's a term for that. That term is not normal. That's not the term. Or correct, or proper, or as nature intended. It's called cisgender. Cisgender, the prefix cis, literally means to be on the same side as like a cis and trans molecule, and there are many other places it shows up, um, is gender typical. Now, why is it important to have a name for that? Well, the fact of the matter is, I would argue this is still probably the dominant experience in our society, and we need to name dominant experiences, because if we don't, they become the default, right? If you're not this, you must be something not normal, not regular, no. Cisgender is just one form of gender. It's a way we can label the dominant experience, but of course there's others. We have tomboys who are assigned the sex of a girl and identify as a girl and, and express, you know, are perceived to express their gender in somewhat masculine ways. That's a common word we use for that. We also have another pattern where someone's assigned the sex of a boy and he identifies as a boy, but according to the people around him, he skews to the feminine. You know, like maybe he prefers the color pink or, or blue or I, I don't know. What's he supposed to play with My Little Pony? That's a girl toy, isn't it? Anyway, um, we don't have a name for that kiddo. We don't have a way to refer to that young person. Certainly not in a way that's similar to tomboy, which many would argue has become a very positive term. Now, I don't want to pretend that tomboys universally are accepted and that this boy who's perceived to somehow um, you know, express gender in a, in a feminine way is, is universally negative. But as a general rule, our society struggles with our boys that skew to the feminine. Dr. Ernstaft and I and Dr. Hastings are all part of something called the Child and Adolescent Gender Center Clinic. At our clinic, we never get a call from a parent that sounds like, yeah, I have a five-year-old girl and all she wants to do is, is wear her brother's clothes, she has a very short haircut, and you know, all she wants to do is play baseball and rough, wrestle, rough, rough house and wrestle. We don't get that call. We get this call all the time. I have a five-year-old boy, and he's got very long hair. All he wants to do is wear his sister's clothes, and he just loves to you know, do tea parties. And do I have a problem? We get that call all the time. Now, there's other possibilities. Here's someone who's assigned the sex of a female, but she, he identifies as a male. And in this model, we use the term transgender to describe this individual, and transgender boy because the identity is male. The trans part is biology and identity across from rather than on the same side as each other. And often, this is a young person who will tell us in no uncertain terms not that I wish, that I hope, maybe one day I will. It's, oh, I am. I am a boy. 
especially if they have the space to make that declaration. And a transgender girl then is assigned the sex of a boy, but she identifies as a girl. Now again, this is a model. And you will hear the term transgender often used in much more umbrella form. What I'm going to tell you today is in our model, we use it in this very precise way and have a different way of talking about the whole plethora of other possibilities. But before we go there, I want to make one last comment about transgender children. Because we often get asked, well, how can you tell? I mean, how do you know? Well, is it a phase? Is it not a phase? You know, how can you tell the difference between a phase and, and someone who's authentically uh, asserting their, their selves, their true selves. Well, often these are three things to think about. Persistent, consistent, and insistent. Um, one of my girls, when she was four or five years old, thought she was a dog. She thought she was a dog. You know, she played around, I'm a dog, daddy. You know, look at my ears, woof, woof. You know, my partner and I, we didn't feed her on the floor. You know, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't accommodate her assertion of dogness. Um, we didn't make her pee outside, you know. She would have loved that, by the way. She would have thought that was awesome. But, um, and when Grandma came, it was like, okay, sweetie, the, the barking's really not while Grandma's here. She just, she's old, she can't handle it, okay? <laughs> but if you think about someone who is asserting a gender identity and saying, yeah, I want to wear the clothes and be called the name, and etc., when Grandma comes over for that kid and you say you need to cool it, you get a very different reaction. You don't get a, oh, well, fine. You have a problem. You have serious distress. You have insistence. Okay? And that, that impact is often a really strong tell. Um, and here's another clip sort of talking about that. Realization, but accepting of it since I've known since way back when. But um, I can, you know, recall times where I was little and I would, you know, they would put me in the same tub as my little cousin and he would have some things that I didn't. And, and I was just, you know, wondering, like, where's mine? You know, like, hey, who, who forgot to give me mine? You know, like, where's my little Pete Weeder, as they called it, you know? And, um, it's like, I don't know, it's like I would always, I've always admired guys, like, not like, oh, you know, you, I like you enough. It was kind of like, you know, I wish I could be you. And I think it was... It's like I can still remember sitting on the playground and just looking at the dudes and just like, you know, just wishing and imagining how it would be if I were them or if I were born and, you know, born as a guy. Because, you know, I was little, you know, we don't really know about sex, but we know gender. We know that, you know, girls are supposed to be the ones in skirts and dresses and guys wear the jeans and fight all the time, you know. But I think, um... I think what should have been assigned to my parents is that I was a quiet child. I wouldn't fuss, scream about anything, but whenever my mom would try to dress me up and put lipstick on me and all this pretty shit for, for pictures, I would have, a t I would throw a tantrum, I would scream, I would bawl, I would, I was just on the floor just crying at So, And I would, you know, I was little, I never cried about anything. I was a quiet child, so. That should have definitely been a big sign to her that I was not trying to fit into the girl world because, you know, I never did what girls did. The most feminine thing I did as a child was paint my nails black. So again, when we do this work, we often find ourselves needing to convince people that transgender people are real, that they exist, that a kid can know. Well, fortunately, we've got a lot of backup. These are many of the associations, and this is quite old, I'm sure there's many more now, that have affirming statements of the rights, needs, uh, and importance of protecting transgender young people. Quite simply, transgender students and young people are not making it up. Who they are is who they are, and they have nothing to gain in asserting a sense of self that isn't authentic. There just isn't there isn't anything in it that's going to make that worth it. The difficulties are, are quite, quite significant. But of course, what I've been talking about to point, this point is all very binary, right? This body, this expression, this identity, one or the other. And in fact, that just is a tip of the iceberg. There are many, many places that exist in the land of both and neither and more. And even both doesn't count because that just assumes two when there's so much more. And by way of astrophysics, Neil deGrasse Tyson, 
uh, has a great little clip here that I want to play for you that really captures this. Um, of course, many of you know Pluto got demoted recently. Pluto's no longer considered a planet, or at least by some. And he was asked, so what's the deal with Pluto? Is it a planet or is it not a planet? And in his response, he talks about this notion of false dichotomies, but what he really talks about are the limitations of language and the inability of language to capture concepts that we don't have language for and therefore end up controlling the way we think. Take a listen. So it's, not, it's a very human thing to say, is it this or is it that? Is it a planet, is it not a planet? Is it, is it less filling or is it great taste? Is it, is it gum or is it candy? These are sort of false dichotomies. Something can be both, but our language forces, it us, forces us to require that it fit into one word or another. Okay. It, what we're not recognizing is that it's not a fault of the object or the concept. It's a defect in our language. And if our thoughts follow language, we have trouble thinking of things that fit more than one category. I think that's the source of most human ailments yes, in the world. Yes, it is. Cultural ailments. Are you gay or are you not gay? Right. Are you black or are you not? Are you this or are you that? Are you male are, or are you female? female? Are you, and it's like, chill out. Just let it, let, you know, just let things be what they are. Allow there to be a spectrum in all that you see. So does that, that doesn't necessarily just mean a broadening of language, but a broadening of the, the way the human mind thinks. I think that once you learn language, the language shapes how you think more than your thoughts shape what language does. It takes a very creative person to start inventing words for thoughts that they had for which no words applied. And that right there captures so much of the challenge that we have with gender that doesn't come in one of two boxes because we have a limitation of language. And so much of this is about simply developing the language which captures experiences beyond the binary. Fortunately, we've got, you know, there's a head start. We have a head start because boy versus girl is not universal. There are cultures throughout the world that have become quite comfortable over hundreds and thousands of years recognizing the diversity of gender. These are all, at least originally, non-pejorative terms to describe individuals who do not fit the typical binaries. One example that many of you might be familiar with are what are sometimes described as two-spirit people, people that, that, that are, are more than male and female. They're all of humanity. I don't, again, want to be very careful about saying both because they're even more than that. And in fact, two-spirit's a somewhat generic or, or name for over 150 different tribes that have some kind of role or tradition or label for individuals who exist in these places. Here's one more. In many cultures, a person existing outside the two accepted genders is seen as confronting, even threatening. But gender is defined by culture. And on South Sulawesi, the Bugis believe that in addition to men, women, and Bisu, there are two more. These two additional genders are made up of people who in the West would be considered transvestites. Tambu's gender is Chalalai. Biologically, she's female, but she lives as a man. I feel comfortable as Chalalai. My family is also comfortable. As long as I'm a good person and I work hard, people accept me. Abdul Rahman, or Poppy, is Chalabai. He has male genitalia, but has lived as a woman since he was six years old. I'm not special. The Boogie's culture accepts all five genders. So that's just two examples of the many, many different parts of the world that have these notions that have the nuanced understandings of gender. But what's really exciting is we no longer need to go to far-flung places to get that sense, because there's a growing understanding of this among the young people that we are serving. This is a poll last year that was conducted by Fusion of millennials, ages 18 to 34, and they were asked, which of these statements do you agree with? There are only two genders, male and female, or gender is a spectrum, and some people fall outside conventional categories. The results were pretty surprising for many of us. 50% of 18 to 34-year-olds agreed with the statement that gender is a spectrum. Not everyone fits 
in one of two categories. And what we're going to see is only an increase in that number as we come to understand the complexity of gender. And these ideas are already starting to filter into aspects of popular culture. A couple years ago, Facebook decided with their equity and diversity committee that it was not okay to have a profile that allowed you to be male, female, transgender, or something else, or decline to state. They came up with 51 options, some of which are named there. And they were feeling great, they were on it, until someone came along and said, but I'm 52. <laughs> what about me? And they scrambled and said, you're right, we need to add some. But then someone came along and said, but I'm 59. I'm 137, I'm pi, I'm 1,256.9134. And they said, you know what, let's forget it. Let's do it this way. Let's have a pull down menu that includes custom. And you tell us, you tell us who you are. Let us know who you are versus fit in these 58 boxes. You tell us who you are. So when we think about the profile of non-binary individuals then, we suddenly start to see a whole lot of complexity showing up, just several of which are named here. The upshot is we're talking about gender expansiveness, individuals who are expanding our notions of gender. And the reason I like this particular term is it puts the onus on us, not on the individual who is simply often being themselves. I'm reminded of a, a young trans teen who, who was on a panel that we held, or actually not recently anymore, a while ago, and during the, the presentation he said something to the effect of, uh, he was asked, well, when did you transition? When did you, you know, become a guy? And he kind of paused and looked out at the audience and said, you just don't get it, do you? I never transitioned. I've always been a guy. It's all of you who need to transition. <laughs> you need to understand my experience. That's gender expansive, right? He was expanding our understandings. He wasn't doing anything except being who he was. The bottom line is each of us has the right to determine for ourselves the label that we choose, what that label means, and the right to ask others to please respect us and use it. I'm imagining there's many of you out there who identify as guys. I happen to identify as a guy. And yet, we might use the same label but what we mean by that label may be similar and may be vastly different, right? Each of us has the right to gender self-determination, to personalize our gender, to make gender our own. To come back to a really um, succinct definition of gender is quite difficult. Um, you know, for me, I think it is, it's a spectrum. Actually, it's probably not linear, it's probably circular. Yes, rather than sort of having a, a start and an end of male, female, it's probably spherical in terms of how many different variations that there are. And it's only when you try and articulate it that you have to say things like male and female, and, and that comes down to a restriction of language, really. Um, and there could be a whole vocabulary invented around more appropriate ways to express gender identity. So if you think about it, we started here with the who's the dad? No, no, that wasn't the question. <laughs> What'd you have? That was the question. And we've ended here with a model that for sure takes a little more time takes us, a, need to pause for a second and say, right, so what do you mean? Um, it's not neat and clean. In fact, it, it can be messy sometimes. But that's gender. That recognizes the experience of everyone. One time, you know, someone asked uh, one of my colleagues, how many genders are there then? And they said, well, there's basically one, it's human. And they said, no, 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 scratch that. Actually, there's an infant number because every one of us has one. And that's what gender's all about. All of us having the right to be ourselves, to assert the meaning of the terms we use, and to ask others to simply respect that and accept me for knowing my experience more than anyone else. So the punchline, is it a boy or a girl? I don't know. It can't talk yet. 
So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. This framework will inform the rest of our day. So as Diane and Jen and our panel talk about these aspects of gender, we hope that you will continue to expand your understandings as well. So we'll take a break. We'll be back here, please, at uh, 1040, 1015, 1015, 1015, 1015. Okay, thanks everybody for coming back on a timely basis. Again, we'll be breaking at 11.30 for lunch. It'll be a good time to also network and uh, look at the uh, various tables out there. Diane Ernsaf, PhD, is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of California, San Francisco, and a developmental and clinical psychologist in the San Francisco Bay Area, with a private practice in Oakland, California. She is Director of Mental Health and Child Adolescent Gender Center and Chief Psychologist at the Child and Adolescent Gender Center Clinic at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital. I said it right. She specializes in research, clinical work, and consultations related to gender nonconforming children and assisted reproductive technology families, lecturing, pu publishing, serving as an expert and witness on both topics nationally and internationally. Dr. Aaron Saff received her PhD from the University of Michigan and has served as faculty at UCSF, University of California, Berkeley, the Wright Institute, Psychoanalytical Institute of Northern California, and Access Institute San Francisco. She is author of Gender Born, Gender Made, Mommy's Daddy's Donors, Surrogates Building a Home Within, co-titled with Tony Hyman, Spoiling Childhood, Parenting Together, and a forthcoming book, The Gender Creative Child. Dr. Ernstaff is a founding member and senior clinician and board member of A Home Within, a national organization addressing the emotional needs of children of foster care, and serves on the board of directors of Gender Spectrum, a national organization addressing the needs of gender expansive children and their families. Please welcome Dr. Ernstaff. Well, I can't tell you how delighted I am to be here and to see everybody's face here because it's because of all of you that we can be here doing what we're doing and we'll do more. And I want to thank everybody who is responsible for having me be here today. And I want to preface it by saying that some of the things I'll be talking about may sound completely repetitious of what you just heard from Joel. Because we are like Tweedledee Dee and Tweedledee Dumb, and we go to the beat of the same drum, so um, bear with any duplications, but I think it will underline how important we think the points are we want to make. So the first thing I want to introduce you to is Stuart Little. Now you may be wondering, why Stuart Little? For those of you who know the story, Mr. and Mrs. Little gave birth to a mouse, Stuart. They were a little perplexed how to raise a mouse. And their doctor was very excited and said it's going to be really good. And they went, I'm not so sure. This is going to be a little difficult. But they did it. And among other things, they were very wor worried about Stuart's safety. So they removed the nursery rhyme from the book. They tore the page out, Three Blind Mice, because they never wanted Stuart to worry that his tail was going to get cut off by the farmer's wife. Now. I don't think E.B. White had any idea when he wrote this book in the 1940s that he was writing the allegory of the family who gives birth to a gender expansive child. And the only difference between the littles and families today or historically that, give, that have a gender expansive child in their midst is you often don't know the day they're born. You may, may find out in their first year, their second year. You may find out when they're 50. But the task is still the same. How do we support our little Stuart Little? And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning in a developmental perspective on gender expansive children. Now, the first thing I will say, as you saw from Joel's talk, 
is that we have an incredible change in what's happened around gender historically in our culture right now. It used to be bedrock for many people, it still is. That's why we say, what are you having, a boy or a girl? Do you know? Now we have gender as moving boulders. We have created a shakeup in what we define gender as being and how we're going to relate to all the genders in our culture. And what I will say about that is we have always had, as we saw before, historical shifts and shakeups in gender. Here's a picture, 17th century, century the Netherlands. L little boy with his billy goat. This was the typical attire for any child uh, assigned male at birth until age seven. And this is true in Western Europe throughout the 19th century, sometimes into the early 20th century. So there we have boy in a dress. And now we have 2012, this is the pharmacy near my house. I went there shopping one day and I noticed this child and the mother referred to this child as he. And this child, if you can't tell, is pilfering candy from a table that has candy on it. And what was most notable to me is this child is wearing a little REI jacket, work boots, little painter pants, and a pink tutu. And I live in Oakland. Nobody batted an eye. They just said, oh, hi. They didn't even notice he was pilfering candy. So <laughs> then we have, this was sent by a colleague of mine. This is her child in the toy department, I believe, at Toys R Us. I mean, that is a masochistic thing to do for any parent, but there is their child. Again, identifies as male with his pink butterfly wings, picking out his Tonka truck with his pink wand. <laughs> and then we have, this is, this was in the New York Times recently. So this is, again, the ambiguity around gender in 2016. And I'll tell you a story about history. We talked about, at different times, things have changed. So I would ask you, those of you who are old enough, how many of you went to a grade school where girls were required to wear dresses? Quite a few of us. So now I want to bring us to 2000, about 2010. I'm explaining to my granddaughter, who was then 10, how I grew up in Chicago and girls were required to wear dresses or skirts to school every day, even if there was a blizzard. And my 10-year-old granddaughter, knowing I was a feminist, looked at me and said, Grandma, why didn't you protest? <laughs> so around the social construct of gender, in 2016, I'd be protesting, but we didn't think about it. In 2010, it just was the way it was. So the first step and a new developmental model for understanding gender is we have to unlearn most everything we learned in school. So it goes like this. I started graduate school in 1968. My emphasis was gender development. And here's what I learned. You're born. You come out. The doctor, and it was usually a doctor, not a midwife at the time, looks between your legs and goes, boy or girl. And then, in the first two years of life, you learn your core gender identity. You learn in those first two years, I am boy, I am girl. That's your developmental task. If you were born what at that time was called hermaphroditic, get it corrected right away surgically, and make sure that there's a clear assigned gender from then on, because if you don't do it by 18 months, at the latest 24 months, you've already fixed a gender identity that can't be changed. So make sure you do it early, because by two, that sense, I am a, uh, is fixed. Then, but it's, kids don't think it's permanent. You can do some backsies on it, but they know I am boy, I am a girl. Maybe it'll change later, but I know who I am ages two to six. Then you learn what it means to be boy, what it means to be girl, and there's nothing in between. And you learn that from the people around you. They socialize you to teach you how to do your gender. And that should be in place by the time you're six years old. 
if you were trained psychoanalytically as I was, we have a whole other drama here, okay? That drama. First of all, you have a mother and a father, heterosexual couple. They have a baby, that's you. You fall in love with your opposite sex parent. And then you go, oops, they're taken. And I'm gonna get in big trouble if I try and run off with that parent. So I'm gonna give that parent up, too dangerous. And instead, I'm gonna identify with a parent who's the same sex as I am, and I'm gonna learn how to do it. So when I get older, I'll have my own spouse. I'll find my own, because that one's taken. So then, by the time you're six years old, you know that you're a boy or a girl. You know how to be a boy or a girl. And you are also heterosexual, if you're normal. That was the developmental model, and sex, gender, and sexuality were combined as one developmental track. If any of those things weren't in place, and if you were confused if you were a boy or a girl, if you did believe there were some backsies on that you could change, or if you were showing, particularly for little boys, effeminate traits, get thee to a therapist, because you have a disorder. That's what I learned. That was the theory. That's the theory that a lot of mental health professionals today abide by. That is a big problem. Because if a theory is robust, it has to apply to reality. This theory does not. It does not. First of all, let's start with, let me repeat what Joel said, gender development and sexual identity development are two separate tracks. Secondly, there are many very healthy gay, lesbian, bisexual people. It is not disordered. It is healthy variation. Next, your gender is not fixed at age six. We see people who change their gender over the course of their life, both in expressions and identity, with no aspersion on their character and with no dents on their mental health. So what that means is gender isn't fixed at six, it's a lifelong process, and it's not based on the sex assigned at birth. It may be. But let me ask you another question. Raise your hand if you are left-handed. Look around, everyone. There's not a lot of us, but we're very special. <laughs> but in other cultures, or in my dad's generation, we were not special, we were to be fixed. We are a small minority, and we are a healthy variation in human development. The same applies to gender. There are cisgender children, there are transgender children, there are gender expansive children, they, they're all healthy. So I just want to say we've got to throw this theory out. So that's fine, but what do we replace it with? So this is my idea of a model for thinking about gender, and it's very consistent with Joel's, has some variations. So we know, we talked about gender boxes, down with gender boxes, boys in one, girls in the other, binary. Then we have the gender spectrum. Joel described to you the gender spectrum. It's an excellent way to think about gender. It's in all its hues, colors, variations. But I wanted to go one step further. And it goes back to that notion of gender as a sphere with infinite possibilities. So I made up the idea of a gender web. That we have a three-dimensional web. If you think of a web in a tree, it stretches in three dimensions. And everyone has their own unique gender web, like a snowflake. And the gender web has three major threads. They've got the threads of nature, the threads of nurture, and the threads of culture. And now I'm gonna break it down even more specifically. We have chromosomes, hormones, hormone receptors, gonads, primary sex characteristics, secondary sex characteristics, your brain, your mind, socialization, family, school, community, and I use community in the largest sense, uh, culture, the values, the ethics, the laws, the theories, and the practices of a culture. All of you sitting here today have all of that infused in you if I ask you, what's your gender? Now, we also, to get a little twilight zone -y, we have a fourth dimension. And the fourth dimension is time. So each individual alters their gender web 
as they weave together nature, nurture, and culture over time, which means it's fluid throughout development. And I will say, going back to the theory, what is true in that theory is by age two, children can know their gender. And for many people, it does remain stable in terms of our gender identities for the rest of our life, but not necessarily. So we always have to consider the time dimension. Now, the gender web, it's like snowflakes, and it's also like fingerprints. So the way it's like fingerprints is every one of us has our own unique set of fingerprints, and they will stay with us from the moment we're born to the moment we die, and that's the one difference. Unlike fingerprints, gender webs are not fixed at birth, and they're gonna change over the course of your lifetime. So now where do parents come in to each little child's gender web? The gender web is each child, youth, individual's personal creation. If the parents grab the thread from the child, they're gonna mess up the child's gender web, and they're gonna leave that child feeling all tangled up. But if the parents facilitate the child weaving their own personal gender web, then that child's gonna feel expansive, supported. Now, I wanna tell you a little bit about labels. We talk about gender infinity and not boxing people in, but kids really like self-labels. They like to create their own boxes. So these are not fixed boxes, but what I wanted to share with you are some of the self-labels that the kids I've worked with have come up with. Now, I'm putting them all under the umbrella of gender non-conforming children, and I'm using that term for the following reason. The word conform, in terms of language, we're talking about children who either do not conform to what people told them they were supposed to be based on what's listed on their birth certificate for their sex, or they're not conforming to the cultural expectations of how to do gender. So, underneath that umbrella, we have first our transgender children. Joel has already defined them. They're the children who say, I am not the gender you think I am. I am either the opposite or another gender, but not that one. We have gender fluid children. And gender fluid children are either gender fluid across time, they may we wave and weave their gender as they go, or in one moment, they do a mosaic of gender that pulls in all the cultural tropes about boy, girl, and other. So there's a gender fluidity. Then we have a whole group of kids who are the gender hybrids. And let me tell you how I came to that. I went to my waiting room to meet with a seven-year-old child whose parents asked me to see the child because they felt the child was confused about their gender. So I went, I got the child, and I saw a little boy in basketball shorts, basketball tee, kind of tank top, basketball shoes, basketball socks to here. So I welcomed this child into my office, and as soon as we closed the door, the child whipped around and showed me a long blonde braid with a pink bow at the bottom down this child's back. The child whipped around again and said, you see, I'm a Prius. <laughs> she said, yes, I am a gender Prius. I am a boy in the front and a girl in the back. So we have the idea of a gender Prius, and that gave me the notion of hybrids, and then I started notice noticing different hybrids. The next is the gender Taurus or gender Minotaur, whichever mythological term we want to use. I'm one thing on the top and the other on the bottom, and that's often for children to take care of their genitalia that say one thing about them, but their mind and everything else says something else. So they're often, they'll, and they'll come in and say, you see I'm a girl in the top, but a boy in the bottom. And they love mermaids to play with. So if you're a therapist and you have toys in your office, make sure you have mermaids, lots of them. Then we have gender by season. I feel comfortable and safe at home wearing my dresses. This is a a child identifies as male, wears dresses all the time at home, but I'll never do it at school. It would be terrible to do it at school. So we have gender by season, free in the summer, constricted in the, during the school year, and we can have the opposite. We can have an unaccepted family and an accepting school where the expression 
of, of, wear, of wearing the dress will happen at school and be taken off to go home. And so in the summer, I go back to my boy self. At school, I put on my dress. Then we have very similar gender by location. And gender by location is, honey, I don't think grandma's ready. <laughs> so when we go to grandma's, I think we won't wear the dress. So that would be by location. And I wanted to tell you one that's in there towards the bottom. At our clinic, we had been using a scale that was one equals boy, 10 equals girl, or the opposite, one uh, boy, we put boy and girl in either way, but it was a one to 10 scale. So we would ask a child, where do you rate yourself? If boy is here, girl is here, where would you put yourself in that scale? Well, as a group, some of us said, we don't like the scale, too linear. Let's not use it anymore. So we agreed as a clinic, we weren't gonna use it anymore. So I walked in to see a child I had been seeing since this child was little, this child was now 11, and the child looked at me with great accusation and said, Dr. Rosenthal forgot to give me the scale this time. So rather than explaining we're not using the scale anymore, I said, well, so tell me, why did you want to tell Dr. Rosenthal? I wanted to tell him I moved from a four to a six. Okay, well, I'll make sure he knows. And then I decided it was time to tell him about the notion of a gender Prius. I said, well, maybe, you know, let me tell you about this idea of a gender Prius. Maybe you're saying you're gender Prius. And this child stopped for a while, thoughtfully, and said, I think I'm moving towards a Tesla. <laughs> so we have the all-electric child, okay? <laughs> Which speaks to children are in motion. And that's the kind of transitions we're talking about. Not from male to female, but in development. How they're transitioning in their own development and how we're helping them do that. Now, we have gender ambidextrous children. And this came... This was with parents that we came, I came up with this. These are two moms, they're both scientists. They had, at that time, a five-year-old who did not want to declare a gender. He said, don't ask me. And told some kids in the neighborhood, call me boy, told his sister, you call me girl. Couldn't figure, parents said, look, we're scientists, we need an answer. We just need to know. So I did an, a, a long assessment and spent time with the child and came back and I said, Okay, I'll tell you what I know. You have a gender ambidextrous child. Your child uses both hands, a male hand, a female hand, and they loved it. They said, great, that is scientific. We can tell it to other people. So we now have the new term, gender ambidextrous, that seems to be, have caught on for many families. Then we have gender smoothies. This was a teenager who was as gender creative as you will ever met, meet in a kid, and said to me, let me tell you how it works. You take everything about gender, you stick it in the blender, you press the button, you have me. I am a gender smoothie. So we have gender smoothies. We have uh, gender queer youth who would be saying, why are you bothering with this conference? We are so beyond gender. We're about being human. It's about time to stop talking about it. So we, and that are not, that's not just individual kids, youth, and adults, it's a whole social movement. Then we have agender youth, also usually identify as gender queer, and agender means one of two things. I'm not any gender, or I'm agender. So we have our agender youth, we have proto-gay children. Now I'm bringing sexuality back in. There are many children who explore their gender on their way to discovering their sexuality. And these are often the boys who are dragged into clinics for being effeminate. And it turns out they are going to be our healthy gay men if we just let them be. So, and it can come in any variety of gender. That's the most common way we see it. Then we have the opposite, which is proto-transgender youth. And these are children who, youth who usually place themselves in a uh, community of Let's, well, I'm of sexual, of either gay or lesbian community and discover, often through the romantic experiences, you know, it doesn't fit. When, so, for example, when I'm with, I'm a girl with a girl being romantic, I'm a boy being with that girl. So they discover their transgender identity through their burgeoning sexual development, sexual identity, which doesn't feel like a good fit. And then we have the last group, and this is the group that concerns us most as a mental health educational 
legal community and his families. And those are our gender Tootsie Roll Pops. And the gender Tootsie Roll Pops are one gender on the outside and another on the inside. And that usually means that they're keeping under wraps the real one and creating a candy coating on the outside to protect the inside one from harm. And these are the kids who are often at risk for anxiety, depression, self-harm, school-related problems, sexual acting out, and unfortunately, a high rate of suicidality. So this is why I say we really have to pay attention to these kids who feel they need to protect their gender. Now, there's another way in this developmental model to think about gender, and it goes to the gender Tootsie Roll Pop. And that way is that we have, each of us has a true gender self. It's the core of us, it's how we know ourselves to be, and the kernel of it is there at birth. It doesn't stay there, but there's something there at birth. Then we have the false gender self, and that's the presentation we give to the world because that's what the world wants from us, or we're afraid if we show the real one, we'll get hurt. Then we have the most important thing, gender creativity, and that is the weaving together of a unique, authentic gender self based on core feelings and chosen gender expressions. Every one of us has a true self, a, a true gender self, a false gender self, and, a, and some gender creativity, we hope, if it doesn't get squelched. Because occasionally we are adapting. So I'm going to give you an ex a personal example so you can think of your own. I identify as cisgender. I was always a tomboy and a ballerina at the same time, but I was also very good in math. I went to a big public high school. If, if you ever saw the movie Sixteen Candles, that high school is my physical high school. So that's where I went to school. And I was now in calculus, AP calculus. I was the only girl in the class. This was 1963. My mother always said, don't tell people your grades, you'll never get a date. I was heterosexual as well. I really wanted a date. So I was really self-conscious about going into my calculus class because everybody would know I was a geek, right? So I got this idea, because there were really crowded halls passing between, sessions, uh, between classes. So I stood in the doorway of my classroom and backed into my class, because I felt everybody rushing by would just get a snapshot. They would just see me in the doorway and think I was leaving the algebra class rather than going into the calculus class. Now, how stupid is that, to see someone walking backwards <laughs> into a class and of course, years later, I feel, I can't believe I did that. But I did. And that was my false gender self, because I didn't want to be a girl who was good at math in certain contexts. I was fine when I was in the calculus room, but not outside it. So we just think about the ways we protect how we do our gender all the time. Now, now let's bring back in the gender web. So the gender, gender creativity is each child's personal artistry composing a unique, authentic gender web based on core feelings of gender identity and chosen gender expressions. Now, where do parents fit into gender creativity? Really important for any of you, who, anyone who is a parent or works with parents, parents have very little control over their child's true gender identity. They can suppress it, but they can't make it happen. And they're often accused of making it happen. Why did you let your child wear, a, your boy wear a dress? It's all your fault. It would be an accusation. They have very little control over core gender identity. But where they do have extensive influence is over their child's gender health and the ability of their child to express themselves authentically about their gender. So we don't believe in pressuring the children. When the time is right, they'll choose the appropriate gender. So it's the notion that it's up to the child, not up to them. Now, I want to tell you this one story, which in terms of parent facilitating, this is the story of Nils Pickard. So Nils Pickard is German. He and his family moved from Berlin to a small town, and he had a five-year-old child, identified as male, who liked to wear dresses. It was OK in their progressive school in Berlin, but in the small town they were moving to, he thought this is going to be a little more complicated. And so his decision on the first day of school in their small town is he would put on a skirt and take his child to school in a dress. 
And so this is Nils with his, with his child. This story went viral, and uh, Nils got um, voted and elected Father of the Year by Gawker. And I wanted to just read you the email that Nils had sent to me. Hi, Diane. Since I have, up until now, practically found no time to read all the stuff written about me wearing a skirt, I'm trying to catch up. I read about your lecture in Canada and you are using me as, a, as an example of supporting kids for what they are instead of what we want them to be. Well, what can I say? I'm touched. I'm just trying my best to provide my kids with all the space and understanding they need. If you're all for an equitable society and human rights, which I am, you have to teach your kids about different identities and ways of life. If I would support my boy in being the next big soccer star, no one would have even cared but I supported him in wearing skirts and dresses. Wow, big thing. But what's the difference? Anyhow, I appreciate your work. All the best. So these are the words of a father just supporting his child. Now I want to move to our model of care. This is a typical call we might get either at the clinic or in my private practice. Hi, doctor. I came across your information while I was researching for my son. He recently just turned four and he wants to be a girl and is only drawn to girl toys clothes for the past two years. We have not spoken with a professional doctor but wanted to reach out early and find ways we, are parent, we as parents can support him. Please let me know if you could help. Thank you. So just hold on to the request. And I want to now tell you that we have a controversy right now in the clinical field as to what would be the best model to approach this mother and help her. So I want to just break down the three major models that exist right now for care of gender nonconforming children. The first is called the live to live in your own skin. And it's the, that approach. And that's the model that had been used by Dr. Ken Zucker at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto. For those of you who don't know, in December 2015, this clinic was closed for being in, uh, practicing below the standards of care and also in violation of the new statutes in Ontario for which legislated against any forms of therapy that attempt to change either a child's gender identity or expressions. So this is the traditional model. It is used, you will find it in the Bay Area, and it's basically that children do have a problem, young children, and they're confused about their gender if they want to be the other gender or express themselves in accordance with what we call uh, sex gender-appropriate behavior. And so we try to fix it. And we try to fix it by taking away the inappropriate toys, replacing them with appropriate toys, by finding same-sex friendships instead of those quote unquote, opposite sex friendships, by getting a, the parent of the same gender to be more closely involved and have, having the parent of the opposite gender with the child is, that the child is identifying with step back, and also individual psychotherapy for both the child and the parents, and for the parents to figure out their conflicts and their inability to help shape their child's appropriate gender. That's the model. Okay, we don't like that model. Um, the second model uh, comes, is the Dutch model. And we owe so much to the Dutch in terms of a progressive m form of treatment for gender nonconforming children. And they introduced us to the use of puberty blockers to staunch the flow of puberty while children have more time to think about it or where children already know, I don't want that puberty. Um, and they, what, they, what they have in their model, however, is that for children who are prepubertal, let's just do watchful waiting. Because we don't know yet till they reach puberty, and they probably don't know either exactly what their gender is. So let's just support them in their gender expressions and wait till puberty. And then if they still are insistent, consistent, and persistent, we would consider both the social transition and medical interventions. So it's a careful model, and it's called watchful waiting. So that's model number two. And there are many people who use this model. 
Now we come to the third model. And this is the model we use at the UCSF Gender Clinic, and I call it Listen and Act. And this is also known as the Gender Affirmative Model. And I'm gonna focus on this model uh, and tell you more about it. So in this Gender Affirmative Model, here's our major premises. Gender variations, not disorders. Gender presentations, diverse, varied across cultures. We must have cultural sensitivity then to gender and all its cultural manifestations. Gender interweaving bio of biology, development, and socialization, culture, and context. Gender may be fluid, not necessarily binary. Pathology, if there is pathology for a child, it's often related to interpersonal and cultural reactions to the child, if it's present at all. Therefore, and this is, I want to star, pathology more likely lies in the culture rather than in the child. So it is the culture that needs to be fixed. And the last thing we are discovering is that actually, they used to think gender was the disease, but we're discovering gender is the cure rather than the disease. Now, gender health. A use opportunity to live in the gender that feels most real and comfortable. A use ability to express gender with freedom from restriction, aspersion, or rejection. Treatment goals, we want to facilitate an authentic gender self, alleviate gender stress, distress. We want to build gender resilience. That's incredibly important, how to meet up with the world with your authentic gender, and we want to make sure we secure social supports. Essentic therapeutic tenant, not for us to tell, but for the children to say. I'm not for us to say, but for the children to tell. Usually I have the cartoon it can't talk yet, but we all love this cartoon, so I'm not going to repeat the cartoon, but it fits right here. And I just wanted to go back to the mother of the four-year-old to give you a sense of how this model works. And this is small print, but I'll just go through it for you. These are the kind of questions we might be thinking about with this mother and wh whoever else are the parenting uh, participants. How long has your child been expressing cross-gender identifications or behaviors? Has it been consistent over a period of time? If able to express a sense of their own gender, how does your child articulate it? With what feeling does your child say, and this is a really important one, I want to be a boy, girl, other, or do they say, I am a boy, girl, other? That want to be versus am, important difference in verb. How insistent is your child in declarations and demonstrations of gender? How persistent? Does your child show distress or stress about the body they have? Is your child making serious statements rather than playful gestures when gravitating towards the toys, activities, dress codes, etc., typically designated for the other gender within your culture? Does your child express distress when someone quote unquote misgenders them? Does your child show delight when someone perceives them as the opposite gender? of what most people know them to be. How do you as parents or other people in your child's life respond to your child's gender messages? So this is what we would just be opening up a conversation to learn more about. Now, we have a challenge here. We say, if you listen, the children will tell you who they are, but how are we ever supposed to know what they're saying? They don't necessarily give you a narrative and tell you in words what they're thinking and feeling. So I just wanted to run through very quickly. This is what we as clinicians do. We listen. We just listen. We mirror, and that's really important. We try to reflect back to the child what we think the child is showing us to see if it is a correct mirror image or not. Because most of these child are, children are being mismirrored. Nobody is mirroring back to them who they authentically are. We play with them. We get more out of play than words, particularly with young children. We have to suspend ourselves in a state of not knowing. Parents do too, educators do too. There's a period of time where none of us may know what this child's gender is. That, going back to bedrock, makes us nervous. So we have to work on that anxiety and just live with the excitement of not knowing. Now, this, this 
fancy term, we monitor our counter transference experience that, that may distort our gender vision. In other words, all those personal experiences we have about gender, like, ooh, I don't feel so comfortable about a boy in a dress, that's not going to help that boy in a dress. So we have to really monitor those feelings as they come up in us. We must have cultural sensitivity because gender is culture bound and we also have our universals about gender at the same time and we have to hold both. We must collaborate with parents, family, professionals, community, and most importantly, with the child. Now, these are some myths about the model I just told you about. And there, let me say, it's hot and heavy right now, okay? There are bullets flying uh, in terms of lines drawn in the, in the sand about how to help gender nonconforming children. So, what is criticized? We are told that we rub, if we say we listen the child tells, then we just rubber stamp whatever a child tells us about their gender. We just put a rubber stamp, send them off, okay, that's who you are. Second myth. We push children to become transgender for our own political reasons, with no science to support us. And I'll read you a quote that came from what I thought was a very disturbing uh, op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal by Deborah So. The silencing of those who oppose letting children make their own choices about, about gender sends the message to parents that early transitioning is the only valid and ethical approach to a gender dysphoric child. This message, pushing children to transition at increasingly early ages so that they will fit neatly into one of two gender categories is false and unscientific. So the reality, number one, we are not gender pushers. We listen with an ear to finding out with what a youth gender is, provide them with all the nutrients they need to, lead, to live authentically in that gender. Two, we give it as long as it takes to find out with collaboration among the child, the family, and the professionals. Reality, we really believe in science. We like science. And here's something that I and a colleague of mine just wrote. So what does the emerging science say? It offers several important findings, that the gender identity of transgender children is, a deeply, is as deeply felt as that of cisgender, non-transgender children, that transgender youth are much less likely to attempt suicide with the strong support of their parents, and that the well-being of youth who physically transition in puberty is on par with their cisgender counterparts of the same age 10 years later. It is out of direct recognition of these scientific findings that dozens of new clinics affirming transgender children and their families have been established. The only change added I made on that, it's more than dozens. Now we have this other clinical controversy. How can a young child know their gender? Now I'm going to start by saying, remember the theory I told you? By age six, you're supposed to know your gender? So why is that true only for cisgender children and not for transgender children? You cannot have it both ways. So let's go into it. Here's the research. You may have heard the research on persisters, desisters. Persisters, they're young children who receive a gender diagnosis early in life and persist with that diagnosis into adolescence. Desisters, they're young children who receive a gender diagnosis early in life and no longer have that diagnosis by puberty. The majority of children in clinical studies have proven to be desisters. The most recent finding, 63%. It's usually quoted as 85. So here's the question. How could we possibly sort out the persisters and desisters early in life? And if we can't, how could we allow young children to transition from one gender to another, which is an option for prepubertal children? Why would we care? because children have better mental health outcomes if we recognize them for the gender they are rather than the gender we think they should be. Now I'm gonna introduce you to apples, oranges, and fruit salad. And when I read the persister, desister research, I thought, oh my God, they're talking about apples and oranges. Don't they see that? And so I've come up with some categories which I'm now gonna share with you. That we have some youth who will be exploring or affirming their gender identity, those are our apples. We have some youth who will be exploring or affirming their gender expressions. Those are our oranges. And we have some youth who will be exploring or affirming both. And those are our fruit salads. So let's go to, first, the fault line in the clinical studies. 
The clinical studies concentrate on measures of gender dysphoria in the past gender identity dysphoria. They fail to highlight the two more critical variables. What's a child's gender identity? Just neutrally. How do they identify? And what is the child's gender expressions? And let's, both, let's look at them and separate them. So to separate apples, oranges, and fruit salad, we have to separate gender identity from expressions. Now just to review, gender identity, who I know myself to be at my core, gender expressions, how I do my gender, how I put my gender presentation together. So, First step, how to tell if a toy is for boys or girls? Do you operate the toy with your genitalia? Yes, it's not for children. No, it is for either boys or girls. And I will simply add to that, or children of any gender. But since I didn't make this up, I'm just using it as is. But that's, and there we have it in terms of toys are human toys or their X-rated toys. <laughs> now let's go to our apples. These are the children who often show up in the gender, child gender research as the persisters. And their cross-gender and their identifications early in life continue on the same track into puberty, uh, into and beyond puberty. So these are the consistent, persistent, and insistent kids about their identities, okay? Typically they'll say, I am a, rather than I wish I was a. And these are just guidelines. It's not universally true because sometimes by age three, kids know we don't speak of such things, so I'll soften it. I won't say I am a, but I'll do a false gender self and say, well, maybe kind of I thought maybe I would like to someday. They may express a lot of body dysphoria. They do this as little kids. They do this in puberty. Puberty around the trauma of a changing body, little kids, mommy, can we cut my penis off and make me a vagina? Mommy, when's my penis going to grow? I hate what I have. Why did God get it wrong? Can we go back in and can I come out the right way? Now, these are, for these kids, the gender explorations typically don't present as child's play, but serious work. And I will say that many of these children, let's just take its uh, assigned male at birth child. That child, probably will not be wearing princess dresses, but his sisters, borrow his sister's clothes. In other words, they just want regular girl clothes, not costumes. So you're looking for that as something that's not play, but expression of daily life and how I want to look. Not always true, but it's something to look for. The nature thread of their gender web is often quite strong. So many parents say to me, this child just came to me that way. So the question is, how did they come? And we're seeing, indeed, strong biological, genetic, and intrauterine influences on gender identity. These are our youngest cohort of transgender people. And here we have an apple. Now, I particularly chose this apple because she's from the Netherlands. And what's happening in the Netherlands is although it's a watchful waiting model that dominates the scene, families aren't abiding by it, and they're simply allowing their children to transition prior to coming to the clinic for services. So this is one of our um, apples from the Netherlands. Then we have the oranges. These are the children who often show up as the D sisters, and they usually don't repudiate their assigned natal sex, but they may say, I wish I was a. Large number of these children will become gay or queer, exploring gender on the way to discovering sexual identities. They don't tend to repudiate their bodies, but they sure can engage in fantasy play or ruminations about life in another body. I had, I worked with one girl whose mother was a physician, and she got a hold of her mother's surgical gloves and basically made penises out of them and brought them, and she packed, and then she brought them to school and passed them out to all her friends. So all the girls in school were walking around with packed penises made from surgical gloves in fourth grade. And everybody was having a great time, but she loved having her penis, but she also liked her vagina. So this was play. Uh, the explorations are more likely in the realm of gender expressions rather than core gender identities. And for these kids, what we see is nature, nurture, and culture are all very strong threads. So we have a little kind of promotion of my books. This is the cover of Gender Born, Gender Made. That's an orange. And this is the cover of my new book, Another Orange. So this is a child who's playing with gender expressions. 
So we have two oranges here. Now we go to our fruit salads. And this, I started out with apples and oranges and realized I have to add fruit salads. Somebody said, you shouldn't use that. Fruit is really a derogatory term and usually refers to effeminate men and gay men. I said, okay, I'm appropriating the term. Just like we appropriated queer, I'm appropriating fruit then. So we have our fruit salads. And these are children who are, and adults, who are, it's a tapestry of self, neither male nor female, creative understanding of gender, both in identities and expressions. These children typically resist gender boxes, often live in gender middle grounds, no either or, but instead all in any. They often I will identify as our agender, pangender, gender fluid, gender queer children and youth. And recently I would say that the culture thread of gender, the gender web is showing up to be very strong and opening up the doors for fruit salads and that children are very influenced by the new notion of gender infinity, as we saw in the statistics, that 50% of youth don't think there's just two genders. And particularly in adolescence, if we think adolescence and our culture is around identity exploration, we've now thrown gender into the hopper for kids to explore their gender and wonder what that is along with their political affiliations, their religion, et cetera. Here we have a fruit salad. And this is somebody who identifies as agender. Now, apples, what should we do for our apples? I'd say if we rule out other possibilities that gender might be a symptom of something other than gender, and if we find out the central issue is gender identity, not gender expressions, when the child or youth expresses a need or a desire to transition, when the parents or the caregiving environment can offer positive support for the child transitioning, then we consider a social transition either everywhere or in safe situations. What about our oranges? If the issue is gender expression, not core gender identity, then we carve out space and support for the youth to express gender in the way that suits the youth, not the way that suits society. No social gender transition of identity is called for. What about the fruit salads? They're a melange. Some may request or benefit from a gender transition, but not necessarily a binary one. Others are fine with the sex assigned on their birth certificate, but redefine what that means. We need to stretch our thinking to consider a pangender, agender, third, fourth, and so forth gender identity. What if they change their minds? That's the thing that comes up all the time. What if they change their minds? Well, then we help them spin together their gender web as they know it now. There are no data to indicate that children who change their gender more than once over time, including switching back from transgender to their original gender, are at risk for any psychological disturbances as long as we support them in that journey. Now, guidelines for all these children. Listen to the child, help the child discover the gender position that feels most authentic, fortify that child's gender resilience, Remember, gender does not lie between your legs, but between your ears, in your, in your mind and your brain. Always keep in mind that penis does not necessarily equal male, and vagina does not necessarily equal female. I'll add all other sexually defined organs. Make no attempt to ward off a transgender or gender nonconforming outcome, including transitions in prepubertal children. First step in affirming a child's gender is that before looking inside the child, take a look inside yourself. I'm just reiterating what Joel said at the very beginning of his talk, but I want you to think, think about this. We all have gender angels. We all do. And those are the feelings we learn that help us recognize gender in all the variations. It allows us to promote gender health, facilitates gender acceptance. So call on your gender angels, however, we all have gender ghosts. And these are the things you were taught that come together in beliefs, attitudes, feelings, reactions, and they may be unconscious or subconscious. They tell you things like gender nonconforming people are really sick, or we have to police gender if it doesn't come in two boxes. Transgender boys and men are not real males. Transgender girls and women are not real females. You can't just live in the middle or say you're neither male or female. It doesn't work that way. Fill in the blank. Now, there's a war of the world between our gender angels and gender ghosts. We have both. We discover we have both. 
Typically, they're in conflict with each other. Our task, let the gender angels drown out the voices of the gender ghosts. How? Self-examination, self-reflection, feedback from those around you. Why should you bother? Because anything else is going to cause harm. Not just to the children, but to the families and to the institutions those children reside in, not to mention the entire society. Now, to do that, beware gender microaggressions. Those are the little pings. They're the little things that happen every day to minority populations and gender nonconforming transgender youth and young adults count as such a group. If you add up microaggressions, they can even be, cause a tremendous trauma. So if, examples, refusal to use correct pronouns, constantly slipping, forgetting to keep using the correct gender pronoun, Refusal to use a use preferred name. This is particularly important in schools and families, both. Asking someone what's between their legs. Running out of the bathroom if you see a transgender youth walk in. Standing by passively when someone is making fun of a youth gender. Making jokes about transgender people are not intervening when someone else does. Another slight one not here is just a little bit of a flick of your eyes even when you see a boy walk in your office wearing a dress. It sometimes happens. Now, to be a gender ally, you're gonna to try to eliminate your gender ghosts, build a firewall around them so they don't get out and hurt our gender creative youth, and you're gonna fashion yourself as a full length mirror. No one wants to look in a mirror and discover they're invisible. So the best gift you can give a gender non-conforming youth is reflect back the authentic positive image of who they are through your words, your actions, feelings. When it comes to gender, their gender is as real as yours and mine, and as real as it gets. So no gender specialist is an island, so therefore you need an interdisciplinary model of care. At our clinic, we have it. We have a pediatric endocrinologist, a nurse practitioner, social worker, psychologist, educator, advocate, and an attorney. So without this whole team, we can't meet our treatment goals. With it, we can. So I would say it takes a village to support one gender non-conforming child and certainly to support all of our gender non-conforming people who live among us. So it's the youth, the family, friends, religious leaders, educators, mental health professionals, medical professionals, attorneys, judges, lawmakers, legislators. And I wanna finish with letting the youth speak. This was a question asked to one of our patients at the UCS CF Gender Clinic when this patient was nine. And at age eight, this child transitioned from male to female. And here was the question. What would you do if someone told you that now it was time to go back to living as a boy? The emphatic response, I'd take him to court. And then there was a pause. Or, they can take me to court. So, I want you to think about that as gender non-conforming children enter your life. Now, I think I finished in time. So, <laughs> that we can have a, f I wanted to leave some time for any questions that people might have because we have 15, a little less than 15 minutes. So, are there any questions or comments that people would like to make? Yes. I definitely will repeat the question. And, if, and could people stand when they ask the question? Because I don't think we have a roving mic. We do. Yes, we have a roving mic. OK. Our mic is about to rove. Where are you? Stand up. I, and can you stand up? The, you have to stand. Though. Thank you. What are some words that you use to explain gender to a three, four, and five-year-old? Um, so my daughter asks a lot of questions about gender expression and, I, and identity without knowing what she's asking, but I don't quite have the language to talk to her about it. Not necessarily for herself, but for people who she sees. So she's asking about, uh, so... Is that a boy? Is that a girl? What does uh -huh. it mean to be a boy? What does it mean to be a girl? Is it because they have a penis? Is it because they have a vagina? And I don't quite know how to use language to talk about gender, and I want to. Um, so we have transgender yes. family, et cetera, but if you have any words of wisdom for that. Well, I have a, a few words of wisdom. <laughs> 
First of all, in terms of the question, is that a boy or is that a girl? I would say, you know, we don't know. We'll have to ask them. So that would be the start. That they'll, only they know for sure. So, but we can, we can, and some people like to be asked, some people don't. But I would say, we know, I would explain the different, all, I'd say, you know, some people think that if you have, because by two or three, by three you're learning. Some people think if you have a penis, then you're a boy. And if you have a vagina or a vulva, you're a girl. But actually, it's not like that. It's not like that at all. If you're a boy, it's because your mind is telling you, I'm a boy. If you're a girl, it's because your mind is telling you, you're a girl. And some girls like to wear dresses, and some girls like to dress as Darth Vader. So we, that's not, those are people things, but there are some people where we live who think one thing is a boy thing and one thing is a girl thing. So there is a teaching moment there, because I'm staying in our culture, Kids by three know their culture. Remember I said gender socialization starts at two? So we have to sometimes unsocialize those messages with new messages. Um, and then, um, then the next thing is, some people think there's only g two genders, but there's lots and lots of genders. It's just like a rainbow, it has all different colors. And then I'd stop there, because it's almost way too many words already for a three-year-old, but I would stop and see what dialogue comes from that. So I don't know if that's a helpful start. And you still, I mean, a three-year-old say, yeah, I know, but is that a boy or a girl? So, and, and, then you, and then you say, that's really complicated, rather than it's simple. Because I think it's good to send the message that it's, um, it's a really good question, and we have to put a whole lot of things together to get the answer. What happened? Hello? Oh, there we go. Um, I know that this is a whole other symposium question, but could you speak a little bit to gender identity and expression and neurodiversity? And to get, because we need to talk about that. Uh, Thanks. I'm, I, yeah, I could talk about that for hours, but I only have a minute or so. But, okay, so the question is about uh, neurodiversity and gender identity, gender expressions. So many of you will know neurodiversity as being on the spectrum, and not the gender spectrum, but the ASD uh, spectrum. That uh, to have received a diagnosis of Asperger's, of autism at some level, Here's what we know. Scientifically, we know there is a significant correlation between neurodiversity and gender nonconformity, either in expressions or identity. So, for example, in the Dutch clinic, there is a much higher incidence of kids who did have an ASD diagnosis who enter the gender clinic than in the general Dutch population. It is absolutely true in my office. So, it is a reality. And the big problem around when it's gender and something else is so many people, doctors, parents, teachers, will say, well, it's just a symptom of the neurodiversity. You know, there's obsessions, and, this, and there's just like an obsession now with gender, and it is a phase, it's a passing obsession, so we need not take it seriously. We need to take it very seriously. It is most likely a core part of the person, and one that may not present in the way it would present in somebody who does not have the experience of being neurodiverse, uh, but neurotypical. And here's, here's an example. One of the qualities of being neurodiverse is A, you may not read social cues, and or you may be impervious to social policing, okay? So you go to the beat of your own drum. So I've had several young people who have said, I'm transgender, and I say, well, how will that make you different? Not in any way whatsoever. So the notion of how you do your gender may be very idiosyncratic, but that does not negate the core gender identity, as for example, of being trans. So 
I may not want to take any medications. I may not want even to change my wardrobe. I may want to just change my, change my name and my pronoun. But this is where the meaning of gender is so critical to explore. And I will give you an example of what you have to sort out. Yes, gender for any child can be a solution to another set of problems. So there have been a number of youth I've worked with who have been diagnosed as neurodiverse who have come up with solutions. So for example, one 10th um, grader came to me urgently, wanting to transition from male to female, had no, so no signs before of any gender nonconformity, but was desperate to make friends. And at the school this youth attended, girls made friends better than boys. Ergo, if I become a girl, I'll have friends, so make me a girl so I can have friends. So we worked on friendships. And that, that seemed to really help, and the gender urgency went down. So we do have to sort, it, it can be complicated, but it's complicated for any child. We're doing the same thing for any child. But I do want to say, I get many calls saying, I have a child who's coming in saying they're gender, um, they're transgender, but you know, they have, they're on the spectrum, autism spectrum, so I'm going to discount it. Do not discount it. Do not is very, very authentic in the majority of the cases. We have some theories about it. It may have to do with intrauterine environment. It may have to do with the same part of the brain that's affecting both in terms of brain messages. And I do want to say about that, some people think there's a boy brain and a girl brain. There isn't. All of our brains are mosaics. However, we're talking about messages from the brain about our gender when we say, Gender is between our ears, not between our legs. We're not talking about boy brains and girl brains. We're talking about messages about what gender we are, and it's very important to separate that out as well. So uh, a very strong message that, you've been, that people have been talking about this morning is listening to the child and letting them tell us. So I'm just wondering if there are recommendations for pre-verbal children. So between the ages of one and two, suggestions of how to approach the the topics that we're talking about today. Okay, so the question is, what about the kids between one and two who are just developing language, or may not even have it yet? Um, they're very action-oriented. So, um, and in, in that, at that time, this is where mirroring is really important and listening to actions. So let me give you an example. I have a colleague who's transgender, and there is a video of him as a toddler so he uh, was assigned female at birth. There is a video of him as a toddler tearing barrettes out of then her hair and throwing them on the ground and sobbing. That's a gender message. And when it happens not just once or twice or three times, that's a gender message. Sometimes kids between the age of one and two with beginning language will say, I boy, when you say girl. Those two words, I boy. That's not a pre-verbal, but an er early verbal message. It's, and sometimes there is an urge, the tendency to say, well, honey, no, you're a girl because little girls have vaginas and you have a vagina, so you're a girl. And then when they get a little older, you hear them say, did you not listen to me? I said, I am a boy with a vagina. Okay, but they can't say that between one and two. But they can show you about what they want to play with, and if they feel uncomfortable about how you are responding to them and their gender, if you're misgendering them. So you look for those kinds of actions, like tearing a skirt off. There was one, I think this was in the Barbara Walters special, where this child wore the um, little onesies with snap-ups in between the legs, and at age one would unsnap them to make a dress and have the dress flow. This was a child who was assigned male. That's a, that's a communication, a pre-verbal communication about gender. And the message back should not be ne to negate any of those expressions, but to go with them and see where they go. So that's my sense about the one to two year old. And children will know as early as the beginning of the second year of life. They probably know before, but they're really pre-pre-verbal. But you can always be a Monday morning quarterback and go back and see things that gave you some indication. I hope that's helpful in terms of the one to two-year-olds. And we have, I think, time for one more question. 
Uh, yes, I have a question over here. Where are you? Right, right here. Keep looking over I'm this like, side. There you are. Yeah, hi. <laughs> My question is about the per, uh, pervasive influence of social media on the whole of gender expression and gender issues that uh, in social media that our youth are dealing with every, almost every moment of every day. Okay, so the question is about social media, and I would like to quote Char uh, Charles Dickens, this is the best of world times, this is the worst of times. Uh, social media has been a godsend for trans uh, transgender, gender nonconforming youth, particularly in isolated areas where they can connect with other people and don't feel like they're all alone in this and collect information and learn and get language about who they are, one. On the other hand, social media can be condemning vitriolic against transgender people. And that is incredibly harmful, including, unfortunately, we do have some incidents followed by suicides, particularly in terms of uh, what I will call social media battering uh, of transgender youth when um, it goes viral. So what we want to do is preserve the good, get rid of the bad and really celebrate social media as a tremendous boom, while at the same time re doing everything we can to keep the harmful parts out and recognize that as, and to legislate against any uh, bullying harassment that happens through social media. And I'll add one last thing. There's one problem with social media. I do think it's, it's really opened up a lot. When I said the cultural component of fruit salads, Social media is part of that. I have many kids who come to me, and they, um, they come because they want the letter. You know, they want hormones often. And they will come, and they will say exactly what they, uh, they'll, they'll tell me, here's who I am, and here's what I want. And I'll listen, I'll thought, you know, I've heard this before. I know I've heard this before. I've read it before. They pulled it off the internet. They memorized the script, and they're giving the script. So it's not, they're not telling me their story, they're telling me a story. So my job is to find out whether it's also their story. But, so I would say, you may hear that kind of scripting, don't dismiss it, but don't stop with it either. But go below it to find out what it means for that particular youth. So on that note, I think I will stop and say, Oh, I'm, I'm supposed to remind you all, if you have questions, either from Joel's presentation or mine, the basket is here, so just drop them in the basket, so we'll make sure that we have them later. And thank you. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Thank you very much. If you can hear my voice right now, clap once. Okay, Joel taught me this trick. All right. If you can hear my voice now, clap twice. Thank you. And if you can hear my voice now, clap three times. Okay. So just a reminder, questions in the question basket, panel discussion at the end of the day will include uh, our presenters as well as um, other local family folks and uh, now I'd just like to uh, go ahead and reboot Joel Baum. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, again, welcome back. What an amazing day. Diane Aronsaft, everyone, right? I mean, amazing. <laughs> Diane happens to be on our organization's board, so I'm a little, uh, you know, not, not all objective, but I don't think that has anything to do with how great it is. So, Diane, thank you for that. So what I want to do next is talk a little bit about this idea of gender-inclusive schools. And as you heard Diane talk about, there are so many different factors that go into the affirmation of a young person's gender. Um, at the Child and Adolescent Gender Center, we, we often talk about our families and young people being like on a table, right? Imagine them just sitting on a table. And most tables have four legs, and if one of those legs doesn't work, of course, the table tips over and the kids fall off. Our legs happen to be medical, legal, mental health, and education. And we know that education is one of the places that so much 
plays out when it comes to gender. And so we're going to take the next hour or so just to talk about what schools can do to create spaces that honor the gender diversity of young people. Again, just to remind you about Gender Spectrum's mission, and, and now I'm going to talk a little bit more about it because not only does our mission um, inform the work we do at schools, but the way we try to achieve that mission is very much uh, part and parcel with how schools often need to approach this work. So this notion of creating gender inclusive environments for all young people is at the heart of our work. Um, we do that in a number of ways. We provide a lot of direct support to families and caregivers. Uh, we're part of what we like to call the gender discourse. We're trying to participate if, and, and, and be thought leaders in the, the ways that we're thinking about gender for, for all children and youth and their caregivers. Um, we also hold a conference every summer, and I want to encourage many of you to, to consider attending. It's an incredible weekend, um, one of the most uh, exhilarating weekends that, that you'll attend. It's just amazing. There's a full-day professionals uh, symposium that has some 30 or 40 different workshops across all different fields. Um, then on Saturday and Sunday, the 9th and 10th, there's a family uh, gathering that many professionals also come to. In many ways, Friday's all about the head, and Saturday and Sunday's all about the heart. And you meet these families. There's programming for kids literally from the age of zero to through high school. There's uh, programming for parents, there's support groups, there's a gender uh, documents clinic. It's a pretty amazing gathering. Um, so please, consider attending and, and or volunteering, because uh, like this event, it doesn't happen without an amazing team of volunteers. But the core of our work is really education and training. Work focused on supporting institutions around gender, and young people. That's institutions really of every kind that does work with those, those groups. But schools is sort of our sweet spot, if you will. Um, over the last 10 years or so, we've been able to work in schools of every shape and size, um, all over the country and even beyond. Uh, and over that time, we've learned some really amazing lessons from schools doing incredible work. We've refined our own approaches and are now working in a way that is entirely focused on building capacity in schools to own this work, because this work is super contextual. And as we do our work, there's really three important ideas that we ask people to know about us. One, we believe in the importance of meeting people where they are. Um, as we've talked about now quite a bit, we're all over the map when it comes to our own experiences with gender. And it would be very easy for, and I've unfortunately seen organizations similar to ours, come in with a somewhat judgmental stance for individuals who don't get it, um, that aren't you know, down with, with the, the work. Um, and I just don't have a lot of patience for that, quite frankly, um, because I, I, I believe that most people are where they're at, and, and, and certainly when it comes to schools, care deeply about children and youth, want kids to be happy and successful, um, but sometimes don't have all the information to do it. And so we really try this idea. A friend of mine once said, you know, it's okay not to know. But once you know, you can't not know. Uh, and then you gotta decide what you're gonna do about it. And as an educator myself, we're in the not knowing business, right? That's great, not knowing is awesome. Um, learning is great. Someone approached me at the break and said, you know, I'm a doctor and we, we birth babies and we got to call them something. Are we doing something wrong if we call them a boy or a girl? It's like, let, like, like uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, just chill out. Just let things be what they are. Of course you're going to call that baby something, but be prepared to be wrong. That's all. Being wrong is awesome because you learn things. Um, I'm an NPR nerd and, and Neil deGrasse Tyson happened to be on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me and they did this whole series of questions about something completely silly and he got two of them wrong and the host was like, oh, I'm really embarrassed, but you're wrong and I don't want to tell you wrong. He goes, don't worry, no, it's great. I learned two things today, right? Being wrong is okay. Just be prepared to be wrong when you make those judgments. The second thing is that we really acknowledge intersectionality. So as we th think about gender as a concept, we're talking very specifically. Um, However, when we think about real kids or real communities, real schools, we have to zoom all the way out and think about the entire constellation of identities that are at play there. Religion, race, socioeconomics, region, uh, linguistic patterns, 
you know, ethnic uh, uh, background and a million and other, a million and one other contextual aspects that both are informed by and influenced by the gender of the people in them and also significantly inform the gender uh, of the young people themselves. Um, the other thing I wanted to share before I, I share this last, last uh, principle, my background, is, as you heard from, from Josh earlier, is as an educator. I was a middle school science teacher for a number of years. Uh, some friends of mine said that I was demoted to some administrative positions. Um, you know, the dark side. I, I was a site leader for, for many more years, um, moved into some district leadership, did some school reform work, and I share that background for a couple reasons. One, I am proud of my career as an educator. Um, I think being an educator is awesome. Um, and I also like to share that because when I worked at sites, quite frankly, I hated it when people like me showed up. Um, uh, I felt like they had never done my job, you know, but were more than happy to tell me my business. Um, we all went to school after all, so we're all experts, right? Well, we've all been to the doctor too, um, but I would not want me prescribing medicine to any of you, right? Um, and so that notion of having worked in schools for us is really important because we hope we're credible. We hope when we're talking about the, the work in schools, it's not coming from this sort of ivory tower of this is what you should do even though I've never actually done your job, right? I've never had to decide if that kid really needs to go to the bathroom or are they just bored, right? And I have to decide, right? I've never had to call a parent and talk to them about their child's behavior. The other thing, though, about my background is, is a very quick story. Um, my very first day as an educator, like many, was as a student teacher. And I'd been assigned to Chipman Middle School in Alameda, California. And my master teacher was a woman named Jane Vartanian. Now, Jane had been teaching for years. Um, she actually described herself as being older than dirt. That's how she liked to talk about herself. And um, she actually retired the year that I was her student teacher. I don't think they were connected. I really don't. I think she had planned to retire all along, and I actually was lucky enough to get her job. So I was, you know, it was great. But, but I remember I come in. It's August when professional development's going on, and I've just finished my degree in zoology. I have eighth grade science. Oh, Jane, it's great to meet you. These eighth graders this year, they're gonna the wonders of the universe photosynthesis and the periodic table and the difference between cosmology and cosmetology and why it matters and. And so I'm going on and on, and Jane, she, all, she had these little granny glasses, and she always wore this white lab coat, right? And so she's standing across from the, the chemical table. This is when we weren't being so good about where chemicals were stored. And um, so she's got her hands in her lab coat, and she's looking at me like, oh, look at you, aren't you just cute? Aren't you so cute with all your enthusiasm? Um, and when I finally took a breath, she said something to the effect of, well, you know, Joel, that's all well and good, but here's the deal. Our first job is to send these kids home in one piece every single day. <laughs> and if we can do that, we will teach them some science along the way. I'm, I'm very confident in that. But we're responsible for these kids, right? And I remember like, wait, what? It's not about my lesson plan and me and my, you know, and, and they have, you mean there's things besides eighth grade science? There's English and math and oh yeah, and there's their whole lives. Later on in some dumb graduate course, I learned the phrase protective agent, educator as protective agent. The notion of, as educators, and I consider any adult on a school campus to be an educator, we have a responsibility to take care of the health and well-being of the young people we're privileged to serve. And I take that very seriously. It also informs the work of gender spectrum. Um, and I take that very seriously for a couple reasons. One, I, I have kids myself, and I want them healthy and well-being. Um, but I also, I went to Berkeley, but I am not a kumbaya kind of guy. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, I want people to feel good, but kids learn better when they're safe, when they're seen. And protective agents make sure kids are safe and are seen. And that's the notion that we're trying to work here when it comes to our work in schools. The last thing I want to share with you is that this work focuses on all kids. We've spent a lot of time today talking about transgender youth, gender expansive youth, Priuses, Tauruses, you know, an incredible constellation of individuals who fit that sort of gender expansive uh, uh, label or frame. But the work we're about is actually about every child. 
right? It's not uncommon for us to get a call like this. Hello, gender spectrum. Yeah, I'm the principal at such and such, and I think we got one. <laughs> you know, one of those transgender kids. Can you help us? And our response is always the same, which is, for sure, we would love to collaborate with you to you know, support this young person, but it can't just be about that young person. Because if it is, all you're doing is putting out a fire. You're solving a problem, and you're not actually creating conditions that are going to support that child and every other child. Now, to myself, I'm also saying, and I wish you had a time machine, because it would have been great if you had already talked about gender before this young person crossed your threshold. Because gender, as I've been saying, impacts every student. And what we do when we create gender-inclusive schools is help every child's gender be recognized, affirmed, so that when any kid comes in and their gender is somehow not consistent with what people are expecting, there's suddenly a schema that they can employ to understand that child's gender and support it. So I'm going to start here with actually students and the voices of students um, talking about their own experiences with gender. Um, and I'm hoping our sound person is going to make the volume go up when it's, oh, good, hi, thanks. I didn't see you over there, thanks. Um, and these are just young people talking about gender. And then after we're done with that, we'll talk about schools. Take a look. Let's try that again. But I still think it could happen, like maybe in our lifetime that they wouldn't be called girl things or boy things. They would just be called normal things. I think gender is kind of like a spectrum, and uh, different people are on different levels of the spectrum. So there's male on one end and female on the other end, and not everyone is, you know, a male or a female, everyone's just kind of in between. And that's what kind of makes it beautiful, the fact that we're all just different people and we're all different areas on the spectrum, but it's all just one big rainbow. None of the people I care about, none of my friends, and certainly not him, ne never said or did anything to make me feel like my style of dress was wrong. There was this thing that had been ingrained in me through years of getting teased and years of getting looked at strangely that said that you are not a girl unless you dress like a girl. Unless your clothes all come from the department that says girl, unless your jeans are tight, unless it was, it was insane, and it really hurt. And I'm really happy I managed to get through it and be more okay with when I feel like dressing more masculine and when I feel like dressing more feminine. But it was very scary, and I even started to feel, am I even supposed to be a girl? Maybe I'm supposed to be a guy, because everyone's saying that if you dress like this, you're a guy, you're gay, you're... I don't know, it was, it was very frightening. I'm glad to see people who are willing to come here and tell people that that's not who I am. That None of us have to be identified by the way we dress in anything other, it doesn't mean anything except that's the way we dress. Um, gender means to me now something completely different since um, I've had my daughter. Um, before growing up it was always male or female. Uh, to me now, you know, it's not just black or white, there is that little gray area, which uh, to me is more of a rainbow. And uh, she has taught me so much that I, I really just don't believe that gender should be labeled anymore. Um, it's almost just an expression, a personal expression. What do you think? I think gender is a happy thing. Oh, gender is a happy thing. I agree with that. Gender is um, a broad spectrum. Um, I think society likes to tell us that it's one, that you're a boy or you're a girl. And, and I think it's a broad spectrum, and I think everybody has different, varying degrees of both or neither or everything. And I think, you know, you can, and you can be a boy, and you can like feminine things. I think there's so many aspects to it that it's a lot more complicated than a lot of people say it is. Yeah. Well, if another kid was teasing someone else for being like, they're a girl, well, if they're a boy, and the boy says he's a girl, and somebody tease him for that. What if I, well, when I was younger, what I would do is just leave it alone. But now that if we talked about it, I would go up and like, I would talk to the other person that's talking about the person that's being bullied or something. And I'll tell them like, there's nothing wrong with doing that because people are who they are and they're who they think they are. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
Messenger is something that, you know, society's put out there, so like everybody should follow. So it's like, you were born this way, and you have to play with this stuff. And you were born this way, and you have to act like this and play with this. And I don't feel like it's relevant anymore in this world. <laughs> I don't know. We've got so many people, there's seven billion people, why should people fit into two different categories? That's boring. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so uh, what I love about those clips is, is a couple things. One, they really do demonstrate kids are thinking about this. You know, we sometimes get told kids are too young to be talking about this. It's like they're talking about it, right? We might as well contribute to the conversation because they're already talking about it. And as we've heard very clearly this morning, kids know what the deal is with gender and how they're supposed to be performing it. I would argue schools not only need to uh, or should be, they must help control, and, and not control, but help facilitate that dialogue um, because they have a lot to say about how kids are going to feel about their gender. The other thing, though, is they, those clips demonstrate what happens when schools create opportunities for kids to talk about gender, when they create the conditions in which young people are able to articulate their own experiences. We sometimes just need to get out of the way and listen to them, and they will do a lot of our work. When we talk about gender-inclusive schools, I love one of the things Diane mentioned earlier about kids and being invisible. Um, there's a great quote I want to start with about gender-inclusive schools um, and what they do uh, that borrows from that. When someone with the authority of a teacher describes the world and you are not in it, there is a moment of psychic disequilibrium, as if you looked into a mirror and saw nothing. Adrian Rich. That quote of children and students looking into the mirror of their schools and not seeing themselves is what gender-inclusive schools are all about. Gender-inclusive schools are schools in which students see their experiences reflected in the day-to-day -day operations of the school. Now, does that mean they're talking about gender all the time? No. Does that mean they're talking about it some of the time? Yeah, probably. But what it means is it says we recognize there are lots more experiences out there than maybe any other place recognizes. And when you're here on this campus, in our hands, we got you. We've got you. And you're going to be OK, and we're going to make sure you're OK. Um, it's really, really important for these schools to be thinking about how they're doing that. Now, raise your hand if you are, raise your hand if you're a classroom teacher in here, OK? Raise your hand if you work on a school site in some way, OK? I want, yeah, right on, absolutely. I want to, um, you know, when I do trainings at schools, one of the questions I love to ask is, who's looking for more to teach, right? Yeah, not a lot of hands going up on that one, right? We know that it can't be something where it's like this, this kind of one-off, that gender has to be integrated. And this model that I mentioned earlier um, is based on some underlying assumptions of what schools are communicating. They communicate that all kids are being act, uh, impacted by gender, but that gender expansive kids are particularly impacted as well. They recognize that focusing on gender is actually climate work, that it's creating conditions for learning for every child. And they recognize that gender can be a wonderful on-ramp to work related to other forms of difference. Just last week, I was at a, a wonderful conference in, in Dallas uh, called Time to Thrive, and there were several people who, who approached us and were talking about how their work in gender had allowed them to start having some incredible conversations about race and about learning styles, and that it was the ability for kids to sort of dip their toe in the water around gender issues that now has them feeling more comfortable raising, well, here's my experience with race, and here's what I need you to know about my experience. And these schools do certain things. They recognize that gender does impact all kids, and they begin to work and interrupt binary notions. These schools also do a great job of normalizing gender diversity while honoring the gender of everyone. They question limited portrayals of gender. They support processes of reflection about gender and a whole lot more. And finally, they teach empathy and respect as part of their their work. Really what we know for, of, of the schools we've worked with, how they do it really looks different. But if they do it is never in question. Gender inclusive schools ask how, not if.
Now, I wanted to share with you just a couple of resources before I really get into this, but one is uh, we've got on our website something called our Gender Inclusive Schools Toolkit, and much of the, the work related to that uh, uh, and, and the Gender 101 and many of the tools that we're going to talk about are in there, and I just want to let you know that is a resource available. And I also wanted to share um, a document called Schools in Transition that was released last fall that um, we were able to co-author with some amazing organizations um, that really is a very good hands-on guide that focuses specifically on supporting transgender students in K-12 settings. And those are just some really wonderful resources I encourage you to take a look at. But as I mentioned, we have this model of the entry points. And when schools want to do gender inclusive work, it's like, okay, go do it. What? Like, how am I supposed to do that? Where do I begin? What, well, what we found is this structure of, of thinking about these different ways in which to begin the work is helpful because, of course, every setting is really different. Now, we've already talked about what the personal entry point is, that whole notion of understanding what gender is. And regardless of what other work we're going to do, we always start at the personal. You know, hear all the time, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty good, you know, we've got a lot of a gay staff members, so, you know, I don't think we need to do the basics in gender. I'm like, no, you just revealed, actually, you kind of do, actually. <laughs> um, and, you know, oh, we're down, we got it, we're down. I'm like, you're so down, it might be nice to look up every once in a while, just to say. But we believe, like, just humor us. Let's just assume not everyone is as wise as you are and that we need to establish a common language. And so that's where we begin. Um, and we've seen what that looks like, you know, similar to the, the, the work we did this morning, is building that understanding about the dimensions of gender. And then we also encourage schools to do something called My Gender Journey, which allows educators to really reflect on their own experiences with gender. How have they experienced gender, and what are the ways in which it is showing up in their work as educators or in their role at school? So that's kind of the, the personal entry point. The second entry point is structural. Structural entry points, as it says, are loud and clear without a sound. Sound. These are the things schools do which communicate to the community, we get it. We see it all, and when your kid comes to this school, regardless of their gender, they will be seen here. It takes a lot of different forms. Um, this is a, a document called a gender inclusiveness assessment which actually looks at all sorts of different aspects of a school. And on this page right here, I don't know if this little thing's gonna work. Oh yeah, there it is. Um, you see a lot of these structural elements. And it's a way for a school to self-assess. How are we doing in some of these areas? Do I even know? Are these things in place? And if so, um, do we all understand that they're in place? So it's a great starting point. But some of the um, structural things are things like policies, right? Policies are important. Policies matter. Having expectations about gender really, really matter when they come from the upper level. They are necessary, but they are not sufficient. Policies often suffer from an implementation gap. We have great ideas about what should happen, and then we leave educators high and dry with no idea or support for how to do it. Right? So policies matter. But there's other structural things as well. Things like visual signs. Signs like this that say to the world, we see it, oh, all genders, well, you mean both, don't you, Mr. Baum? Oh, no, actually, gender is super complicated, and there's lots of ways to do it, and they're all welcome here in my classroom, right? Signs that say to people, we see, or images that say to people, we see diversity in all its forms, and look at these different aspects of gender, and, you know, visuals that point out in a classroom, these all speak for themselves. They say something about a school's commitment. Um, Things like this, which is from San Francisco Unified, which is a space in which students can actually list their preferred name and gender marker. So that when a substitute teacher comes and reads the name of the kid, they don't read the legal name, they read the right name, the correct name, right? How many of you are familiar with the sport of curling? You know, curling is that sport in the Olympics where they throw the curling stone down the ice and then they're, the sweepers are sweeping, right, and trying to keep the ice clean. Often schools are playing curling with the lives of trans kids because they're trying to identify every place that they might get outed. Well, this is one way that you just take that off the table because kids get outed by student information systems all the time. This is a structural approach towards making sure that doesn't happen. Okay? Registration forms that are uh, all the school-based ones that offer, again, more opportunities for a student and a family to name that student's gender and gender experience. And I really, very quickly, I want to share 
kind of three stories I've heard recently that relate to this. Because basically, you, these are experienced one of three ways. First person comes in, it's like, okay, child's preferred name, it's uh, Johnny. Uh, legal name's Jonathan. Decline to state, whatever. Uh, child's gender, decline to state again, what's that? Uh, male, uh-huh. Um, preferred pronoun, yeah, he. And uh, hey, listen, um, as I turn my form in, What's this all about? I've never seen this before. Oh, well, you see, at uh, Joel Baum Middle School, we are really trying to honor the gender diversity of all of our students. Thank you for asking, and we'll take your form. Next person, uh, Tommy. Yeah, Thomas. Decline to stay. Male. Uh, yeah, uh, preferred pronoun? What? They? He. What the heck is going on? Like, why are you asking me these questions? I don't. Oh, well, you see here at Joel Baum Middle School, we're really committed to honoring the gender diversity of all of our students. Sounds like you know which boxes to check. We'll go ahead and just take your form, and uh, thank you very much. For the third family, though, who this actually is like, oh, I've got some different answers. You cannot know the impact that has on those families to tell them that, you mean, I don't have to explain it this time? I can maybe even relax, and I don't have to educate the educators who are supposed to educate my kid? That's a huge burden that's lifted, and for every one of those instances, your institution communicates, we see it. We got it. We know there's a lot more to this gender thing than meets the eye. Many of these are very simple things, low-hanging fruit, that schools can do to convey that. The third entry point is the interpersonal entry point. These are the ways in which we interact with one another, the way we use language. The question earlier about what do I say to my three-year-old you know, to, to help that child understand about the diversity of gender and you know having language at the ready so that you're able to again convey this notion of gender diversity um, these interactions do all sorts of things to demonstrate the school's commitment in our interactions and communications um, and some of them are there i wanted to tell a very quick story and and, and really em emphasize the importance of kind of demonstrate walking the talk and doing the work um, a quick story, I was in, in Madison doing a training with two colleagues, and uh, they're both women, Kim and, and Joanna, and uh, it was pouring rain. And so I got in the back seat of the car, and Kim's driving, Joanna's in the front seat, and uh, the, the windshield wipers start, don't work, like, so they're not working properly, and so Kim jumps out and starts futzing around with it, and she's clearly not going to be able to make it work, and overdraws this good Midwestern soul to help out. And so here I am in the back seat, oh, jeez. This guy, like, what does he think about me? Like, I'm the guy. I'm supposed to be out there doing the windshield wiper and, the, and then kind of stepping outside my body. I don't know anything about windshield wipers. I am not going to be able to contribute anything. And yet, here I am in Madison, Wisconsin, to talk about gender diversity, saying I should be out there because I'm the guy, right? And being able to convey those kinds of stories, like, this is where I'm at. Work in progress is a powerful way to convey that. Uh, again, we have a few tools, such as uh, using gender-inclusive language with kids. I just wanted to share some of these. But helping uh, schools and, and educators to be ready to respond to the different questions. We've been lucky enough to work with all these schools and have heard teachers say, well, this is what I say. This is how I respond to that question or comment. And Well, we've collected them. Being able to talk about easy steps on the way to gender-inclusiveness. Again, simple things you can do. One of the most classic examples of gendering in schools is lining kids up by boy and girl. I want boys here, I want girls here. Now, problematic for so many reasons. God forbid you actually have a child who feels like both. Where are they supposed to go? Um, let alone your transgender kid who really does want to go into the other line but isn't going to be allowed to. Now they're feeling miserable. And again, you've emphasized the whole idea of it's one or the other. There are so many different ways to get kids into groups. You don't need to use gender. I love this cartoon. <laughs> Where are you supposed to line up if you self-identify as awesome? Um, but again, there's so many different ways, odd, odd and even birthdays, uh, do you prefer the mountains or the desert, you know, ice cream or, or cake, I mean, there's just a million and one ways to create groups that don't say penis or vulva, which is really what we're trying to say when we do the boy-girl thing. Um, again, one of the things we need to be prepared to do is respond to questions that come up from our communities. 
about gender and why we're teaching about it. And again, my, my background as an educator, I don't ever want to put, put a, a leader or a teacher in place of saying, because we're supposed to and you better just get over it, right? Like that doesn't help respond to someone who's raising a concern, right? Whether, wherever they are in this, we need to be very much aware of honoring that idea of where people are. This is new territory for a lot of people. They do have questions. And because they don't know, they are often gonna operate based on what they've heard out there. And so as educators, we need to be able to respond clearly, but respectfully, you know? Yeah, this is new territory, and I understand this might be, you know, something you're not necessarily comfortable with. I know certainly for many of my colleagues, we're learning on that too, but let me give you some information. And so these, again, from schools all over the country are ways that they've answered some of these common questions and concerns, including, you know, you're talking about sex. Well, actually, no, we're not. So let me help you understand what we are doing, okay? And lastly, instruction, all right? Teaching about gender is also really, really powerful. But it can't all happen only as these one-off lessons. Now, I'm gonna share that there are certain lessons that you can do, but before you start teaching anything, look at your institution and talk about what are the concepts we want kids to learn as they move through our institution. And then what are the opportunities to do that? So that by the time they leave fifth grade or middle school or high school, they have a degree of gender literacy that has been thought through, that has been created. And so these have been some of the, the general concepts that we've, we've seen schools using to kind of map their work. And, and again, these are all available in the back, uh, the Gender Inclusive Schools Toolkit. I don't expect you to, to write these all down because you can get them there. But what they demonstrate is a commitment to being integrated and coherent rather than just random, okay? Now, there are specific lessons that do make sense, you know, in a history class, talking about gender and culture, um, using some of the, the footage even that I shared this morning or, or other aspects of gender and culture. Um, in advisory and social emotional curriculums, giving students opportunities to think about their own gender and map it in a way. Um, playing with scenarios and different opportunities for kids to talk about how would you respond in these different situations are all instructional opportunities. There's wonderful visuals out there films and, and books that share stories about gender that can be great direct ways to do instruction. As I mentioned, there's a lot of great visual opportunities, a growing body of films and other resources that bring the topic to your classroom. But again, not everyone has time to do separate lessons on gender. They're powerful and we encourage you to look for those opportunities, but you can also integrate gender into instruction. This happens to be some, some pictures of a, a unit that a school did in, uh, I think, first grade, kindergarten or first grade, um, on the structure of a story. It's one of those English standards. You have to understand there's plot and there's setting and there's characters and so on. And they were working on this activity related to that, and they chose to use the book 10,000 Dresses, which has a character named Bailey, and they were meeting the standard but integrating the content of gender. 57 students are in the gym, 26 of them are boys, 29 of them are girls, and two of them are identified as non-binary. What is the percentage of boys, girls, non-binary? If there are 250 students with the same ratio of genders, how many of each would be there be? Right, again, what? What do you mean non-binary? Oh yeah, you know, a lot of people feel like boys and girls, some don't, some people don't feel like either one, they're called non-binary, but please get started on the problem because you're gonna run out of time, right? <laughs> And there's a, there's a lot of different ways that you can bring the concept in, and it's just not a one-off, and it's not, you know, a throwaway, but it's like, yeah, oh yeah, right? You, you guys knew that there's non-binary people. Oh, you didn't? Well, let me give you a quick little nugget, and now I'm going to go on. Um, this happens to be an activity that w uh, we developed for art classes, profiles and gender, you know, doing biographies of all these different artists. A lot of art classes have you doing biographies of artists. Why not include some of those? And this happens to be um, from Peralta Elementary School, which is a school that you're going to see in a minute, and you've already met a couple of their kids, um, that did some work with us over a period of time, starting with some professional development, did a little bit of, of consultation, coaching with them, and over uh, uh, the course of just a, a few weeks, we developed this curriculum map for work that was happening at Peralta in each of the different grades. It's hard to read that. But another example of this integration is um, what I like to call the, uh, 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 the silkworm unit. The silkworm unit 
is a unit that many teachers do where you grow silkworms. And then you, they, build, they, they create the cocoons and you unspool them and that's how silk is created and isn't that cool? And okay, we grew silkworms, it's biology, it's social studies, it's you know, concepts of culture, it's textiles. So what do you silk for? You make textiles. Oh, let's talk about textiles and clothing and all the different ways clothing is worn by different people in different cultures, by men and women in different cultures. That you, right Now you're talking about gender in this integrated way. Um, so anyway, so Peralta has done quite a bit of work, and then they also did some work with us um, related to creating gender-inclusive schools. And what I'm going to share with you next is a short documentary that is brand new. It's only been seen one other public place called Creating Gender-Inclusive Schools. And everything I've just said is going to be sort of demonstrated in the work they did, and then we'll have a, a good 15 or so minutes to just ask questions and, and check in. So I think George is going to help us get the film started. With that, up uh, oh, one more. I messed you up. There you uh, one more. There you go. I have a friend who's in kindergarten, he, and he wears dresses. He's a very nice little boy. And I was at first shocked to see that he wore dresses, because there wasn't many boys like that. When I was little, like, I didn't wear dresses, because I thought they were stupid and ugly. I was on a soccer team. And some boys said only boys can play soccer because boys are better at sports than girls. I still like dresses a little bit in elementary school, um, in kindergarten. So sometimes I got made fun of. So that's why I stopped wearing dresses. Some people think, oh, boys should only do this, and girls should only do that, or girls should think this, and boys should think that. It's not true. Some people have opinions of their own. The diversity of our student population expanded, so the issues of safety that we work so hard to maintain here now include students with um, gender fluid or transgender um, identities. I thought, oh my gosh, all of a sudden we are having all these transgender kids here. Is this a fad? When I saw the curriculum about gender at first, I thought it was a little rough. I was like, ooh, ah, ooh, I can't do this. Gender, unfortunately, is an area where there's sometimes not as much kindness and respect as we might like. Therefore, Parents presented us cases of real suffering that the child and family had gone through and the staff and I immediately decided that we need more information on how to better support this child, the family, and all of our children. It's really important for us to include everybody in this community work because everybody influences the lives of our children. You can't just work with one population because if everyone's not learning the language and working together, they undercut each other. What you have to do is think about your own issues. Think about what it brings up for you. Think about what you want for your children in the classroom. Think about what kind of world you want it to be. We started by talking about um, the biology of gender and this idea about typically female bodies and typically male bodies, and that's what the binary system is based on. But in fact, that there's a whole range of naturally occurring variations, sometimes called intersex conditions, that represent the physical part. Gender is about also gender expression and the ways in which people perform gender, if you will, our dress, our clothing, our mannerisms, accessories, um, also many of the expectations that other people have of us based on our gender or that we might have of other people. You know, I'm in my 60s. I was used to thinking of gender as a biological thing, and I wasn't really aware of the different elements. She's a girl, and she identifies as a boy, but she looks just like a boy. And she doesn't get upset, which I, I had problems with identifying. And she loves boy things. She dresses like a boy, but she's 
happy as can be. Mm -hmm. And she told her parents, and they're the ones having the problem, but right. she's just fine with it. This binary model we talk about is something we all come by quite honestly in this mm -hmm. culture. Um, and when you add other kinds of lenses, the families we grew up in and the communities we grew up in, our own religious affiliations and spiritual past, I don't want you to be too hard on yourself around that. And I really want to appreciate um, your willingness to be like, yeah, I, wa I want to think more about that. But I do find the universal experience of meeting the kids is like, okay, now I get it. Finally, the last aspect of gender is this notion of gender identity. Gender identity refers to the internal sense, who someone knows themselves to be. And while a lot of people will think of themselves as a boy or a girl, there's also individuals who will say, you know what, I kind of move between the two, or maybe even I don't even think about myself as gendered. I think of myself as just a person. I don't really look at gender. Staff development for all teachers is important around this issue, I think. This is not something you can just give a piece of paper to a teacher and say, okay, read this and you'll be all, you know, read this book and you'll be all together. You connect with the tie too. Right. Elliot, which ones do you connect with? Any others? This is our, this is Aria. This, Kobe want to be a girl. What I want to do now is I want to sort some of these colors. So, if I give you a marker, I want you to look at that color of marker and think to yourself, is this a boy color? Yes. Or is this a girl color? Or could this be both? And what I mean by that is, could both boys and girls like this color? What do you think? Do you think only girls can like pink? Only boys? Or do you I think like both pink. people? It was interesting because the kids, like, some of them seemed to be really thinking about it. Like when a girl got a light pink color. And, so, and there were like friends around her who were like, both, both. And then there were other friends around her who were like, girl, girl. And so I think at that moment, um, I asked. Raise your hand if you like pink. Look around the circle. And based on that evidence of who liked pink, she chose. And so there were lots of girls and lots of boys raising their hand. And so she put it in bold. All the colors are in the middle in bold. Does that mean there are colors just for boys? No. Does that mean there are colors just for girls? No. Or are colors just colors? Colors is colors. Colors are just colors. My sister cut her hair short and she dyed it and she wears a lot of bow ties. And when I was out, my friend, who was kind of mean sometimes, said, ooh, you're wearing a bow tie, and you got your hair dyed, and it's short. And that, I think, hurt her feelings. Did you say anything to your friend? I said, that is wrong. Don't judge my sister like that. That's called stereotyping. One stereotype is boys don't play hairdresser. Ari told me that. Only girls like dolls. Those are, this is a stereotype. Is this necessarily true? No. If you have real short hair, it doesn't mean you're a boy. My grandma, she has short hair about to here. Girls can wear all colors, so can boys. I'm wearing my sister's stuff. This is my sister's. She wears this every day. I like doing things that boys like doing, like climbing trees and making paper airplanes, flying hel toy helicopters and things like that. My other girly girlfriends aren't very girly anymore, but they're not yet boy girls. They're like in the middle. Now, sometimes we see people, we look at them and think we know about them because of the way they look, their gender, the group they're in, or the language they speak. All right, today I'm going to read you a story about someone who was stereotyped. Are you ready to listen? Yes. Okay, click on your listening ears. Whenever I read the books, the children were very quiet. Usually they're very loud or they interrupt, they want to ask questions. But I think this was new for them, too. 
Oliver Button got a nice black shiny pair of tap shoes and he practiced and he practiced. But the boys, especially the older ones in the schoolyard, teased Oliver Button. What are those shiny shoes, sissy? Why couldn't he do dancing? Because he was a boy. Boys, you can't dance? I can. Yeah, raise your hand if you're a boy and you can dance. You don't necessarily have to tap dance. Boys, can you dance? Do a little dance for me right now. A couple of you stand up. Girls, can you dance with them? Stand up, everybody can dance. Do a little quick dance, a kind of dance. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think it had never occurred to him that you could look at the world this way, that you could take off these labels and try and look at it from a neutral perspective. You know, at the end of the day, there's three things we hope people will leave from these trainings. Gender is not just about bodies. Gender is not binary, and gender is not about sexual orientation. The parent training really helped me feel like I wasn't alone, because there are so many of us who didn't quite fit into the rigid box. I noticed that you never said feminine or masculine, and I'm guessing that you intentionally avoided those words, and I'm wondering why. What we start to call feminine and masculine becomes very, very constricting. We make feminine become a set of rules that become really, really constraining for folks who might see things differently. My son, 75-ish percent of the people that we come into contact with that don't know him or are meeting him for the first time don't recognize his biology. And so he's asked me on many occasions, or it's a regular thing, Daddy, please correct. Being able to, again, have the space of this helped me to reflect on my experience and come back to what we were talking about earlier around how do we support our children. So where does the bullying come from? If we're all born as an inclusive species, what is that point? So we let me help? clarify, that's a great question. Kids are in this binary system like fish are in water. I mean, it is just, they don't even know it's there. So unless we intentionally interrupt it and say, wait, wait, whoa, 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 we can't make these assumptions about kids, then they're gonna operate that way, and that's where a lot of the bullying comes from, is the power stuff, in the who's the right way, who's the wrong way. But as soon as you give them a little bit of information, they're like, oh, okay, I got it. And it's really important that we understand all of us have parts of behavior that might be identified as boy or parts of behavior that might be identified as girl, and it, it doesn't have to be that rigid. We'd been discussing a lot of the gender issues in class. I told the kids that they'd be breaking into their groups and actually just talking amongst themselves. And to be honest, I didn't know what to expect from that. Well, it turns out that they couldn't stop. I like to wear sneakers, jeans, and I don't like yeah. dolls. I hate the color pink. I like the color blue, and I play soccer. Blue is not a boy color. No. Pink is not a girl color. Aaron's wearing jeans. Lots of girls like to wear jeans. Some boys like to wear skirts. And they were all talking about sort of personal experiences and experiences that they had in their family in terms of gender issues. And so I found myself not, not being in the position of really having to lead anything. If anything, I got from them, this is the powerful thing for me as a teacher, that how much they teach us, how, they, how much they teach me personally. I always wanted to like be a ballerina, so my mom signed me up into these like little classes. Then as you get older, you like to you know like both things, like you like boy things and girl things. Yeah, maybe you just like boy things. Right? Except sometimes when you get even older, like in high school or middle school, then you tend to like tend more girl like things. Like if you're they really taught me that they are further ahead on the consciousness arc, if you will, than I was at that age certainly. And I mean, you know, and then it just keeps me up to date with things. And really the overarching thing for me in the class, and the reason I love this is because I think it's important that, you know, to get away from all that bullying stuff. I mean, I'd say nine-tenths of it would disappear if we deal with each other's differences in a different way. One of the things we talked about yesterday was about the boxes that confine us. I've always been pretty passionate about talking about things like stereotypes and empowering all people. But this um, 
framework really helped me to take the conversation to another level. We've labeled Camille with all these labels just because of her gender, right? It says here um, that she is too weak to stand up for herself. Are you too weak to stand up for yourself? No. No. <laughs> Definitely not. But see, we put that label on her, and we don't get to see who she really is, right? So. If you tease somebody about what they wear or what they look like, um, you won't have as many friends. You won't um, be that much happier in life if you tease somebody about that kind of stuff. Rasan would have a hard time um, playing, playing soccer or doing other things that he likes to do with that box on his head. And the labels that we put on people make it hard for them to be who they are. It makes it so that we can't see how fabulous they really are. And it also makes it hard for them to live their lives the way they want to live them. My closet was literally pink. And now I look at my closet, and it's almost all blues, blacks, and browns. I thought that it was different. Like, you should dress like a girl if you're a girl. But I don't think that anymore. Like, a lot of even parents think that way because that's what their parents taught them. If there was no such thing as boy thing and girl thing, then probably half of my friends would be wearing dresses. Over the years, like, my, well, my favorite color's been purple, and I told my dad, I was like, I want some purple skinny jeans. He was like, are you crazy? I put the jeans on. I was kind of afraid of what people were gonna say about them. But I just went with it, and then it kind of actually, like, once I started, like, wearing them, it kind of felt normal. I wear what I want to wear. It doesn't matter what gender you are. It matters what kind of person you are. Like, you're a boy, and you act like a girl. It doesn't matter. You're a good person, and that's what matters. Maybe the president can make a law. Like, you can't make fun of boys that like to wear dresses or girls that like the color color green and girls who like love monster trucks we remember that gender is not binary right, right. right. what is when what does binary mean uh it means that there aren't just two types of genders like there's like there are variants of boy and girl. It's like, there's a spectrum. Good, it's very good. Yeah. Lots of places in between where you can fall, right? So today we're gonna to be looking at gender in 3D, meaning gender isn't just about our bodies, but it is about, it's three-dimensional. We've got uh, our, the biology of gender, or our assigned gender when we're born. We've got our gender identity and our gender expression. You know, you could fall anywhere on the spectrum. You could be a boy, Biologically, you could express like a boy, but feel like a girl. It didn't surprise me, but I just never thought of it in those terms of those three different elements. Yeah, put your name next to it if you want to. Doing this work is critical because it not only um, creates safe space for those, in, those students who may be particularly gender diverse, but really for any child who is simply trying to figure out what it means to be a boy or a girl or maybe something different, um, as they go to school. Does anybody want to come up and talk about where they fall on the gender spectrum? I was born as a girl. Um, I usually express myself in the middle. Not usually at school. I'm more like over here, but other places I'm in the middle. And then on the inside, I feel in the middle. It is so important to build a culture of inclusivity for all children, but most importantly for gender non-conforming children, because they're facing in all parts of their world. And we know very clearly that children can't learn if they don't feel safe and seen. We're teaching kids that there are people of differences in the world, and we should respect them and love them and treat them kindly, and that's it. Because if they won't, don't put labels, then everyone can be free. They don't have to worry about what their gender is and how they can't do this and how they can't do that. There's no complete boundary to stop you by your gender. 
it's okay to be what you want to be instead of just listening to other people. As a result of this work, I think my students feel happier and that they have permission to be who they are. It makes me really sad to think that they're in most places in our country that, I mean, people commit suicide because they don't feel comfortable being who they are. I would say to other parents, don't be afraid of this. Go ahead and take the plunge and start learning about this. You'd be surprised at how open-minded parents are and even more so how welcoming children are to learning about this. And I think that it's gonna create a safer environment for everybody. And that's ultimately what we're looking for for our children and our families. You see kids of all different races, all different backgrounds, all different classes, all the diversity that we can see embracing each other, loving each other, having a great time. And that's the kind of community that we want to foster and model, not only for here in Peralta, but for the world. So that is, thank you, that's something we're super proud of and Peralta's an amazing school. Um, but what I think it really does a great job of is showing what it can look like to do this work. Now, Peralta also um, is a very sort of in the middle of Oakland. It's just kind of a basic, typical public school. It is incredibly high performing. They didn't stop teaching math or spelling. They did all that and actually taught students. What it demonstrates is that with a little bit of intentionality, we can create schools like Peralta, schools that are willing to say it's about kindness and respect. We're not trying to change people's values and beliefs and make you, you know, tell your, the way you were raised was wrong, but what we are here to say is that in our schools, every child should feel seen and should be treated respectfully. And that's what Peralta has been working on. So um, that's the framework, that's the work that, that we've been doing. The only thing that's a little different than the film is we really, for the most part, are not coming in and doing parent education anymore and, and even to some extent um, staff training, but instead are working to build the capacity internally so that we're doing more of a trainer of trainer model where uh, schools will then have their own people in place so they don't need some joker like me showing up. They, they are their own leaders of this work. So, so with that, we have about 10, well, almost 15 minutes, and we'd like to open it up to any questions or comments that you might have. Um, so uh, as educators, how do we support students uh, whose parents are ignoring their child's right to gender identity or expression? Yeah, this question comes up a lot. How do we you know, deal with a situation where we have a young person asserting their authentic selves and their parents aren't on board. And, and there's a very important word I always like to add to that question, which is yet. So often, schools will have a child and because it's certain conditions at the school, that child might feel safest at school saying, actually, here's what's going on for me. Or you might observe it or, or in some other way come to understand that. And they may very well say, and please don't say anything to my parents. They will never be okay. And what we talk about is, is a couple things. One is, um, particularly depending on the age of the school, but almost always affirming the child's gender is the appropriate thing to do at school. It is the law in California that we actually have to provide programs, facilities, and activities based on gender identity. But the fact of the matter is, those parents are often not there yet because of fear. A friend of mine once said that, you know, sometimes rejection is a failed attempt at protection. Rejection is a failed attempt at protection. And, and what he was saying was, these parents are very scared about what might happen to their children based on their own upbringing, based on the data that we have. And what we try to work with schools to work with families is to make informed decisions. Again, you know, Diane's presentation, there were some critiques about the, the, the mission of the gender center to create trans kids. That, that's, excuse me, but well, that's not true. Um, what our mission is, is to make informed decisions or to help families and caregivers and institutions make informed decisions. And so when there's a, a, a child at a school and the parents aren't there, first of all, you're not going to be telling the parents something they don't know. 
what you can do is say, listen, I want to talk to you about some things we're seeing here at school, and I just want to check in and see kind of where you're at. Not like, what's your problem? Why aren't you supporting your kid? You're a bad parent, right? That's probably not going to win friends and influence anyone. But to say, you know, I'm noticing some things at school, and, you know, your child has shared some information with us, and, and we want to talk to you about how we can work together to support them because I care about, and I know you care about, your child's health and well-being. So what are your thoughts about your child's gender? Oh, it's terrible, and, you know, we're not going to say, like, okay, well, you know, I don't know if you have any information about gender, if you've learned anything, but I have some great resources, and along the way I'm going to, depending, again, on the age of the kid and the interaction, I'm going to share, you know, it sounds like you're really afraid for your child, you want to keep them safe, I want to help you also understand that the rejection of your child's gender also impacts their health and well-being. And what we often find kids and families thinking about is, I'm worried what will happen if we support that kid without acknowledging the known, which is that kid's miserable now. Right? So we know the kid's miserable. Supporting them, it might not work out. It actually probably will, but it might not work, but we know where we're at. And so let's talk about what it might look like. The other thing is, you know, here at school, we have a commitment to gender diversity and equity. And so I understand what you do at home is what you're going to do at home. But here at school, these are the values that we operate by, um, that we believe we're beholden to both ethically and legally. And therefore, um, I hope you can understand that we're going to work with and honor your child's request to support them as they know themselves here at our school. And again, that means, are you a teacher yourself? Okay, so I mean, that means if you are a teacher, you better not be hung out to dry by your administrator goes, she said, what? Oh, no, 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 don't worry, we'll make sure, you know, you, that's where the system has to be in place saying, oh, no, we affirm the gender of our young people because it makes them safer and it helps them learn better and it's a commitment we have. Jill, just a quick add-on. Do you have any tricky lines for private schools that aren't beholden to the laws? Yeah, so your know, private schools <clears throat> present an interesting conundrum because on the one hand, they are not held to ed code standards. So they can say, you know, whatever, we're not going to do that. And in some cases, you know, they're not. By the same token, private schools have a lot more flexibility in a lot of ways. And so what we, again, will try to appeal to a school is like, gee, I was looking at your website, and it says that, you know, such and such day school, or whatever, um, honors the diversity and individuality of all of our students and support each one to become their full selves and amazingness. And like, oh, okay, well, I heard you saying that, so how does that relate to gender? How does that relate to a kid who comes here and asserts their, their true selves here? Now, what they'll often say is, and what the fear is, and, and, and uh, I've been on a private school's board, and I know the fear is like, if we support these kids and do this work, there's going to be some kids, some families who leave. They're not going to be okay with that. I'm like, yeah, you're probably right. You, you are probably right. I would ask if they're a good fit in your community anyway to begin with, but, you know, but, well, they bring money. Okay, I get it. Let me tell you a quick story. You know, the Girl Scouts in Colorado had a big controversy where they were supporting a transgender girl, and there was a uh, uh, you know, blowback where there's this huge campaign by a, uh, an organization to try to boycott Girl Scout cookies because this, they were supporting this transgender girl. And they were scared to death. Gr cookies are the number one thing that supports Girl Scouts financially. They really are. And they were scared to death. That year they had their biggest sale ever. More people bought cookies than ever before, specifically because of that kid. There were people buying hundreds of boxes and saying, oh, I can't eat them, I don't eat them, I have diabetes, I'm not supposed to eat them, but please give them away. Give them away. Um, so my point is, yeah, you might have some people who leave you, you're also gonna have a whole bunch who say, thank you, I'm proud of you. And if you're not ready for that, then again, then it sounds like this isn't the work you should be doing, but at least own it. Hi, uh, following up on the last teacher's comment about the inclusivity kids from different races, social groups. Um, do you have any thoughts or observations about relationship in any direction between systems that are wanting to address this issue and systems that are also wanting to explore issues of race, ability, class, neurodiversity? 
So I think I understand the question. Um, I'm going to answer it like I understand it. Um, no. So there's two ways. I thought what you were going to ask first was like, what about schools where like the school really wants to do the work and they're concerned like, hey, we have a very diverse community who not everyone is necessarily in agreement about all this gender diversity stuff and we want to be respectful of values and beliefs and religion and all that stuff. So let me answer that first because I know if you're not asking it, someone else is wondering. And our response to that is, and I started to allude to it, is this isn't about changing your values and beliefs. There is one, well actually two values we wish to impose with this work. Kindness and respect. You teach whatever you want at home, but here at school, every child will be treated with kindness and respect. If you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. You, may, you don't have to march in the transgender parade. You don't need to donate to gender spectrum. Please do, but you don't have to. Um, but what you can't do is be mean. Your child cannot be mean to other kids based on their gender. Now, the rejoinder we often get is, yeah, but what about my child? You're making my child not feel safe by talking about all this crazy gender stuff. And I'm like, so first of all, I'm extremely concerned if your child feels unsafe. Does your child feel unsafe? Oh yeah, because you're doing all this gender stuff. The kid hasn't said anything, by the way, but the parents, oh yeah, my kid's unsafe. Really, well, tell me how, what is someone doing? Because of course, being unsafe happens when someone does something and you know, what is making them unsafe? Well, you're just letting, you know, talking about all this gender stuff. It's like, and, and that's making them feel, feel unsafe. How exactly, like what are they scared of? Well, they're not, I mean, it's just uncomfortable. Oh, so you're uncomfortable. Uncomfortable and not safe, very different things. We live in a democracy. We're uncomfortable all the time. Quite honestly, as an educator, I love discomfort. It's called cognitive dissonance, and I want my students to be a little less comfortable. We're all a little less comfortable. I take that seriously, but simply the, because this other kid exists, that's not making your child unsafe. However, your child's behavior does make that child unsafe, or attitudes such as makes that child unsafe. So we'll work with your child's comfort level, and we can come up with all sorts of alternatives, but it's not going to be on the back of that kid. Now, in terms of the second version of your question, that, that is what you're probably really asking, um, was, you know, how do you integrate this with other kinds of systemic efforts of school reform? And I would, again, argue, because gender is such a universal experience, I don't know anyone over the age of three years old, who cannot tell you pretty clearly a time that they were either limited by notions of gender that were imposed on them or held up to some expectation because of notions of gender. It is a universal experience in some ways that's very different than race or religion or language or socioeconomics that allows us to start that conversation about you know, critical thinking, non-binary thinking, things can be both, complexity. And it's those conversations which often can lead to those, those more tricky conversations in some of those areas. Um, so, I mean, again, I think it's, it's also a great place when we're talking about elementary schools, because people are like, well, I don't want you talking about sex with my child. Oh, well, good, because I don't want to talk about sex either. I'm sure, no thanks, but we want to talk about gender. That's different, right? We're not doing sex ed. We're talking about inclusion and diversity. Um, and, and again, that's the entry point. I don't know if that gets at what you were asking, but in terms of other systems, um, those are some of the entry points. The other thing is, quite frankly, if it, depending on the context, if there is a really discriminatory situation in place, and depending on the state, you know, at a certain point we'll say, so listen, superintendent so-and-so, principal such-and-such, I assume you like your house, right? I mean, you probably want to keep your house because the law actually can hold you liable for this. Now that is never an effective approach to start from. You must do this so you don't get sued, but that doesn't mean you don't pull that out if you need to. It's like, so let me just make it, you know, let me make another argument here. You can't afford not to do this work because here are the lawsuits, here are the court findings, and we are moving inexorably in that direction, South Dakota notwithstanding. Um, we are going to get to a place where the uh, respect for gender and gender diversity will be a uh, We'll be looking at it. I mean, what side of history do you want to be standing on? In a few years, we're going to be looking at a lot of this stuff about gender and go, what the heck were we doing? Maybe one last one? Yes, hi. Um, so I'm a student at UC Santa Cruz here, and I was curious about implementing these on college campuses, particularly because, you know, like right now I'm in a genetics class, and we learn male, female, like Drosophila and mm -hmm. fruit flies. and. Um, I, it was funny because I've, I've studied with a transgender student peer and I've studied with a very cisgendered, like non, 
non-gender expansive thinking person and like I remember I was like oh yeah we can all study together and then this other um, girl she's just like is that a boy or a girl and I'm like that's Kaz like that's not relevant you know and I just can't imagine you know as we're all about to go have our own children and I see some of my peers who are going to be that parent who are going to have so I just I'm trying to imagine this getting implemented on college campuses and how to work with a, a more complex student professor and student administration relationship. Yeah, great question. I mean, I will say, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, good old Drosophila melanogaster, I think it's called. Yeah. Um, so a couple thoughts come to mind. So, and this was a question, this is not about getting rid of gender. I, you know, will sometimes say is like a teacher will come up and say, listen, I'm, I, I'm really sorry, but the other day I said boys and girls. Am I a terrible teacher? Am I a gender bigot? It's like, well, thank you for empowering me to judge you. It's like, okay, you're fine. Um, but this isn't about saying, never say boys and girls, you can't talk about XX and XY chromosomes and the traits that those lead to. It's just don't only talk about that. It's don't always talk about that. You know, again, that Neil deGrasse Tyson, just chill out. Like, we can be where we are. We just have to be careful that we're not always saying boys and girls, only male, female, only one or the other, and instead saying sometimes but not always, frequently but not always, right? You may think that, but they don't, right? Just giving them this permission for there to be this lack of, to get out of the all or nothing thinking that so often informs these conversations. In many ways, it brings me right to where I was at the beginning of the day. It's not about who's right and who's wrong. It's about how do we need to be with each other right now in order to have an exchange as human beings and learn or uh, you know, be friends or be neighbors or be colleagues or roommates or whatever. Um, and that we just need to get out of that absolutist thinking. Because quite honestly, I feel like as someone who you know, does this work and works with a lot of colleagues, they're often as difficult to work with in some ways as people I'm really fighting to really get this, right? It's like, come on, create some space for other people to be where they are. Um, and at the same time, don't, don't compromise. It doesn't mean you don't, you don't give up your values, but you can do it in ways that are not absolute on that side either. I don't know if that helps, but I think, and then the other thing is, work with your student governments on the college campuses, work with your LGBT centers because they are doing fabulous things. Um, my friend just applied for college for their, or their kid applied, really my friend applied, but anyway. Um, <laughs> And they were talking about like all these forms they had to fill out for dorms and stuff. And so many of them are now talking about, do you want to live in a gender neutral dorm? And what's your preferred pronoun? And there's options that are showing up in ways that really do you know, begin to, to belie the, the binary notions and demonstrate this growing understanding. So, so um, for more information, please. Um, be in touch. We do work with schools all over the country and are excited to work with yours and consult and provide any kind of resources. We're very much about co-constructing our work with you. Um, we do not have a one and done, one size fits all drive-by professional development model. Um, it's very much about what are you trying to accomplish. Let's imagine together what it could look like. So thank you very much for the chance to be here today. We're going to take a break, and we're going to be starting a little bit before 2. So please don't make George yell at you to get you all back. A couple minutes before 2, please be in your seats ready to go. Thanks. Okay. We have our own local hero here, and I want to say right from the get-go that uh, today's conference would not have occurred um, without the help, support, and coordination of Dr. Jennifer Hastings. We are blessed here in Santa Cruz to have such a powerful woman. Jennifer Hastings, MD, majored in women's studies at Princeton University and was an art teacher and painter before medical school at UCSF and is grateful for varied life experiences before medicine. As assistant clinical professor at UCSF Department of Family and Community Medicine, Jen is a family practice physician who started and is director of the transgender health program. Okay. I, I lost my place. 
Jen is a family practice physician who started and is director of the transgender health care program at Planned Parenthood Marmonte Santa Cruz and has been actively involved in supporting transgender health care services for youth and adults around the country. Jen works closely with the Santa Cruz Transgender Therapist Team and is involved in the integration of behavioral health and primary care for safety net clinics. And with mindfulness and medicine, Jen is a member of the Medical Advisory Board of the UCSF Center for Excellence for Transgender Health and intimately involved with medical conference programming for gender spectrum. Jen works to increase medical access, understanding about gender journey. Jen Hastings. Okay, so I have, I have instructions on the microphone. How is this? Where are you? Yeah, good, okay. So thanks so much. It is truly wonderful to have everybody here in one room. It's ex extraordinary. Thank you all for taking the time out of your very busy lives to learn about something that I think is extraordinarily important. And I just wanna thank the people that I've worked with for years here in this community and the incredible patients that I've had the honor to work with. Really, every single person I've worked with, probably in, not just in transgender healthcare, but I think the stories that I've been privileged to hear, and really to be on this journey with people exploring, exploring gender and exploring so many things. But I think what I'm hoping today is that your hearts have been opened, because I think our hearts are the most important piece of this work. And we can't do our work well if our hearts are closed. So I'm hoping, well, I, you can't help with, with uh, Joel and Diane, but I hope we'll continue that process together with opening our hearts. And just a shout out to Katja Tetzloff, a wonderful graphic artist. They are in Chicago and they've helped me a lot over the years with PowerPoints. So we have a lot to cover. I wanna look at best practices in creating transgender healthy excuse me, transgender friendly, gender affirmative health settings. We wanna look, and we already have today, I think gotten a, a glimpse at the importance of the interdisciplinary aspect of this work. We have to work together. You cannot be in your own little box in your practice, just like maybe you don't wanna be in the box of your gender anymore either. Um, medical treatments, we'll be exploring those, both puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. And then we'll just touch briefly on some of the surgical options that are available because things have really, we have a long way to go still in surgery, but there's a lot there. And not everybody wants surgery. I can't see that at all. What are you saying? Okay, so very quickly, we're gonna review the concepts that you already learned today. So um, we're looking We've already had a deep dive into what sex is, and really that's, you know, what's between the legs. And we've learned that gender is much more than that because there's our gender identity deep inside ourselves. No one can tell. You do not know what my gender identity is at all because I haven't told you. I haven't shared that with you. So that's my internal, deeply sense, deeply felt sense of what I am in terms of gender. And then there's my gender expression, or your gender expression, and how you do your gender in the world. You already saw this slide, and really what I want to do by putting up these last two slides is just to pull you into all the things you've already learned today, because that's an incredibly important foundation. So if someone is looking at this on YouTube and you just clicked on the section, on the medical section, you have to go back and listen to everything else, because I'm really, it's really important to me that these concepts of gender identity, gender expression, sex and sexuality that was explored are already there. And the concept of gender as a spectrum and that many people do not fit into the box, that you already got that because we're gonna move forward from there. Because in order to do gender affirmative care, you need to hold that very deeply. To be respectful of someone's gender identity, the concept of gender spectrum has to be really in, in the forefront and exploring your own gender is critical. So I usually spend a lot of time in my own, if I'm presenting all by myself, but I don't have to do that today. So just reminder that in order to do this work, exploring your own gender is crucial. And that the concept of cultural humility, that you don't know the person in front of you, 
until you deeply engage. And so we have to be culturally humble. The concept of cultural competency is kind of dangerous. I think it's not just in this work, it's in all the work we do. If we make an assumption that we know someone, and that's based on stereotypes, you're not gonna really engage on a deep level. So who is the person in front of you? So there are structural things that Joel, I think, already touched on some important things in the school, but if you're in an office setting or you have a clinic or you, wherever you're working, you wanna make sure that you create a safe and welcoming space. And there are lots of different ways to do that, and we could spend a whole three hours on that, but we won't. Assuming that folks don't trust you is, I think, a good place to start, because people have had terrible experiences, both in, in healthcare settings, with therapists, certainly in the schools. And so creating audiovisuals that involve trans people are incredibly important. And I'll talk more about bathrooms, but I can't say enough. And today we had this experience where we only had a male bathroom and a female bathroom. And so we had to create gender neutral bathrooms so that everyone here felt safe. Inclusive forms, I think Joel talked about that in terms of the schools having names. I have, you know, this work moves very fast. Preferred name and preferred pronoun used to be sort of politically correct, no longer. What pronoun do you use today is, probably, is today the most important thing. And I want to say, if someone is watching this a year from now, or even six months, things have moved. This is a very fast-moving field. The language changes. And so you can't just sort of rest on your laurels having come here today. You have to keep engaging and learning. And train your entire staff. You can't just have the medical providers. Your front office person is probably the most important person. And there's um, something nice from Transgender Law Center, 10 tips for serving transgender patients. That's good. Now this, I think, was already shown, but it just highlights, like, what do you do if you don't fit into one of the bathroom's stalls? That's, it's not, well, but here now, I have a place that I can go where I feel comfortable. And I can't, the bathroom is so important. We all need to pee and sometimes poop. So that's a basic fact. So um, working together is crucial. As I've already said it, Diane said it, I think Joel has referred to it as well. And now the clickers, there we go. And depending on the age, different things might be important in terms of support. Social transition is controversial for some people, but it's really pretty easy. You don't need any medicine for this. A haircut, a name, clothing, pronouns, and then when, as a child gets older and begins experiencing puberty, then that's when you build on what is available and may consider blockers, hormones, or surgery. So the concept that needs vary at different ages is just very important. So I'm saying the same thing that I just did in the previous slide, but saying it again because I think it's so important. Provider education of the school, the family, support, acceptance, incredibly important. And it turns out that doesn't go away. We need that at every age. But once puberty comes, we have something else to consider, and that's puberty blockers. And when you get into later adolescence, then we can consider cross hormones and surgery. So let's look at what the different medical transition options are. So I'm, I'm repeating myself a bit, but the concept of reversible, partially reversible, and irreversible or permanent are very important. So what do you think? Clothing, social transition, hair, is that irreversible? No, that is completely reversible. You just grow your hair and change your clothes. Puberty blockers, it turns out, which are medications that we'll learn about in a few moments that basically put puberty at pause. And we'll learn about them, so don't worry about the Gianna RH agonists yet. Partially reversible would be some parts of cross-sex hormones which include estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. And then irreversible will be some of the effects of hormones and most surgeries are considered irreversible or permanent, although you can have a surgery and then basically have another surgery to undo it, but that it's, for all practical purposes, permanent. So this is another slide really highlighting, highlighting the importance of the collaboration. 
So in order to, for me to do medical treatments or medical interventions, I work very closely with my mental health colleagues. And they work closely with me. And it's really important that everyone who's providing mental health for transgender youth and adults understand about the medical interventions. And it's important that patients and families understand what these interventions do, and we call that informed consent. So people can sign a paper about a puberty blocker or a cross hormone or a surgery. But in my mind, that's not informed consent if you haven't really talked about it. And so it takes time. And I think we also learn more as we go along. So informed consent, when I first started this work 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we didn't really think about fertility options for youth. Now, if you're thinking about a puberty blocker, you want to talk about fertility. But so informed consent really moves as we learn more. OK. Puberty, block, puberty can be difficult, especially if a youth is engaging or is starting a puberty that they were not thinking would, go to, would, would happen. And this is not an unfrequent story that, pu that kids will say, I didn't think I'd get breasts. I didn't think I'd get a period. In their mind, they knew their gender identity so clearly that they really didn't think that puberty that the puberty of their biology would happen. So these physical changes are often traumatizing. There's a lot of self-harm. And there's a very high suicide risk for kids who are not supported during this time. And so that's really the power of the hormone blockers. It can be very helpful for not just the teen, but the family as well. And oftentimes, kids know really, they're really clear. They don't need, they don't need time to think about whether or not they need cross hormones. It's the family that does. Because as we learned from, I think it was Joel's slide about the age between awareness and then the age of telling the family, there's often a big time there. There's often eight years of a kid knowing their gender, but they don't tell their family until puberty is there or it's already uh, happened. So these are the things that we know about with many transgender youth. And this is really the power of puberty blockers. And I want to share, these are two teens. They're um, from Boston at the GEMS Clinic. Um, the young person on the left was assigned male at birth like her twin brother. She got puberty blockers. And they were identical, identical twins. And it's a very powerful image, I think, about what puberty blockers can do. So she did not get the development of an Adam's apple. She did not get the development of facial hair. And we're seeing real safety in puberty blockers. They were year, used for years for what's called precocious puberty, started in the 80s, the mid 80s, this, the awareness of this kind of puberty blocker. And we're not seeing anything untoward in those youth who used the puberty blockers when they had puberty at a very, very early age, like three, four, five. So that's incredible that we have this medical intervention to stop puberty at the time when it's not appropriate. And then when they reach the age when puberty is a, it's when their peers are having puberty, you stop the, cross, the puberty blocker. And um, puberty then just starts where it left off. So it's really very safe. Um, so we have now studies from Holland showing positive effects for these youth. Actually, their general psychological functioning in one of these three studies was um, higher than their peers. And you think about it, well, pu puberty is pretty hard. So they basically were not having to go through puberty, and they were psychologically functioning um, better. Um, all the youth in these three studies went on to, to to have cross-sex hormone treatment, but that's not a given. So this really is truly a time for choice. And we are now in the big, um, Diane didn't mention it, but the um, Gender Center in San Francisco, along with Boston, Chicago, and LA, are engaging in a four-center study of trans youth. And it's very exciting for us to get real data. So we, we've seen the benefits of early support for youth. The bottom one there, the bottom point, allows for selective disclosure. This is a whole other talk, really, about when does a youth share with other peers or other people that they are transgender. Some, for some youth, their identity is not trans. 
they are the gender they are, and so they may not want to share with others. Okay, so what are puberty blockers? I've already shared that they're a pause button on puberty. And I really want to uh, do a shout out to Stephanie Brill. This is really her language, the pause button. Um, it usually involves an injection every several months or a yearly implant. And as I said already, they're safe we, because we know it, it's, we've used a different kind of puberty blockers, um, medroxyprogesterone starting in the 70s and then the kind we're using now since the 80s. Um, so if we stop the puberty blocker, uh, puberty resumes in three to six months, and we typically start them if we have a youth that we're, we're encountering or working with before they've actually started puberty, the time for starting a puberty blocker is something called Tanner II. And you think, well, what's Tanner II? Well, Tanner was just a guy, a doc named Tanner, Dr. Tanner. And he described, he was from England, and he was very interested in puberty and looked at um, boys and girls going through puberty, or I'll say bodies with ovaries and bodies with testicles, and described Tanner I, which is not puberty not starting yet at all, and then Tanner II through five is the gradual progression of, of puberty. If you have a body with testicles, the testicles begin to get slightly larger, and then the uh, penis grows and the testicles grow and hair, and then in the, if you're a body with ovaries, you begin to get breast buds at Tanner II. And the next slide basically shows the Tanner staging as a person with testicles. It would be Tanner II here, which is highlighted. Now, what if someone is already past Tanner II? What if they already are at Tanner IV with fairly enlarged testicles, a large penis, more uh, pubic hair? And at that point, you would also have facial hair probably. So when we first started doing this work, we would say, well, it's too late. You can't start a puberty blocker. But things have, have really changed, and we now give puberty blockers even if someone has already gone through and is in a later stage of puberty. And I'll talk a little bit more about that sort of decision process. If you're a person with ovaries and you're just beginning to get pubic hair and just have the beginning of breast buds, that is Tanner II for a body with ovaries, and that is when you would want to start a puberty blocker if you're aware that this is a child that would need or benefit from this intervention. Now, what about body odor and um, underarm hair? Well, what about that? That is not puberty, that's something called adrenarche, and that's the release of hormones from the adrenal cortex. And so sometimes parents who are watching carefully get really concerned when they begin to see classic signs of what we've typically associated with puberty, right? The underarm hair and, and body odor. So that's not puberty and you would not start your puberty blocker at this point. So I now want to talk a little bit more about the, the physiology of puberty because that really helps us understand how these gonadotropin-releasing hormones work. So that was a mouthful, right? Gonadotropin-releasing hormone. So deep in the brain, we have something called the hypothalamus. And puberty, it turns out, starts when we have the pulsatile, and that's why I have those dotted lines there, release of something called gonadotropin-releasing hormone. Now the word gonad, uh, refers to, and it's a gender neutral term because it includes both ovaries and testicles. So gonadotropin releasing hormone refers to exactly what we're seeing, that you're, you're going to, with a hormone released from the hypothalamus, tell the body for the gonads to get going and start working. But it's, it takes a couple stages because that gonadotropin releasing hormone, which is going beak, 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 it's going off and on, it's not steady, goes to the pituitary. And the pituitary goes, oh my gosh, I can feel pulsatile releases of gonadotropin-releasing hormone. It's time for me to release luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone. So LH and FSH, which are luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone, those are both in bodies with testicles and bodies with ovaries. It's not just bodies with ovaries. They say, okay, I'm going down to the gonads, and, and the gonads are the testicles and the ovaries, and they are going to make, if you have ovaries, estrogen and progesterone, and actually, you actually have testosterone in there as well, 
and if you've got uh, testicles, you make predominantly testosterone. But testosterone and estrogen basically go back and forth between each other. So we all have uh, a little bit of all. But so how do the blockers work then? Okay, so we got the hypothalamus and it's puberty starting and I have that pulsatile release of gonadotropin releasing hormone. Well, if I give a gonadotropin releasing hormone analog, which means structurally similar, or agonist, which means makes more of it. That's, can you see that? That's what that says. The red doesn't show up well, but that says GnRH agonist. Then the pituitary goes, oh my God, there's so much of that stuff, I got to turn off. I can't, do, we can't, this is too much. I have to regulate things. So I'm going to turn off, so I'm not going to make luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, and I'm therefore not going to tell the gonads to make hormones. So it's very elegant. This is extraordinary. I mean, it's beautiful, right? Extraordinary. So that's how the gonadotropin-releasing hormone uh, agonists work. Okay. Oh, there was that last step. Okay. So they come either as an injection, either in the muscle or in the skin, under the skin, or as a pellet there, like a rod. They're very expensive, unfortunately. So the one on the left there is Lupron or Eligard. Those are the brand names. What's interesting is that Lupron is marketed for women with a variety of conditions where they need to turn off the, um, the ovaries. And guess what? That is like 20 times more expensive than Eligard that's marketed for men with prostate cancer. There you see it. It's exactly the same medicine. This is my, like, really? How deep does gender stuff go? Okay. On the right there is um, Histralin, which is either <coughs> Suprolin, which is a brand name for the medicine give for, that's given for precocious puberty. Anyone want to guess how much that costs for one implant? $23,000. And the one on the left, Vantus, is marketed for uh, men with prostate cancer, and I can um, buy it as a provider for $2,300. So that tells you, like, the differences between marketing for men and women. Bodies with ovaries, bodies with testicles, really. But the implant is uh, made to be used f um, for one year, although we found that it lasts really usually for two years. So Funding this is incredibly difficult because historically when gender care was not covered by insurances, there were actually exclusions for gender care. This was extremely difficult and the gender spectrum conferences over the years, you know, we'd have parents in tears because they couldn't afford to buy the implant or to buy the uh, blocker. Well, now with the Affordable Care Act, we finally have access for this care, and it's spectacular. And we're very lucky in the state of California. Many states do, still don't have protection. Uh, we do with our uh, California non-discrimination clause. Um, but I'm still having trouble. I spend hours and hours and hours getting things covered. And we do, we can help each other. The Transgender Law Center and the National Center for Lesbian Rights are very, uh, you know, helpful in this regard. Oops, yeah, okay. So what about the pros and cons of puberty blockers? This is not an easy decision in some cases. It's obvious in some cases as well. And really the important thing is to individualize the decision. There's not one, you know, it's the person in front of you. It's not a protocol. And so I think this slide will really change for me over, you know, shortly, but basically, the pros are that you, you buy time to explore gender identity, and I already referenced the fact that many kids really know it's, they don't need time, but the family does. Um, so we prevent undesired, irreversible changes of puberty, and so if you have, can prevent the development of breasts or um, Adam's apple or facial hair, markers of secondary sex characteristics, or markers that are secondary sex characteristics, this is very powerful, um, can prevent then costly surgery and procedures. Um, we really see improved function in kids, and um, 
then typically we use lower doses of the cross hormones, although I think that's probably not a hugely compelling reason, although for some providers it is. So the cons are really that we don't fully understand the effects on brain development, although in the studies that have been done, that's looking to be a non-issue. When we first started using puberty blockers in this older age group, we were concerned that there would be an issue, and it's really not panning out. There's um, sort of complex issues around height, final height, um, that I think we're still understanding. The effects on bone density are a consideration, and really when you add the cross hormone, then those, those issues appear to go away, although I think we still have to look really, encourage young people to be engaged in physical activity so their bones are getting strong and calcium and other ways to support bone density and bone strength. It's incredibly expensive, and that's you know, in the, in the best of worlds, that would not be a reason to not give this medication. And, but then fertility is an issue that we're now looking at, and I'll st spend a little time at the end, because if you've blocked the development of the gonads, then at this point in time, having your own biological children is less, is really not uh, feasible right now. But there's a lot of, well, I'll, I'll wait for the slides. It's, you know, from the field of uh, pediatric on oncology, we're getting, um, fertility uh, futures um, as a possibility. So what about a kid who's been on a blocker and they're now getting older? What, what happens next? So this is another area of controversy because the studies from Holland started cross hormones at the age of 16 mm. and there was nothing medical about that. 16 is the age of consent. In Holland, kids are adults at the age of 16, and so it was the protocol started by having the kids start the cross hormone, which means estrogen or testosterone, when they turn 16. Well, in this country, do you think waiting till you're 16 is gonna work to, to, to have your puberty? It's kinda late. So, um, okay, sorry, We're, I have to change thoughts here. So, you have an option um, of stopping the puberty blocker and going through your own biological puberty or your, the puberty of your um, gonads. So that's an option. The point is that everyone, but the point of the slide is everyone has to go through puberty at some point. We need, we need hormones, the sex hormones, for our bone density. You can stop the ag uh, agonists and start cross-hormone therapy, so that's an option. And then the one on the right, which is continue the puberty blockers and start cross-hormone therapy at a lower dose, that's another option, and that's the one that I think the, the UCF, Center, UC, UCF Center, Gender Center, is doing primarily. Um, but then it, it's actually incredibly expensive to continue that puberty blocker all the way until, you know, wh so when do you stop? And what we're finding is that kids do very well stopping the blocker and starting the cross-hormone therapy or continuing the blocker for a while and then sort of tapering it off. So, but what about those older teens who never had the puberty blocker? Well, we do have an option for them as well, and that would be, depending on where they are with their family, starting just the hormones or hormones and blockers. So what about cross-sex hormones? What are they? So these are the estrogen and testosterone primarily, also progesterone, where we basically get the secondary sex characteristics of the gender that you are moving towards. And there are good studies showing that um, using cross-hormones has tremendous positive effect psychologically in terms of decreasing gender dysphoria, decreasing anxiety, depression. We've known that for years in adults, and we're seeing that in children as well. I want to really do a shout out to the non-binary transition. So in all of my conversation right now, we're sort of you know, looking at going one direction or another, and it, there are a lot of youth that, and adults that don't want to go into towards the other box. They want to be uh, in a non-binary place. And I just want to shout out to this website uh, by Micah, M-I-C-H-A-H, um, as a great resource for learning more about non-binary transition. So let's look at the hormones. So in the trans female spectrum, 
you need something to feminize, um, but you also need something to decrease the level of testosterone. Testosterone is a stronger hormone, and if you put the two hormones kind of head to head, testosterone will win. So we need something to lower um, the testosterone. So estrogen we use, and there are many forms. An antiandrogen, which is really what will lower that testosterone, and sometimes progesterone. For the trans male spectrum, it's simpler. We just use a prescription or a medication to masculinize, and that would be testosterone. And there, likewise, there are many different forms. And we look to get the uh, physiologic level of the, um, I'll say the words, so the cis man or cis woman, what, the, what is physiologic for, for those individuals. Although I would want to just point out that we, there's not a lot of data and research helping us with sort of what's the ideal level and how do you measure, and it's, it's a more complex issue. So how do I know, or how does a medical provider say, okay, time to start a cross-hormone? So we have guidelines, and I just want to point out they are guidelines, they're not rules, they're not in cement or stone. And this is the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, or WPATH. And basically the guidelines are that someone have persistent gender dysphoria, meaning that they're not comfortable in the gender that they were assigned at birth. They're able to to provide informed consent, and that means that they basically understand how the medication works. And if they're not 18, and this because the age of consent in the U.S. is 18, then they need parental or guardian consent. And so that makes sense. You want to involve the family. If they have concurrent medical or mental health problems, it states that those should be addressed. Now that's complicated sometimes because. As I think Diane pointed out, gender is sometimes the cure. So in order for someone's an severe anxiety and depression to go away, you can't wait for that to go away. You actually need to use the cross hormone to decrease the anxiety and depression. And that's been very problematic, I think, for people who read the uh, guidelines literally or for who aren't deeply um, involved in this work. Because they're like, oh, no, no, you can't start that hormone because they're not uh, stable enough. And so, um, you know, this is exquisite work. To be, you know, so maybe start the hormone very, very, very low level. Just begin. And so oftentimes that's hugely calming for an individual to at least be on the journey, at least be starting the process. So the version 7, I have to, is so much written in 2011 or published in 2011, is so much better than the previous version which had things like real life experience, which was you had to live in the gender before you could get the hormones, which was often unsafe. Um, and it used to be that there was a requirement for three or six months of mental health, but now that's individualized. So there are things that are so much better in this version. So we don't say you need a certain amount of time. Really, it's the relationship between the mental health provider and the individual to determine what's the right amount of time to work together before starting a cross-hormone. And the intent to pursue surgical intervention is completely irrelevant, whereas before there was sort of the assumption that someone was on this path and there was a certain order of things. You know, first you had your therapy, then you did your real life, and then you got your hormones, and then you had your surgery, boom. No, it's not that way for many people. So let's do a little bit of a deeper dive into the hormones. It's slow. So both moving, and I just want to point out that I used the word feminize, and I, there was, Joel's not there right now, but, um, you know, we need other, we need better language, but that's the language we have right now to the move in the direction of getting breasts and hips. Um, but what are the patient's goals? That's probably the most important thing as you're working with um, someone, and, and the goal may not always be achievable, because genetics is, you know, genetics. And so it may not, your mother may have had large breasts, but you may not because you have your own genetics. And this is frustrating and difficult for folks. So I just want to go a little bit in, deeper into what is involved. So there are many different forms of estrogen, but the safer forms in terms of safety, in terms of less likely to cause a blood clot, would be things that are not oral. So that avoids the first pass of the liver and decreases the risk of a blood clot. So using the oral form of estrogen, the safer form under the tongue, 
a patch or a cream or into the muscle. And then in terms of our antiandrogens that lower the testosterone, we most commonly use spironolactone, which is a diuretic, which was used for many, many years. I think in the 1800s it started. And what they discovered with men who use spironolactone to lower blood pressure was that they develop breasts. And so we just discovered this by observing what happened to cis men or bodies with testicles on spironolactone. Finasteride and tetasteride, you probably know for uh, decreasing male pattern bald baldness. They decrease the more potent form of testosterone. They're very useful for trans women or for feminization, but they can cause, sometimes can cause other issues. So we watch, watch that. And then progesterone, which is a sort of its own little um, area, controversial, but I think we're more and more using, uh, adding progesterone. So as I said before, this takes time, but the skin softens. We see less hair growth on the, f on the face and on the body. Muscle mass diminishes, fat redistributes to the hips, and then breast development, which is probably the most significant, and, and typically, as we are a breast-focused culture, oftentimes the most important thing for a, trans, a person on the trans-female spectrum. Um, sexuality, and this is, again, very individual, but typically libido decreases and um, decreased ejaculate and less spontaneous erections and may be harder to get an erection. And for many people, this uh, is very desired and very welcomed. Not universally, and it doesn't happen universally, but um, something to point out. The other thing I want to say about sexuality is that many times um, people's interest in terms of who they're attracted to and want to be sexual with will change with the use of a cross hormone. The testicles get smaller and many people note emotional changes, crying more easily, more sensitive, um, being able to multitask. I mean, I think this is an incredibly fascinating perspective on gender and for, as a feminist, uh, a hard one actually. So the informed consent process, which I referred to earlier, this is the, probably the most important thing that when people start their hormones that they really understand what is permanent and what will stop or go back reverse if they stop their hormone. And the, for a gender um, neutral or non-binary or person on the spectrum, you know, you can use a low dose. Sometimes people take hormones for um, a specific amount of time, six months, two years, and then stop. And then it's a kind of movement of to try to find where I will be most comfortable with my ex external presentation with the use of hormones. So you want to talk about sexuality and fertility for sure and the ability to cause a pregnancy. So even though the ejaculate goes down, there still are sperm. So if you are a trans woman and you still have a penis and you engage with uh, intercourse with a body with a vagina and a uterus and ovaries, there's an ability to cause a pregnancy. And that's really important that people know that. So the risks are really not completely known. We're finally doing more um, evidence-based work. We have more studies happening. And I just want to say that I don't have the analogous slide for masculinizing hormones, but it's a very similar picture, which is the picture is that when we look at the long-term studies from Holland, it's looking, everything is looking very safe in the sense that we're not seeing cancers, we're not seeing premature death due to cardiovascular disease. We're really seeing more um, that, so there's a difference between morbidity and mortality. So morbidity are things that can kind of go wrong, and mortality is actual death. So we don't see increased death, and the things that we see going wrong are more related to lifestyle. So smoking, not exercising, uh, engaging in you know, high-risk sexual behaviors, things that are actually sort of within our control, although as we all know, changing how we do things in our life is like the most difficult thing. So saying to someone, well, we'll just stop smoking. Well, that's easy for you to say. It's hard. So um, the other point that I want to make is this is all off-label. We don't have f uh, FDA approval for any of this. And we do a lot of things in medicine that way. This is not unique to gender care. So that shouldn't frighten anyone. So when we look at the masculinizing hormone, same thing. What are your goals? And testosterone is the only thing we need. 
We usually start with an injection, and that can be under the skin, subcutaneous, or in the muscle. And it was Norm Spax from uh, Boston who really discovered the use of subcutaneous uh, testosterone. We, it was, it's always been used intramuscularly for cis men, and, but he, um, Norm Spax uh, discovered that. Um, it's when, if you put it under the skin, it is metabolized more quickly, and so you have to use a weekly dosing, whereas if it's in the muscle, you have a little more leeway about, about length between your dosing. You can use a gel, cream, or patch, and more and more people are going that way rather than doing self-injection. We always used to think like there was something magical about starting with an injection, but in fact, many people transition beautifully just using a topical. Um, so this is what happens with testosterone. Voice deepens, and that sometimes is the first thing that a person will notice. And even, even on, I'm using lower and lower doses of testosterone now, and uh, men on even just the tiniest amount will say the first or second week they notice uh, the voice lowering. Having no period is often the, a very, very important thing for someone on the transmasculine spectrum. Although, again, there's some people for whom that, that is not the priority. So, so important to figure out what is important for this person, and that will help you direct your um, therapy sometimes. Uh, male pattern bald, uh, sorry, facial hair, body hair often occurs, although, again, for some people really want you know, a full beard, and other people are like, no, 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 I don't want facial hair. And unfortunately, we don't have the power to sort of turn it off or on. It is what it is, and it's really your genetics. Increased muscle mass, it happens. Change of fat, it happens. Enlargement of the clitoris um, can happen to a degree that actually that enlarged clitoris becomes, a f well, is a phallus, and can be used even before surgery for penetrative intercourse. Um, and then the emotional changes that we saw with estrogen, also we see changes with testosterone. And again, I think this is really individual. Um, men will share with me that they have more difficulty accessing their feelings, but if they really pay attention to it, it's almost like a muscle that they have to keep, but they have to work harder at it. Again, very hard for me as a, to see this uh, when I started doing this work. It was painful. Increased libido is, is pretty much, you know, you know, we see that very often, but again, not universally. So informed consent, really important to go over with the person you're working with about these are the things that will not go away even if you stop testosterone. So the, for the, if you're starting testosterone, the thickened vocal cords are what cause the deepening voice. And that even if you, so if, you, if your voice deepens and you stop testosterone, that will never go away. Um, if you develop an Adam's apple, will never go away. And for some people, this is brilliant because they don't want to be on testosterone for the rest of their lives, but they want a deep voice. So they just transition to the point or use testosterone to the point where they're comfor comfortable and then stop. Um, but reversible changes are, include you know, the stopping of your period, the increased libido, and the fat and muscle changes. And so that can be hard for someone who doesn't want to be on testosterone anymore but really w doesn't want their period. So this is a... a you know, a navigation. And likewise, in terms of uh, sexuality, many times people's se uh, sexual interest changes. And ovulation can occur on testosterone. So it's so important to review. If a trans man is having sex with a body with a penis that has sperm, they can get pregnant. And there have been many unintended pregnancies because people weren't aware of that. So I can't highlight that enough about a co it's an important conversation. And then trans men are some, sometimes wanting pregnancy. So I have a number of patients that have stopped their testosterone, they return to regular ovulation and get pregnant and have a completely healthy pregnancy and then resume testosterone after um, they've delivered their baby. And the PAPS matter for trans men is just a shout out. We don't have time today to go into healthcare for trans people, but if you have an organ or a part of your body that needs to be checked regularly, it still needs to be checked whether or not you're on testosterone or not or estrogen. So let me just go look at my time. Okay, we're okay. Um, 
So I can't say this strongly enough. Trans people, gender expansive people may or may not want surgery. That is a very individual decision. It's not a given that someone will want surgery. And in our California Department of Motor Vehicles, we have a box for gender, or we, we have a form for gender change. And there's when it, it'll say male, female, and it'll say complete or transitional. And now the complete, what does that mean? Aren't we all transitioning always for a whole life, wherever, whether we're doing gender care or not, or gender work or not? So there's actually an amazing movement. Where's Vic Campbell? Vic has been working for three years to get the Department of Motor Vehicles to change that so it doesn't say complete or transitional. And there is something you can sign outside. You can sign to, to get involved with this, and we're going to be doing a whole campaign to get rid of those very disrespectful boxes. Okay, so the most common surgery for someone who is masculinizing is chest reconstruction, and that involves taking away the chest tissue or the breasts and creating a male uh, appearing uh, chest. This is now covered in the state of California. If you have Medi-Cal, you can get your top surgery. This was such a huge change. I cannot tell you how my life changed as a provider when the Affordable Care Act included gender care. It's just extraordinary. It's, um, so the most common surgery, if you have a larger breast, it are two incisions, um, kind of smiles, to, to achieve this surgery. Um, those scars really vary. M many trans people are so proud of those scars, and they're beautiful. And others develop um, chest hair, and you can't see them at all. People used to think that you eventually had to have a hysterectomy or a removal of ovaries because the, the testosterone was somehow dangerous for the uterus and dangerous for the ovaries. We really don't have evidence suggesting that. And so we have a lot of uh, websites saying, you know, you have to get your uterus out. If someone is dysphoric, meaning they don't feel good having their uterus, that's a good reason to have it removed. But there, at this point, and this may change if we get different evidence, but the current evidence does not suggest that a hysterectomy is needed. Oophorectomy is the removal of the ovaries. Likewise, they, the ovaries do not have to be removed, and many trans men who want to have future fertility will keep an ovary in order to keep their own eggs. Metoidioplasty is the creation of a full male phallus with testicles using the enlarged clitoris. Whereas phalloplasty is creating a phallus using tissue from other places, often the forearm or the thigh, to create the phallus. I just want to point out that from metoidioplasty, many men enjoy um, having vaginal intercourse, I, but want a metoidioplasty. So you can keep the vagina and the ovaries and the uterus. Typically with phalloplasty, the uterus is removed, but this is we're finding not required. We used to think it was. So we'll move to feminizing surgeries and the same thing, not required. Vaginoplasty is the creation of the vagina using typically uh, the penis to invert. So we invert the penis and that becomes the vagina. You can also create a vagina with colon. These are beautiful surgeries, typical. They're, they're not without... Um, problems in the sense, and I should have said this as well for phalloplasty and metoidoplasty, we're still really at the beginning, I think, of these surgeries in terms of uh, avoiding difficult outcomes or complications. We still have a, a pretty high complication rate. Orchiectomy is the removal of the testicles. Sometimes that's the only surgical intervention a trans woman or a woman on the trans spectrum will want. Panectomy is the removal of the penis. Breast augmentation is enlarging of the breast tissue. Tracheal shave is removing the Adam's apple. And facial reconstruction is surgery to create changes in the forehead or the chin to achieve the facial structure that a woman might want. So this is really important to me that, as, and I've said this already in different ways, that you know, the, the transition path, and I want to, I think Ben, you gave me this slide. Ben Galahofa, thank you. So this is, um, letting a person sort of cut these out and decide what is their path, what comes first, 
what do, how do I want to transition? Do I want to start? Some people, some, many trans men will start with their top surgery before starting hormones. Others not. I want to also do a shout out to Rai Testa's book, The Gender Quest Workbook, which allows people to explore in a workbook fashion what might be the transition related things that they might to do, like to do. So now I do have to move more quickly, but I want to shout out for a website for people who are working with trans youth, um, the Physicians for Reproductive Health, looking, getting a deeper dive into the blockers and cross hormones. So unfortunately, I have to move a little faster here, but I made reference to the fact that we didn't have to, we didn't used to talk about fertility issues for, for trans youth, and now we really have to, because if you go on a puberty blocker, pretty much that means that you won't have your own biological children. Although, as I said, and this is coming from an area where there is money. We, people aren't giving lots of money to help our trans youth have their own children, but people are interested in giving money to kids with cancer who are starting a, a medication that will remove their possibility for having future fertility because of the chemotoxic drugs. So we're going to get, a, we, we will piggyback on this work and be able to use this work to help our trans youth. And there are many ways to make a family. So biological children is really not the end, right? We have adoption, we, have, we share, we do lots of things. That's a whole other talk. So I want to really thank Diane Aronsoft and Joel for their work, because keeping the focus on the kid is really what I think allows us to do the right thing and to support them. So gender is not a choice. I think that we use that from, from other fields. Gender is a spectrum. Acceptance is really key to the health of our kids. And there are medical interventions that can support gender identity. I want to point out the importance of resources. I'm always learning. I'm always reading. I'm diving deep into lots of different things. And I just, for medical providers, the Lion Martin Health Center consult line is hugely helpful. Projecthealth.org trans line is a wonderful, you can call, you basically get a call back within a day or two. The UCSF Center of Excellence for Transgender Health, we're in the, we've been working on revising the protocols now for almost a year. It's, it will, the new ones will come out soon, I promise. These are references that when um, you can spend more time, let me know if you want a copy of the slides and I'm happy to give them to you. The National Center for Transgender Equality and Justice at Every Turn, a landmark study that really pointed out a lot of the things that we now sort of take for granted in terms of decreased access, for example, for health for trans individuals. That really gave us the data that we needed. And we have, with Title X, we created brochures on trans fertility and self-care. This is where I think it's important for you all to go home and start learning, reading, looking at blogs. Blogs have really become the place for us to learn. And there are more TV shows, so I Am Jazz, great place for you to spend a little time. And From Three to Infinity is a wonderful film about uh, out of the binary. Conferences, we already learned about gender spectrum, but they're all over the country, and I really encourage you to go take advantage of the wealth of material that's there. And then our local resources. So there are a few things I neglected to put on this resource thing. So Santa Cruz Trans Online, that will lead you to all the other websites. The Trans Teen Project, there were cards out there. They're a wonderful set of resources. The transparent group, Heidi Kornkowski, who will be on our panel, incredible. So please take advantage of her. PFLAG, there's our programs at uh, Planned Parenthood. California Rural Legal Assistance, fantastic. And then the gender specialist clinical team of the Central Coast. That is the um, trans therapist team that was referred to in the introduction that you couldn't hear. Um, and it was Shane Hill who started that group. And today, and actually, he wrote this thing, 10 things we can do to support our children who are questioning their gender. Please get this. It's at the uh, table for the gender specialist clinical team. And today, we have the great honor of honoring Shane Hill, who has done so much in our community. It's because of him that we are kind of a jewel in really in the United States and in the world in terms of collaboration between mental health providers and um, come on, you guys. 
That's your cue. Okay, guys. My name is Heidi, and I am the mom. Oh, yeah, I'm a little short. Um, You're just right. Okay, just right. I'm the mom of Jordan, who's a 17-year-old trans guy. I am here to honor Shane Hill for all the work he has done in the transgender community. Shane started the Trans Family Support Group about six years ago when he saw the need for the parents of transgender kids to have support amongst other parents so then they, in return, they could support their transgender or questioning kids. Shane continues to support, speak, and give advice to our group. Since Shane started the group, it has served over 120 families and has had two groups grow from it that serve in the Bay Area. As for me personally, I am forever grateful for all the work has Shane, Shane has done with my family and me. For all Shane and I have been through, and all we will continue to go through, I will always call him my friend. Uh, hi, my name is Jordan Korinkowski. I'm the 17-year-old trans guy son of Heidi Korinkowski. Um, I've been a, uh, I've been with Shane for since I was 11, um, and. He's opened my eyes to so many different things in life, and he's just, my whole confidence and self-esteem has just skyrocketed ever since he's been helping me with everything. Um, he's helped me understand my gender and who I am and who I am as a person. And he's helped me become way more confident for who I am. And the family, the trans family support group, he's just been such a big part in our family and having our family be more open and. Uh, me and my mom are closer uh, to each other, and we talk about just our problems, and we can, you know, discuss things. And um, I wouldn't be the the trans guy I am today if it wasn't for Shane. He's a big part of our family, and I hope to have him in my life even more. So. Hi, I'm Daniel Blumrosen. I'm a local marriage and family therapist and a trans guy and a gender therapist. It's my pleasure to honor my friend and colleague, Shane Hill. We've known each other for many, many years, and um, when we thought about all the different areas he's impacted the trans community, we realized we needed a herd of people to, to do that because he's really done so many things for so many people. So. Um, I'm here to thank him on behalf of the Jenner Specialist Clinical Team of the Central Coast, the Santa Cruz Trans Family Support Group, Planned Parenthood Marmonte, Westside Health Center, and the John E. Natterney Calciano Memorial Youth Symposium Advisory Committee. We wish to thank him for and commemorate his extraordinary service with a redwood tree planted in his honor on the Central Coast. May his efforts continue to grow in positive ways for years to come. Please join me in giving Shane a heartfelt thank you and another round of applause. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Leopold, and I'm a county supervisor. And when I walked in here and I saw that uh, Jen Hastings was giving a presentation, I thought, oh my goodness, I have to follow Jen Hastings at an event like this. And then just hearing this powerful testimony uh, before me, I realized that I have a much harder job than what they originally asked me. Uh, 20 years ago, I had the good fortune of being the executive director of the Santa Cruz AIDS Project. And uh, Dr. Shane Hill was hired as part of the AIDS project and was a core member of, uh, of that uh, staff uh, that per, as a single purpose AIDS service provider in Santa Cruz County 
provided incredible resources uh, to the community. So it is great pleasure today that as a county supervisor that I can recognize uh, Shane's work. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure if everybody knows uh, all the history of Shane, and I'll only say the parts that I'm allowed to. There's probably things that I'm not allowed to talk about. Uh, but I, it, Shane has done many things over the year. He, found, he was a founder of the Queer Camp in 2002, which worked to ensure community safety for transgender and queer individuals. Uh, in 2006, uh, he assisted in the founding of what is now known as the Gender Specialist Clinical Team, as you just heard, at the Central Coast, and he's been a facilitator there for the past decade. Um, he was one of the primary authors of the nationally recognized UCSF Children, Child and Adolescent Gender Center Youth Assessment Protocol and created that pamphlet that uh, Jen just talked about, about the 10 things we can do for people supporting gender questioning children and youth. So it's, it's a great pleasure for me to have a proclamation honoring the outstanding contributions of Dr. Shane Hill through his work on behalf of the transgender and queer communities for the past 20 years. And I won't read the whole thing here, but I just want to capture a few of these. Um, whereas Dr. Shane Hill has created a vibrant, inclusive, diverse community of support for transgender and queer individuals and their families. And whereas Dr. Hill uh, has uh, immeasurably increased our community's awareness and appreciation for transgender and queer individuals and their families through the founding of the Trans Family Support Group of Santa Cruz County. And whereas Dr. Hill has unstintingly provided countless hours of consultation, education, and training to professionals and lay people in diverse settings to ensure informed quality care for transgender and queer individuals and their families. And whereas Dr. Hill has done this all with joy, generosity, expertise, and steadfast commitment. Now therefore, I, John Leopold, First District Supervisor of Santa Cruz County, on behalf of the entire Board of Supervisors, hereby thank, honor, and commend Dr. Shane Hill for his two decades of exceptional work on behalf of communities of, the, of Santa Cruz County. Thank you for your work, Shane. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, that's a lot. That's a lot of acknowledgement, you guys. Um, so right now I'm incredibly grateful. I can't believe you guys did this. Okay, so I, I did have a, a little bird told me this was happening about a week ago. So I do have a speech plan that's gonna be about, about 35 minutes long. <laughs> but I'll pare it down to about three minutes. So um, I am just so grateful because this work means so much to me. In my uh, clinical practice, you know, we all have, those of you who are therapists, have num numerous specialty areas, but this specialty area has been the most heart opening that I've, of all of them. I have transformed more as a person in all of my work, and um, I really can't tell you in words how important this means to me, that you are all here today. And I'm so proud of us in Santa Cruz that we have 450 people here learning about trans issues. This is incredible. Yeah. And this work, um, even though it's true that I do truly enjoy it and have a lot of joy, it's not always easy. This is a, still a controversial, edgy area to be involved in. Uh, the gender affirmative model, which Diane uh, has uh, brought to us in such large ways, we've always done that with our team here, and it has not always been very easy. So I'm hoping that um, you here in this room will have a level of commitment after hearing all this information and will help all of us continue this to uh, do what I always say whenever I do a training, which is I'm really hoping that you all will join us in our commitment to make sure that our community is safe for trans people to live their lives without fear. So that is the number one thing I'm hoping that you remember from this and that you, you come along on this journey. Um, and before I leave, I have to acknowledge a few people. So um, first and foremost, I have to acknowledge Dr. Jennifer Hastings, who, um, in fact, you can come over here, Jen, because 
because truly what's happened is that uh, Jen has held the, um, the medical piece and I, for, we're both together for over a decade now, have the medical piece and the mental health piece and we've been this kind of sort of dynamic duo in Santa Cruz for trans issues, <laughs> uh, doing our best to really um, expand the number of medical providers and mental health providers that work with trans people in an appropriate, sensitive, aware way um, in order to educate as many people as possible. So we're continuing to do this and one of the things that my part of this was to do is to create a team of people and so we started off with eight people ten years ago. Ten years ago, by the way, this very month and um, now we have 32 members on our team. So it's very exciting. And so um, I want to acknowledge them. And first of all, I want to acknowledge the four people that have now recently um, joined to be a leadership team for us. And so I'm going to ask all of you guys to stand up, and I want you to stay standing so that everyone in the room gets to see all of you together. So um, I'd like to um, ask these people to stand as our leadership team. So Finn Gratton, wherever you are, Finn, please stand up. Marin Martin, please stand up, Marin Martin. Ben Galhufa, please stand, Ben. And of course, Daniel Blumrosen, who's right here. So let's just have an applause for all of them. So please continue to stand. And I just wanted to just say everyone's name that's on the team. And they may or may not be here, but if you are here, obviously stand up. So Connie Batten, Melissa Bernstein, Sally Blumenthal McGannon, Victoria Campbell, Eileen Cavalier. Jen Cheney, Kathy Citron, Misha Uvaldi, Kathy Famey, Jennifer Hastings, um, Chris Hoagland, I know Chris is here, Beth Hyde, I know you're here, Beth, Cleo Kalohiva, Lane Lease, there's a lot of us, Carmen Martin, Suzanne Nicholas, Kristen Olafson, Anna Paganelli, Andrew Perchin, Marty Riggs, Jan Solon Brotherton, John Seltzer, Sean Smith, Claire Tooth, Lita Valla, Judy Van Mazdam, and our newest member, Colin Dietz. So these are all the gender specialists in our community. Please let's give a hand to these people. Thank you all so very much. It means so much to me. So the next part of our program is a panel. And I'll just move my last slide. So there's my email if you want it. Um, we're really lucky to have uh, Freddie Weinstein from the Dominican Hospital Dignity be our moderator with all those questions you passed in. So he's been studying them and gathering. And Bunny, if you can come up and join us with Joel and Diane and, and uh, Freddie will take it away. And I see more questions here. Oh, excellent. Well, welcome to the home stretch. So I'd like to once again invite back our uh, scheduled speakers, Diane and Jennifer and Joel. And then we have Heidi and, and Jordan, who you met already. And then I'd also like to invite us to the stage uh, Bunny Hoagland. So as questions come up uh, during the panel presentation, please just drop them here at the, uh, the basket. And we'll look to get to them as, as we uh, uh, go through our panel here. Is everybody's mics working? We're good to go. So um, since we've already heard quite a bit from uh, Diane and, and Joel and Jennifer uh, this morning already, I'd like to maybe begin the panel by um, uh, allowing some of our newer members to, um, as much as they're comfortable, share their story um, and uh, sort of thoughts and uh, maybe about today and, and about their own personal experiences and perhaps maybe begin with uh, uh, Heidi. Thank you. Um, 
As I said earlier, I'm, my name is Heidi. I am one of the facilitators for the Trans Family Support Group. Um, my son Jordan is our third child. I, this is my second marriage with my husband Ron, and so I have a child, he has a child, and then we decided we needed another child to bond the family, and we got Jordan. <laughs> um, when Jordan was, I, by the way, when I named Jordan, when I was told I was having a girl, I named Jordan Jordan. I wanted a very strong name for this child. Um, so when um, Jordan was about two, it became very clear to me that Jordan liked boy things. Toy, uh, you know, trucks, you know, um, video games, violence, you know, things like that. <laughs> and um, when he was about between two and four, I noticed that he would rip off the pretty little dresses I'd put on him, um, would go screaming through the house and not leave the house unless he had on his brother's big holy t-shirts. Um, and I just thought he was a tomboy. My husband thought he was a tomboy. We thought, oh, you know, it's a phase. And um, it was driving me nuts, but it, it was a phase. At the time, during this time, I worked for a very large church here in Santa Cruz County. And um, yes, my husband and I, and my entire family, Jordan included, we are Christians. Um, <laughs> and so with that being said, um, we were told by everyone around us, um, it's just face, just face, just face. You make that kid wear a dress, okay? <laughs> if you have a transgender child, a boy, you cannot make them wear a dress, let me just tell you. So at about the age of seven, we were having a lot of problems with Jordan. We took him to a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist, um, at the time, it was called gender identity disorder. It's now not, it's changed. But they diagnosed him with that, and along with about six other diagnoses, ADD, uh, bipolar, mood disorder, depression, anxiety. It was a whole plethora of stuff. So what the psychiatrist told us to do at that time was to focus on everything else, because those are the things, it's kind of like what Jen was talking about. Um, we needed to focus on those. We needed to get the anxiety down. We needed to get the depression down. When in actuality, it was the trans part that was causing a majority of this stuff. So from about the age of 7 to 11, throughout his elementary school years, they were hell for him. He would tell me, God made me a boy. Why did he make a mistake? Where's my penis? And we always said, no, you're a girl. God made you a girl. So how confusing for this child that you know we're his parents, and we're telling him we, that God did not make a mistake and that he's a girl. So I was, you know, getting posters of, real strong women like, you know, the singer Pink, like, oh, this is a real kick-ass girl. You could be like her when he was had a crush on her. So <laughs> it was things like that, you know? So um, Jordan had obviously had been very depressed. At about the age of 11, um, every night, night times were very difficult. It is true that night times are very difficult for our trans kids because they do get quiet and they do get within themselves. And I would always have to lay down with Jordan to try to get him to sleep. It would take about a two to three hour process. And it would be where he would cry, God made a mistake, I hate myself, I don't wanna live. Now for a parent to hear this every single night is devastating. What am I doing wrong? What can I do more? I constantly worried about this child. I was afraid that when I came home, the worst I was gonna find the worst. So at about 11, I laid down with him one night and he said to me, um, instead of the usual, I hate myself, I want to die, it was, he was saying goodbye to me. I'm sorry, this is still hard. He was telling me that he couldn't do this anymore. Once I got him to sleep, I went to my husband and I said, we have to make a choice. We can hospitalize him. We can bury him in six months, or we can allow this kid to transition. Well, that was a no-brainer. We allowed him to transition. Now, because I'm a very organized, type A type of personality, I wanted this transition to go by the books, okay? When we sat down and showed Jordan the Barbara Walters special, he said, oh my God, oh my God, that's me. We said, okay, we're gonna let you transition. Now, I thought I had a good few days to get my organization and 
attack. No, the next day I was getting phone calls from all his friends' parents saying, what's going on? Jordan says he's taking medicine to become a boy. And I'm like, holy shit. Okay, I can do this. So we had to get on re board really fast with it. And, and you know what, I'm so grateful. I, he led the way. This kid, I'm telling you, the strongest individual that I know of. I have learned so much from him. I, I, I cannot tell you. Um, since we transitioned, we've done the hormones, we've done the top surgery. Jordan has just grown into this amazing, amazing human being. Do we still have issues? Yes, he's a 17-year-old boy who drives me nuts, okay? <laughs> and wants his way and thinks my way is old and, you know, old-fashioned. But he's just an amazing kid. Will he always have issues with trans? I don't know. That's something that he's going to, that's his journey. But I am here to support him 100%. And I just want to end real quick. We did leave the church because I realized that um, first and foremost was the support of my child unconditionally. And I just want to say, this is on a personal note here, I am still a Christian. I, this, I still believe in my God. My God loves my child with all his heart. Well, well, thank you very, very much for that. Uh, Jordan, can we hear uh, maybe a little bit about your story and, and uh, if you also had some thoughts about this morning's speakers and presentations that you wanted to share as well? Okay. Um, well, I think when I was younger, I used to tell my mom uh, that I want to be a boy or I wish I was a boy because, again, she would always tell me, no, you're a girl, you're a girl, so it's like, okay, I can't really get through that in telling I am. I'm just going to have to get used to just saying I wish, right? Like, want to be. And then um, I do kind of remember, um, not, I don't remember uh, doing it, but I remember my mom telling me it was Easter, we were supposed to go to church and have a nice like service and so my mom put me in a dress walked in the other room and while she left the room she could hear me screaming literally tearing it off so then i just went to church in like dirty blue jeans and a really big t-shirt um that ain't that was kind of a big signal but um when I first transitioned, I was really self-conscious of who I was. I was really scared of the um, comments I'd get, the type of you know behavior people would have around me, how I'd be treated, like at schools and stuff like that. And over the you know the six-year process of me going on Lupron, uh, having testosterone, having the top surgery. I look back on my 11-year-old self and I say, who is that? Like, how, how have I become such a m much more confident and independent young man? And it's just incredible to have and to look at all the support and all the people around me and to find that I, like, am actually happy for once in my life as who I am. And having, you know, waking up in the morning not thinking of, like, oh, Man, I wish I had, you know, a penis or whatever. I'm waking up and saying, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a good day today. I look good. I'm going to shower. I'm going to do my hair. I'm going to, you know, put some cologne on. And I'm going to go have fun somewhere, you know. I can finally have that confidence in myself and not keep thinking of the negatives. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much. So, Bunny, would you mind sharing a little bit of us with okay. your story? Um, I'm 16, my name is Bunny, and I'm agender. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm a junior in high school. Okay, that's, that's me. Um, so my story isn't that interesting. I mean, <laughs> I, I was always like trans, like I was never a cis boy. That never happened. Sorry, mom. Um, like, I was always, I'm assigned male at birth. Um, I was always very like feminine. I always liked feminine stuff. I wish that that went to my fashion sense because all I wore for like 15 years of my life was gym shorts and gym clothes. Rip, rip, ripped in peace. Anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah, I was just like a feminine boy at the time. But then 
And I would have been non-binary a lot faster, let me tell you, if I knew that existed. Like, all I was told was this stigmatized version of a trans girl is like my only other option. And that it would mean so many bad things to be like a trans woman. And they made it sound disgusting and stigmatized and it's like something you don't want to be, like taboo. And I, of course, know that's not true at all, but like, that's all I thought existed. But then when I was like in eighth grade, freshman year, something along those lines, um, I figured out what non-binary was and I knew automatically that I fell under that term way more than cis. Like, I'm agender, I know that. Like, that's 100%. I've always been agender, I just didn't know that it existed. And so like, that's me. Um, other than that, like my opinions on the um, panel discussions and everything that happened today, um, just things that I want to like clarify as a trans teenager who goes through being trans every day and the things I deal with cis people and how they react to me and what they say to me, just things to tell you guys not to do, etc. One, a really big thing I wanted to cover is that I am mentally ill, I have depression and anxiety, and there's this really big stigma against trans people with mental illnesses, and it's like really disgusting, honestly, because I'm not a demon or a monster, because like a lot of trans people are mentally ill because of the things that cis people put them through, and it's just cis people then think that it's like the trans person's fault, and it's like, no, <laughs> no, sweetie. Um, and just like neurodivergence in being trans, most of the trans people I know are neurodivergent, and they're some of the nicest people I've ever met. Like there's someone I know named Odie, and they're autistic and trans, and they have got to be hands down the nicest person I've ever met. Like, I love them to death. And like all of these people, the things that you, you associate with them just because they're not neurotypical and they're not cis. It's like, it's just weirdly specific. <laughs> and other than that, I don't think it's been completely established today. I mean, it's been alluded to, but I just wanna say flat out, you don't need dysphoria to be trans. You don't need to send gender dysphoria to be trans. And overall, I just want to say that trans people deserve a safe place to live. Thank you. So part of my job is to go through these questions, and it seems everybody wants to know about bathrooms. It was the number one topic. What do we do about bathrooms? How do we share the bathrooms? How do we keep people safe in the bathrooms? Um, I think that was touched upon earlier, but there was a variation on that that I, was, I thought maybe an interesting scenario that perhaps Bunny, Jordan, and Joel can talk about is sort of what about sort of overnight trips, overnight school-sponsored uh, uh, events where there's cabins um, involved and, and they're assigned by, by gender. Um, do either Jordan or Bunny have a personal experience with that? Joel, how do you see how schools have handled that? Um, um, Jordan, looks like you want to go first. Yeah, I went to a Christian camp called Camp Hammer when I was in fourth grade around the time that I was definitely figuring out that, like, at that, that, that was around the time I was, like, 11. And I went to the camp identifying as female and dressing as, in female clothes and put into a, a, a girl's cabin. Only because... I told him he was a girl. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I didn't want to be in the girls' cabin at all, but it, it you know, it, it was what it, it is what it is at that point. Um, but I felt very singled out. I very I felt really weird and awkward talking with the girls. Like they talk about like this boy that they saw at the swimming pool earlier today, and talking about his eyes and his eyelashes. And I'm just there like, can we talk about maybe like video games or, oh, what about that sports game that was on last weekend? You know, like, I, just, I don't really want to talk about that stuff. Um, and it was also kind of hard to find 
guy friends there because they see a girl go up to talk to them and they just automatically think that we're flirting with them. No, it's not like that. No, it's weird. And um, they, they, I stopped really going to, I, I left early because I didn't like it at all, but I went to a camp uh, for trans kids called Camp Aeronutic. And that definitely was an eye-opener because I didn't really think that there were other trans kids out there. I thought there was the only one in the world who was trans and who, you know, had this stuff going on. But when I went there, there were so many kids there that looked and were just normal people. And when I got there, I was greeted by um, this one kid and he said, oh, let's just go, let's go walk around and go talk. And we met up with a bunch of other kids and we, you know, I automatically had best friends at camp, and um, yeah, that's my experience. Yeah, thank you. Bunny, um, did you have any uh, thoughts or experiences yourself? Okay, so for me, bathrooms, I have never liked public bathrooms. I never will. <laughs> They're gross. And so like, <laughs> like, even when I was a cis boy, I just like, which I never was, I don't know. When, when people thought I was a cis boy, I just like didn't even use public bathrooms. They're ghosts. Who wants to go in there? Like I don't have the time or the patience, <laughs> so I just don't really have an experience with them. But like when I do need to use the bathroom, I just use the like girls' bathroom because I'm less likely to be beat up because people see like pink and skirts. And even though it's not my fault that the only cute clothes they make are like girl coded, like that's not my fault. I'm sorry. Anyway, so I'm less likely to be like attacked if I go in a girl's bathroom. So that's that's basically all I have there. Thank you. And Joel, how yeah. how have schools handled that? This is certainly a loaded issue. Um, one of the things that we try to work with schools around is this notion of uh, access to restrooms, locker rooms, and changing areas. And while there's variations with each of those, there's some basic principles that apply. And the first is that there needs to be options for all and restrictions for none. What that means is that we need to make non-stigmatized options available for anyone that needs it. So let me back up a little. What frequently gets said for kids like Jordan or Bunny or someone who identifies as transgender in some way is why can't they just use fill it in? The nurse's restroom, the, the staff restroom, some, some restroom out there for them. Well, if you think about the history of our country, we've had bathrooms for other people for a lot of times. And they didn't work, and they never have, and at the heart of many civil rights battles have been restrooms. For a lot of transgender people, options are not options at all, especially if they're actually not optional. If it's the only choice, you can't call it an option. But there are a lot of reasons why an optional restroom is needed, right? Beyond gender. There could be cultural reasons, modesty reasons, individuals that have assistance with toileting, individuals that are simply shy, individuals that are you know, dealing with gender stuff and want more privacy. We need to create these non-stigmatized options for anyone that needs it. Because then let's go to the other side, which is when we have our uh, amazing youth who happen to be trans using restrooms, when I do these presentations, I'll often have people say, okay, I get all that, but what about bathrooms? Because I mean, really, trans people in bathrooms? Because y you know. And I'm like, no, I don't. What do you mean, you know? Well, you know, I mean, just, I'm like, no, no. Like, remember the movie Philadelphia, Denzel Washington said, I want you to explain it to me like I'm five years old. Tell me what the, scene, the scenarios are that you envision, because you go to apparently way more interesting bathrooms than I've ever been in. <laughs> and they'll play out every one of these scenarios. And, and you can imagine them, and I won't get into all the details, but what they end up talking about are things like, you know, what if the transgender child is gonna, you know, flash their body or make other people uncomfortable with their body? Well, we have rules for that from anybody. Uh, what if they, you know, uh, uh, are feeling, um, you know, other people are gonna make them unsafe? Well, again, we have rules. You need to feel safe in the restroom, and everyone actually has some questions about restrooms. Every single scenario that comes up is about one of three things. It's about what I call CBS. It's about uh, climate, behaviors, and supervision. What it's not about is genitalia. And what ends up actually happening in most scenarios related to restrooms is that some people are just not comfortable with the idea of a transgender person being in there. You know, if 
you're a bigot or whatever your issue is, well, then you need an option. See, options for all and restrictions for none. Because the fact is, it's not about what's in someone's pants. As we talked about earlier, you know, someone going to the restroom, Jordan didn't want to be in the boys' cabin because he wanted to be with all these penis-bearing people and look, I mean, it was it because was he was a dude. And he should be with the other dudes. It wasn't about sex. It wasn't about any of the scenarios that often get played out. So, I, again, I think this is such a difficult topic because it, it lends itself to sound bites. Come on, we can't let girls in the bo or boys in the girls' restroom and then we have all these predatory scenarios when in fact we need to be able to say, hold on, no, help me understand. Have a rational conversation with me about the concerns. And we can go point by point by point. And we have a lot of problems in restrooms, but the genitalia of the people in them isn't it. The only folks that are potentially not safe in those restrooms are our trans and gender expansive youth, no one else. And that's what we have to help people understand. And again, if you don't like it, go use the nurse's restroom. <laughs> So, so, Diane, there are a couple of questions came up around the interface between gender identification and sexual identification and how one might sort of play off the other, whereas gender identification, you know, uh, predates sexual identification and, and thoughts of sort of the interface between the two. So one of the things I will say is typically all of us were in touch with our gender before we were in touch with our sexual identities. However, sexual identities start much, much earlier than the general theories tell us. Because, for example, when you have a three-year-old who is imagining they're going to be the prince, marrying the princess, sexual identity is beginning. It's already beginning way early on, but usually we know our gender first. We can learn, as I talked about with the proto-transgender uh, kids, sometimes you learn about your gender through sexual encounter, and sometimes you learn about your sexual identity through your gender encounter. So I will tell a personal story that may help in terms of answering this. I am the mother of an orange. When my child was between one and two, I would not be able to differentiate yet my child from one of the apples because I had a child who liked all his sister's stuff, but particularly her costume, stole her toys. And I will just say one uh, story. I, I was a feminist mother. I had a daughter first. We wanted to raise our children gender neutral around activities. So when I had worked in the area of daycare, I knew you don't have a doll corner and a truck corner. You, me you mix it all up. You just have toy shelves. Made that for my daughter. <clears throat> very carefully. The trucks gathered dust for almost four years. The week her, her little brother was born, I see her madly rushing from her bedroom to his new room, and she's got things under her shirt. And I said, and I said Rebecca, where are you going? <laughs> what are you doing? Out fell all these trucks and, and boy toys. She said, well, I don't play with them. Maybe he will. So they all ended up in his room. The only thing he ever used any of them for was he turned the dump truck into a cradle for one of his dolls. That was it. <laughs> so he, um, I followed his gender development in the 1970s. Is what, he was a boy in a tutu. And of course, people would always say to us, uh, don't you think you should stop that? Or we're really worried about him. Or I think he's going to be gay. And we would say, look, we don't know who he's going to be, but we're trying to just help him be who he is now. So the end of the story is he grew up to be a gay man. He is one of the proto-gay kids. He was a, an orange. And if you saw him now, you would not recognize him at all as the little boy with the tutu. And I will say that in all, I've worked with many kids who explored their gender on the way to discovering their sexual identity, who Later, when I, they're in high school and they come back to me, they repress their earlier lives. They don't even remember it. And one of the theories about this is because of the culture we live in, there are so few examples of books for little kids where the prince can fall in love with the prince. Therefore, cognitively, when you're little and you are a cis boy 
and you like the prince, you get the idea, well, the only way to do that is to become the princess. So I will be a princess. Then you get a little older and your cognition changes and you go, oh my God, I don't have to be the princess. I can be the prince who has the prince. And so they evolve into understanding their sexual identities. So that's one trope. And as I mentioned, many kids, through exploring their sexual connections with other people, actually get their gender in focus through those experiences. So it crisscrosses all along the way. But what we must remember, there's two separate tracks, and we have every different combination of all different sexualities and all different genders. So therefore, it's as complex as any of the scribbles just around gender, because people assume that a boy in a tutu is gay. He's not, he's a boy in a tutu. We'll find out later who he is. So end of story is, my son is now 39 years old. So I decided to finally ask him the question, so if you were born, if you were five years old in 2015, instead of in the early 1980s, do you think your path would have been different? And do you think you might have followed a transgender path? Because as you were saying, you didn't even know about something until you learned it existed. So if you had known that ex existed then, do you think it would have been a different outcome? Not missing a beat, he said, absolutely not it would have been exactly the same. So I think our apples know their apples, our oranges know their oranges, and that we have to accept it's a messy world out there around gender and sexual development. Thank you. Any, anyone else want to comment on the interface between the gender and sexual identification? No? We're good? Okay. Um, number of questions around puberty uh, blockers. Um, a uh, couple sort of categories. One had to do with the issue of consent and capacity, and if there was a scenario where the uh, minor wanted them and then the adult would not give consent. And then also on that same topic, um, Jennifer, if you want to cover it, also issues with insurance coverage and, and parity. Uh, is there any movement out there um, towards that? So for the first one, absolutely. That's this is a really challenging area where the parents do not come around, don't get it about how the puberty blocker could potentially help their child. So, and we do need the, um, the parents' consent. I don't know if you've had cases at the center where, where that's come up, but it's certainly, I, I mean, I've had a few cases, eventually kind of over time, I feel like we've done a good job in helping the parents understand and eventually gotten to the point of consent. There is, I used to feel more that, I mean, we still feel this sort of pressure because puberty is happening, right? And the mm -hmm. breasts are developing or the facial, or the testicles are enlarging. So there is that sort of tension with the importance of getting the puberty blocker sooner. That said, um, even without the puberty blocker, kids will do well just with a cross hormone if their puberty blocker, you know, if they couldn't get the puberty blocker. So I think it's, especially when there wasn't access financially, um, I would always talk to parents about, you know, it's, your child, we will, your child will be okay even if they don't, that, that was when parents couldn't afford it. It wasn't the fact that the parent wouldn't consent. But I think it's tricky, it really is, because parental education is crucial. And yeah, in term, I'm not sure what the person meant by parity, maybe someone else. I mean, it's, we're just really struggling to get insurance companies to get it about how this is a law, that the, at least in the state of California. Sometimes we run into insurance companies that are based in other states and they do not have that law. So that's the reason we struggle so much as well. And I would just add a couple of things to that. One of the difficulties around consent is post-divorce families, mm. where one parent is on board and the other parent right. isn't, but they have mutual decision making around medical care, and that can be really sticky. Yeah. And some of those cases have ended up in court. And the other issue that's a showstopper now for many parents around giving consent to puberty blockers is the fertility issue that if a child goes straight from puberty blockers directly to cross-sex hormones, they, at this point in history, are pretty much forfeiting uh, their fertility, and so they will not have a gen genetically related child. 
And there's a lot of parents who have dreams of becoming grandparents. And it's very hard for them to uh, not imagine those genetically related grandchildren. And so we have to work with parents about these aren't your dreams. We have to focus on your child's dreams and what it is they, what they want. And what I will say about many of the youth who want puberty blockers, I have never met such an altruistic group of kids about adoption. I never. <laughs> you know, I, I will adopt because I think there's so many children who need good homes. And I think that's both um, heartfelt, but also it's they're trying to tell us the most important thing to me right now is being able to have every opportunity to have my gender affirmation be as complete as possible. And anything else is secondary. The question is, can an 11 year old, 12 year old at that level of development be really thinking and know what they want at age 30 around their fertility? So the answer to that is, we don't stop twice about instituting treatments for cancers for children that will compromise their fertility. Same treatments in some way, whatever it is. We don't say we're not going to give them the, the treatment for cancer because it's gonna compromise their fertility. That for some of the youth, having the gender affirmation interventions are as life-saving as the oncology services for children who have cancer. And I'll just add one other piece, which is, you know, when we're working with families, one of the key things is what is the leverage point for that family? And that begins with, tell me why you don't want your child to do this. Because in hearing the answer, you may very well find like, oh, okay, well, if we could address that or help you understand that a little bit more fully, the answer might change. And I just, why I, I appreciate Heidi, the work you're doing and any of those out there that are, are working with families so that not only are you supporting those families, but they're then willing to tell their stories to another family who maybe isn't quite there. So let me not try to convince you, would you be willing to talk to another dad who has a child your age, who has a similar background, who had many of these same fears, would you be willing to at least talk to him to hear his perspective on the very same questions you're asking yourself? Because the fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, it is the parent's call. Our hope is that they will truly make an informed decision. And I feel like one of our roles is to say, just make sure you have all the information as you make that decision, which includes you can either have grandchildren or not have a kid anymore, either because they've ended the relationship with you or in some cases because they've chosen a, a more dangerous path for themselves. And you know, again, we can't guilt families into it, but they need to have the information. And then, they can, then, then you've got to look yourself in the mirror and make the decision you're going to make about these issues. Thank you. Um, a couple of the educators in our audience had questions related to incorporating uh, the diverse transgender issue into um, reproductive health curriculum, sex education within the classroom. Um, be interesting to hear uh, maybe from uh, Jordan and Bunny as students and, and um, uh, so Joel as, as kind of the, the educator, um, uh, sort of thoughts, experiences, how, how did you see it done in, in, in your schools? Uh, basically sex ed and, and incorporating, and, or did they incorporate any transgender, tra transgender issues at all within the sex ed program? Um, yes, um, the school I'm currently enrolled in, Delta, the sex ed program, it covers all of what like Cal California requires, but the, the class was also about like different kind of like sexualities, how people can like like different kinds of like the whole list of genders and it didn't really talk about how like trans people have sex but it it went over like orientation like um healthy relationships and in every lesson and talk and discussion and project we did all kind of incorporated the lgbt lgbtq community within it and so everyone was like you know had an idea of what was going on and such, so. But, and Bunny, you're in the middle of it right now, so. Um, my experience with sex ed is like, I mean, in fifth grade, of course, all we learned about was like cis-hat relationships. And then there was none in middle school, but then freshman year, and that's all so far, really. Um, they, so, like a trans senior came in to our health 
classroom <laughs> and talked about their experiences, but it wasn't really sex ed at all, actually. Um, but that's like the only, and then like recently in uh, like life science and stuff as you go on in high school, for my school, all we learn about is sperm and eggs, like nothing, we don't learn about like any trans ways of having sex. And also, sorry that this is unrelated, but I forgot to say it in my like Please? introduction. Um, there's a really big stigma against trans people that they want to be cis, and some like do, but not all trans people live their lives to pass as cis. Trans people, trans people can embrace their transness. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I'm, I'm really excited, Jordan, to hear your experience because unfortunately that's not totally common, although um, a couple things folks should be aware of. Just this year, a bill was passed now requiring puberty education to bring LGBT and particularly gender identity issues into the mix. Um, so if you're an educator, you should talk to your uh, uh, directors of instruction and, and pupil personnel about some of those issues because no longer in California is it a choice. Um, I also want to do a shout out to an organization called Advocates for Youth, which put together an incredible, uh, very LGBT, particularly gender inclusive uh, sex ed curriculum and sexual health curriculum. What we found are sort of four key ideas that should inform any sex ed or puberty ed uh, program. The first is the idea that rather than talking about little boys grow up to be like their daddies and little girls grow up to be like their mommies, is to talk about our pathways to adult bodies. Get it out of the boy-girl thing and instead talk about unique pathways to adult bodies that everyone in the room is on. Right? Because of course we all change at different rates. Some of us have help from doctors, some of us don't. Some of us have changes starting to happen when we don't want them and some of us can't wait and they haven't happened. Right, so one is the principle of, it's not about boys becoming men and women becoming, or girls becoming women, it's about young people becoming adults and finding their adult bodies. The, the second is to talk about pathways to family, because again, it's not just sperm and egg and that's how babies get made. Half the kids in the class are like, really, that's not my story, because I'm adopted, I was an egg donor, I was this. I'm, so talking about pathways to family is another really important frame that universalizes the experience of everyone in the room because you know I used to teach sex ed and my cisgender kids need to know what they need to know. It's not as if that experience is invalid, it just isn't the only. So again, pathways to family is another part. A third part is um, simply getting away, and we joked about it, from the gender language. Boy bodies and girl bodies, no. Bodies with penises, bodies with vulvas, bodies that produce eggs sometimes, bodies that produce sperm sometimes. Sometimes these bodies do these things. Bodies with these parts change in these ways, are, are designed to do these things. Um, and then the last is, is we can't forget to talk about that you know, hormones are in the mix, and, and you will have an adult hormonal experience of some kind. Most of you will have bodies that produce hormones, but not everyone. Some of you will need additional hormones to help your health. Some of you will need additional hormones to help your gender. Some of you will need them to have children, but you will have an adult hormonal experience. So those four principles, I don't care what the curriculum is, quite honestly, those principles need to inform the instruction um, and create space for everyone. And I just want to tell a very quick anecdote about a, a trans kid who I know who didn't go to a school that had that kind of uh, puberty education. But her comment was, because her parents were really worried, aren't you going to feel terrible about this? Because she was very affirmed and knew what her path was going to be. She said, no, it's great, because what I do is I just sit back. I know none of what they're talking about is going to happen to me, and I just laugh at everybody. So. <laughs> <laughs> Other kind of topic had sort of come up about challenging home environments, specifically for uh, cultural, um, ethnic, and, and religious uh, issues. Um, thoughts, resources um, uh, for those type of, of situations. And that could be to anybody or, um, you know, Heidi, it sounds like you might have had some personal uh, experience with that. Um, maybe you can kind of kick it off. Sure. I. Um I have, you know, uh, like I said, I, uh, I was raised Southern Baptist, mm -hmm. and my grandfather was a, a minister, and, um, you know, he's, he was not happy because I have probably 10 gay cousins, and I mean, our family's pretty 
vast. And, and so for me, um, although I was very open to the LGBT community, I still had a lot of pressure about what the organized religion was telling me what the Bible said about my family and especially my son. And um, so I, I will just say that it, it took me from when Joan was diagnosed at seven to age 11, unfortunately, to get away from that. It took me uh, those years to clue in that, no, I need to not listen to this organized religion. I need to listen to my heart. And um, what I say to parents when they do come to see me that um, are religious, and that is their concern, um, it's your relationship with your God is between you and your God, and there's no other middle person that needs to be a part of it. And um, I say, you know, I know that I'm, I'm going to heaven, okay? That's my belief, and so is my son, and so is everybody else in this room. And so, you know, when, when I, our group is not religious at all, but when people want to talk to me about the religion, I just say, you know, the best that I can do is, is, is give you an example. And I will say this, it's men that have the hard time, okay? It's the dads that really struggle. And what I find so interesting and kind of comical is that I'll say to a dad, if I'm talking to him on the phone or in person, hey, have you met my husband, Ron? He likes to drink beer and watch hockey. And before you know it, they are bonding, and pretty soon after that, the acceptance of their child goes pretty quick. And we've seen that a handful of times in the group. So I think that for the cultural, for the men, is they just need to see other dads that it's okay. These dads accept their kids. And then for religious part of it, it it's all, I think it's, it's your own journey, and you just have to kind of, I, I, like I say, just use this as an example. And you really have to come to your own, you know, your own belief system. But I do want to say this real quick. Um, once we transitioned Jordan, when I say transition Jordan, he was transitioned when he was two. But once we <laughs> allowed it, um, we did get the phone calls of "You're a sinner. You're going to hell. We will not allow your child to play with our children anymore." Um, that was very difficult, but what I came out of that is this, that if I truly am listening to the teachings of what I believe in, which are love, how is that love? And so that's what I just try to say. Whatever, whatever religion you're in, basically those teachings are of love and acceptance, no matter what religion really you're a part of. And so, if you, your child, are you loving and accepting your child according to those teachings? And that's what I think it's all about. Thank you. <laughs> Diane. And I wanted to just piggyback on what Heidi said. And Joel made reference to cognitive dissonance as a really good thing for us to shake us up. And in my work with families, I always use the cognitive dissonance model when the beliefs are not in concordance with, a child, with what a child is telling me about their gender. So, and it goes like this. Um, somebody is, uh, and you start where, where people are at, and you have these, if you think of it as a balancing scale. On the one hand, my belief system says that it's a sinful thing to be anything but cisgender and straight. That's what I've learned in my belief system. On the other hand, I have a child who showed up who I started loving the day they were born, who is now telling me either that they're transgender or they're gay, whatever it might be, I have a conflict here. My beliefs are in conflict with my love for my child. So I will hope that love will conquer all and that it is a love for your child that will pull you along around taking a look at those belief systems and challenging them because your child is teaching you something else. And, in, and I will say very optimistically that given time and listening and dialogue, it works. Mm -hmm. And so I encourage everybody to think of that balancing model. And there's one thing I will add, how I tip the scales. I will, I will say, look, I have to also step in as an expert here, it's my job, to let you know just some of the risk factors if you stay with this dance. It, 
The risk factors, I'm not saying it'll happen to your child, but the risk factors are for anxiety, depression, self-harm, trauma, suicidality. Nobody wants that for their child. And when they put that on the scales, it also affects the balancing act. And I just want to finish with one thing. Um, I am a parent, but I'm also a provider, and I'm constantly being accused of being a sinner. I get emails all the time, and that I don't follow Christian values by the work I do. And the only thing I can say about that is I'm Jewish. <laughs> I'll, I'll, just, I'll just add a, a, a couple other um, thoughts here because I think there's a real tragedy when, when families feel like it's a matter of choosing their faith or their child. Um, and that there's sometimes, again, this false dichotomy, look at that, there we are again, of it's one or the other. Um, I think sometimes pointing out it's not a conflict in faith, but it might be a conflict with your faith institution. And there might be a different institution consistent with your faith that'll give you a slightly different message. Um, I also want to um, share, there's a, a great resource, and I'm probably getting the name wrong, but I think it's called Transitioning to Inclusion, a guide to trans-inclusive religious institutions or something like that. Um, it's from the Pacific School of Religion, um, and it's a great resource to provide with uh, your, your faith-based uh, leaders um, to talk about different ways that churches and other religious institutions can become more uh, inclusive, in particular of trans ex experiences, um, but also uh, generally more gender inclusive and broad. And I do think the last thing is, um, you know, our kids as they navigate their worlds, they are seeking congruence, right? They're seeking to try to get their internal sense of self aligned with their external, as well as the world around them. And there are times when they may be in context in which Getting congruence between your family's religious beliefs and your gender may be a stretch that they may not be able to, to make. It may not happen. What are then other ways that we can build your resilience? And you need to maybe meet your parents where they are to the extent you can, or uh, also just simply you know, avoid that area of conflict. But to echo what Diane said, um, there's really clear research about the, the, the negative impact of religious-based condemnation um, on a young person's health and well-being, and again, parent, make an informed decision. So, um, those are some ideas. Thank you. Jennifer? I, yeah, I want to add that in Santa Cruz, we have Out in Our Faith, which has 25 congregations, Buddhist, Jewish, Catholic, I, I pulled the list up here. So, Out in Our Faith is a local resource. I also, on a just slightly different tangent, really want to uh, do a shout out to Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Santa Cruz County. We're just I'm going to say we because we get to be part of them, are uh, doing a new trans and gender diverse mentoring program. So that's another oh. resource for. <laughs> All right. We're the first in the country to yeah, do something like this. Excellent. Well, in the, in the last few minutes left, I just want to sort of uh, extend a special thanks to, uh, uh, to Heidi and Jordan and Bunny uh, for coming here and, and sharing their story. And to our, the rest of our panel members for doing such a fantastic job and making uh, year 18 a success. I think 450 is our biggest, uh, other than methamphetamine. I think methamphetamine caught up with you guys. So, uh, no, no. so um, meth kills. Uh, so please, um, the cards you have, that uh, suggestions for next year, comments on this year, uh, very, very important. Uh, the committee uses that to really, you know, come up with ideas for future topics and, and changing, uh, you know, the schedule and such. Um, those that need to sign out, don't forget to do that. Uh, special thanks to the members of our uh, committee who work all year long to doing this. Another special shout out to George Gero. There he goes. You've heard his name. Oh. Oh, please, Bunny, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just want to say rest in power to Leela Alcorn, Maya Young, Veronica Cobb, and every other trans person who died because the world wasn't ready for them. All right, well, we'll see you next year. Thank you very, very much for attending. <laughs>